Hello and welcome to the Enterprise IT Virtual Summit by Actual Tech Media. Today's topic, Defense In-Depth, exploring the elements of a layered security program. Thank you so much for joining us on the summit event. You'll hear from our experts at know before. One password, Okta, SimSpace, Attack IQ, Duo, Rubric, Rapid7, Zerto, and Cohesity. We've got an incredible lineup of some of the most innovative technology companies on the summit today. So if you want to better protect your enterprise, you're in the right place. We at Actual Tech Media created the virtual summit event series as well as the Megacast and Ecocast event series to help educate IT professionals such as yourselves about the latest and greatest enterprise technology solutions to help you get all your questions answered and to help you to have a chance to win some awesome prizes as well. We're all former IT professionals ourselves here at Actual Tech Media. We know how tough it can be out there in the world of technology, and we hope that this event will help you to solve some of your technology challenges. We encourage your questions, and I'll be talking about the questions uh, pane and our question prizes, best question prizes here in just a moment. This is a live event, and we are here to help. Uh, you should know that uh, we have some awesome prizes. Like I said, I'll talk about those here in just a moment. But first, we encourage your questions there in the questions pane of your audience console. I see many of you have already said hello and good morning, good afternoon from across the United States and around the world. Uh, we also want your technical questions, and we have a best question prize to help encourage those. Uh, more on that here in just a moment. We'll also have some poll questions for you during the summit event, and we appreciate your participation in those polls. We want this to be a social event, and you can socialize it right there from your audience console using the Twitter icon on the bottom of the screen, and the Twitter hashtag will be automatically appended. It is ATM Summit. I'll be monitoring Twitter throughout the event, and of course, we appreciate your socialization of it. Uh, I'll be retweeting and commenting and following uh, anyone who's talking about the event over on Twitter. We also have a number of resources, 10 of those there in your handout tab, one from each of our expert presenters. We've got eBooks, special trial links, uh, solution briefs. So make sure that you check those out in the handouts tab. As I said, we've got some awesome prizes. We've got three LG 34 inch ultra wide monitors, three Oculus Quest VR headsets. We've got three Bose QC45 headphones. I've got a pair of those. Those are some awesome headphones. Uh, let's see, three Surface Pro 8s. Wow. And if that wasn't enough, 10 Amazon $300 gift cards. We'll be announcing the winner of those during the event. So one after each of the sessions today. So make sure that you stay tuned for those gift card drawings. Uh, the prize terms and conditions can be found there in the handout tab. You must be present on the live event to be eligible and also meet the actual tech media prize terms and conditions, which you'll find, again, in the handouts tab. Prize winners will be selected uh, during the event and contacted via email afterwards. All prize winners must submit an IRS Form W-9 to actual tech media. And if that wasn't enough, we also have our best question prizes for 10 additional Amazon $50 gift cards. Of course, you have to ask a question to be entered into that prize drawing and also meet the actual tech media prize policy. All prize winners have the option to make a donation to selected charities. We've donated thousands and thousands of dollars over the years to charity, and we would love to help you do that. If you win a prize, uh, just let us know, and we'd be glad to help out. The hashtag for today on Twitter, as I said, is ATM Summit. You can follow Actual Tech Media. You can follow me as well, your moderator, David M. Davis. I'll also be joined later in the event by fellow moderator, Mr. Scott Becker. All the Actual Tech Media social channels are there in your audience console as well, YouTube, Facebook, our 10 on Tech podcast, and LinkedIn, where we post all of our latest and greatest content. You can subscribe to the Gorilla Guide Book Club there as well in your handouts tab where you can download free, easy to read enterprise IT books. And finally, another way to win a gift card is through the Refer a Friend uh, or Coworker program to Actual Tech Media, and you both could win an Amazon $300 gift card. Those drawings are held monthly. You can do that there in the handouts tab, or at the end of the event, you'll be automatically redirected. 
All right, so with that, I'm excited now to bring in our keynote presenter, as well as Mr. Scott Becker, um, for an interview about security and security defense trends with Mr. Ian Thornton Trump. Ian is a Chief Information Security Officer for SIJAC in the United Kingdom. He's ranged uh, over the security landscape for several decades as a consultant, a security analyst, a keynote presenter. Uh, it's going to be great to get his take on the current security challenges in the industry. Scott and Ian, take it away. All right. Well, thanks, David. And uh, Ian, welcome. Great to be here. I'm so delighted. One of the things that I always appreciate about talking to you is that you really keep on top of the latest threats and you're so good at translating them to what IT professionals need to know. Um, what are the bad actors up to on the offensive side that businesses should be watching out for? You know, what are the top uh, threats that people need to be defending against in 2022? Yeah, it's, it's different. It's really morphed a little bit because, you know, especially when we see the weaponization of all of these different vulnerabilities that are found in sort of, in quotations, the supply chain, um, we're seeing, you know, those type of actors and attacks, um, you know, coming in uh, where it's an exploitation of an actual exposed vulnerability in a business, as opposed to sort of where we used to be, which was, you know, the phishing emails uh, it, with either attachments, which has really gone out of fashion, but, you know, web links, um, you know, delivered via social media or email, also, you know, a major, major attack vector. And I think, you know, one of the things that I've been outspoken on last year was the, the rapid digital transformation and people not knowing what they're doing and misconfiguration. So what's, what's really interesting to me now is that, you know, misconfiguration and a backup uh, and, and a lack of backup and resiliency are becoming equally persistent threats that, than the actual, um, I, you know, cyber criminal actors. Huh. Interesting, really great point about misconfiguration. So our um, event is called Defense in Depth and Layered Defense how are those concepts evolving in your view? Yeah, I, I mean, it's been quite a journey. You know, back in 2015, we talked about layered defense being, you know, primarily things like firewalls, antivirus, and, you know, vulnerability management within the infrastructure with sort of, uh, I would say, you know, the, the tier two ranking of uh, inf uh, identity and access management. Well, it's almost gone full circle now. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the firewall has very, um, I, I would say, a very reduced role in your overall cybersecurity landscape because a lot of the services that you're using now are third-party or cloud-hosted, yeah. right? And so that's really changed the paradigm. And then, of course, because a lot of this stuff that we're doing is SaaS, uh, software as a service, um, whether or not you are uh, have linked that into single sign-on, um, identity management has now become a huge issue with access to the infrastructure itself, but also the applications that your business relies on. And what's interesting is the commercial model of like a license per seat on a month to month basis, I think is actually driving better IDAM practices in the business because nobody wants to pay for something that they're not using. Right. Yeah. So so I see that um, because it's sort of like a, there's an economic advantage to controlling, you know, the access to the applications that you're using. And then conversely, on the digital transformation side, I think everyone's looking at, you know, how can I do it cheaper, easier on less um, platforms, on less uh, boxes? So I see that there is this sort of consolidation that's driven by, you know, uh, by, by financial motives that's actually hopefully driving better security, right? Because, you know, what I, what I was highly critical of is that folks would take a very um, vulnerable application on-prem and just simply stick it in the cloud so that everybody could use it during the pandemic. But then like they haven't fixed the underlying problems with that application, right? Right. And and so, you know, I, and and this is where, you know, we are today with some of the with some of the vulnerabilities. It's like it's a non-issue if you're not really exposed, it's exposing it to the internet, but it's a huge issue with potentially catastrophic consequences if you're exposed um, via the internet. 
So, so it's a, you know, it's one of these things where the vulnerability management program really now has to look at things like the configuration management of the infrastructure, um, I, you know, to make sure that the cloud services, for instance, are be delivered in a secure manner and that the APIs are secured. So what we used to think is vulnerability management is really morphed now into DevSecOps. And that's become a huge sort of aspect, I think, on the digital transformation and the requirements of people really understanding cloud security and cloud architecture. Okay. And so, you know, a lot of that stuff as far as firewalls and, and some of the, the things that people traditionally thought of as defense in depth, you know, as, as people move to the cloud, you know, sort of there's this you know, the shrinking bit of real estate that's that's the data center, you know, the old on-premises data center. Is uh, Are a lot of the defense in-depth concepts still applicable there? Um, yeah, yeah, most definitely. But I think it got a lot complicated now, uh, a lot more complicated now with the movement towards hybrid where part of your infrastructure is going to be hosted on premise, part of it or links to it are now in, in the cloud. You know, the, the, big, uh, uh, the big data story of how you're sucking up all of this custom telemetry to understand, you know, um, what services that you're providing or what, uh, or what products that you're providing, what makes them popular amongst your customers. That big data story is really happening in the cloud um, as opposed to on-prem where the on-premise um, uh, tin is cost prohibitive. So, so what we're seeing is businesses trying to maximize the investment that they've made in their on-premises, which requires all of the traditional, if you will, let's call it 2015 type of cybersecurity management, and then into the cloud, which is a whole new area of trying to gain visibility and security and compliance in a cloud-based infrastructure. And this is where I think one of the challenges for IT, IT providers um, and MSPs moving forward is, is they're gonna have to be very comfortable having one foot in the client server world, right? And on-premise, mm -hmm. and then one foot you know, on the, cl on the cloud as it were, um, to try and provide the same sort of uh, cybersecurity um, robustness that their customers expect from them. And, and that becomes, you know, a huge challenge in the, in the realms of software as a service, because unless that MSP or that IT department is invited into the initial procurement and deployment stages of that application, you can have a gaping hole in your vulnerability. And I'll add one thing further. One of the problems with software as a service is we're now expecting the managers and directors of those particular applications to take over and assume the responsibility of provisioning users and, and you know, then, of course, um, offboarding users when they're no longer part of the organization. And unfortunately, I think asking users to be asking the managers and directors who aren't cybersecurity professionals or even IT professionals to actually take up the reins of identity and access management, uh, I think that's a bit dangerous because that's not their core competency and they may not even realize what the implications are of putting, um, of not disabling certain features. So, you know, a lot of the threats that you're talking about, you know, outside of hybrid are, you know, things that are happening with, with all this infrastructure in the cloud and all these applications in the cloud. Um, you know, moving on from defense in depth, when you think about just the underlying, you know, motivation for defense in depth, which was comprehensive security, what does that look like today? What are the components that you need for a comprehensive security plan today? It, well, it, certainly, I think there's the layered defense aspect, and that's one of the good ways of, of discussing it, sort of defense in depth. But what's interesting to me is it's sort of now become different chances, if you will, of catching the bad guys doing their thing, right? You know, yep. we, we think about um, cybersecurity now as sort of like, what can we do to prevent uh, a data breach, right? Uh, but I, I think philosophically, it, 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 it's fair to say a, a lot of organizations are thinking now about how do we recover from a data breach and 
what are the things that we can do to maximize our security investment? And so the conversations have changed from, uh, I would say, a purely sort of proactive, reactive, now into the detective and even forward planning uh, Mm -hmm. stages. Because, I mean, organizations, executive boards, um, executives within your organization are seeing the stories. They're they're hearing about the hacks. Maybe in some cases, they've been directly impacted um, by those events, right? You know, with the the short-term fuel crisis um, uh, for Colonial Pipeline, that would have had vast reaching effects into, you know, local couriers, um, international shipping, et cetera, et cetera. So so I think now um, folks see it as more of of an existential threat that needs to be minimized, but it's like a threat that's there no matter where you go. I mean, you can spend a billion dollars on cybersecurity and get breached and you can spend, you know, $10 on cybersecurity and get breached. So there's an argument to find where that needle of risk can sit in your organization based on not actually what your defenses are, but what the consequences of a data breach to your organization is. Well, those are a lot of great things to think about. And we're going to be hearing from solution vendors over the next couple of hours, uh, you know, talking about exactly some of those things. So really appreciate this, Ian. Thanks a lot. My pleasure. All right. Great discussion there with Ian and Scott. Uh, I've just brought up our poll question for everyone out there in the audience. First poll here of the event that says, what's your time frame for taking action on some of the solutions you learn about on the event today uh, to update your security uh, ecosystem of, of solutions, your uh, defense in depth there, uh, or to add new solutions? And so I'll leave the poll up here for just a moment. We are bringing in our first presenter from Know Before right now. If you haven't answered one of the polls, Uh, Before here on the event, you do it right there in the slides window. All right, excellent. Thank you so much for all your responses there. We we will have more polls throughout the event. We appreciate your participation. And with that, it's now my pleasure to introduce you to our first presenter on the event today. Great to have back Mr. Roger Grimes, Data-Driven Defense Evangelist at Know Before. Hey, Roger, thanks for being on. Glad to be here. Always great to have you. Okay. Take it away. Thanks a lot. And thanks, everybody. I, I want to talk about a handful of incredible email hacks that you'd never expect. Or mo- I'd say most people uh, don't know about these, maybe know one of the, the three or four that I'm going to show. N- and know that your biggest problem with email hacks is just regular phishing and someone trying to get you to give away your password or download a malicious content or something. But I'm going to show you some interesting uh, things, most of which are, are fairly rare, but they do happen in the real world, although one of them is very, very common. But I think most people that see these things are like, ah, this is incredible. If you don't know me, I'm Roger Grimes. I always talk fast. I'm going to cover a ton of content in the next 20 minutes. We'll take some questions and answers at the end if we get time. Uh, I've written 13 books and now probably close to 1,200 magazine articles. There's some of my books, uh, including the Ransomware Protection Playbook and Hacking Multi-Factor Authentication. I work for Know Before. We're the world's largest integrated security awareness training simulated phishing platform vendor, meaning we try to help people not to get fished. Uh, and we'll talk about some unique phishing ways today. But again, today is just about a handful of ways uh, that you can be fished, advanced ways, uh, and most of them fairly rare, one of them very, very common. And I just think most people that see uh, these attacks, usually at least one of them makes and drops their mouth because uh, they didn't know it could be. But these are the attacks we're going to talk about. But again, we've only got 20 minutes. So I want to get right into it. The first one is called password hash theft. Uh, most people on this call probably know that when you type in a password, let's say your password is frog or something like that, in most modern day operating systems, that password gets changed into what's called a cryptographic hash. And that cryptographic hash can be different depending on the operating system. Today with Windows, it's usually what's called an NT hash, although back in the olden days, it was called an LM or Landman hash. Um, Apple and Linux and Unix and stuff like that, uh, usually in olden days, it was what's called an MD5 hash. Today, it's probably a SHA-1 or SHA-2 hash, probably SHA-2 hash, although if you have a really good operating system, it's the uh, Bruce Schneier bcrypt hash, which is most secure, one of the most secure hashes out there. Uh, but when we type in our passwords for the first time, they actually get stored on disk somewhere. It's like in the Windows 
uh, operating system that would be stored in the local what's called SAM uh, Security Accounts Manager database, or it could be an Active Directory in what's called the ntds.dit file that's in every domain controller and Linux and Unix and stuff. It's usually in what's called the, the password, passwd or shadow file, but essentially uh, all these passwords get converted to these password hashes with the idea that if an attacker is somehow able to access these password hashes, they don't, don't get immediate access to the underlying plain text password. But attackers know that if they get a hold of these hashes, uh, that they can crack them, they can guess at them. They have password hash cracking tools or what's called rainbow tables that they will import a bunch of password dictionaries that have a whole bunch of different passwords and they pre-compute the hashes for all those possible passwords and then they can uh, compare the password dictionary passwords and hashes against the stolen password hashes. So uh, hackers have been doing this for decades and usually uh, for the hackers to get someone's password hashes they have to be domain admin or admin or something like that or, or root uh, the operating systems protect these password hashes so that people and attackers and programs and malware can't easily steal them. Uh, but what most people don't know is that you, I can send you an email that has a specially crafted URL that tricks your operating system into sending your password hash to a web server on the internet uh, and that malicious web server can uh, capture your password hash and then an attacker can crack it back to the plain text password. Now I'm going to give you an example of this. Uh, so again, what happens is the hacker usually has some type of malicious server on the internet. They create a malicious URL uh, that they then send to the victim usually an email. The victim clicks on that URL. Uh, sometimes all they do is open the email, but most of the time they have to click on the URL. And then the email browser program will attempt to retrieve an object that is attached referenced by that URL. The server will say, hey, you have to authenticate to get on the server. And the email browser program will attempt to authenticate. Uh, and then uh, the malicious email server or web server will say, oh, uh, they, they look at the uh, ch what's called the, in many cases, NT challenge response logon, and they can convert that to what's called the NT hash and get people's uh, Windows password, but it also works with other passwords as well. But it's, again, the idea that I can send you an email, and all you do is click on it, and it sends me your challenge response, and then the hacker gets your password hash, and from that can convert it to your plain text password. Uh, the demo, I'm going to show you a demo. Actually, Kevin Mitnick, our chief hacking officer, one of the most famous hackers in the world, is going to show you how his, uh, his hacking trick works. But he does it by using a URL that has what's called file colon forward slash forward slash in it. And if you want to know more about how this trick works, you can go to the links that are on your screen here and even read an article I wrote for CSO Magazine that details how this attack works. But with that said, I'm going to play the demo. I'm going to be quiet. It goes for a minute or two, and it will show you how this attack works in real life. Attacker system in the cloud, in the Amazon cloud in Virginia. And we have, I'm at, uh, logged into Outlook 365 here. I'm simply just going to click on the email. I just clicked. It takes a second for Office 365 to load. And here we go. We could see that the emails from Roger Grimes at NSA.gov, which is quite interesting. And there's nothing there. There's no hyperlink to click on. There's no attachment. But if we go over to the attacker system over here in the cloud, we were able to intercept or obtain Roger, well, the victim's NTLM v2 hash. So let's go ahead and try to do this. So we're going to go ahead and highlight this. We're going to copy it. We're going to go over to our password cracker over here. We're going to create a file. Here we go. We're going to paste in the hash. Very simple. And then what I'm going to do is just run a, a shell script that, um, that tries to crack the hash through a dictionary attack. And this is using a tool called local hashcat. And guess what? It's already cracked the hash. So if we scroll up here, we see there was a user named Kevin, right? And the password to the hash is Kevin123. So that's probably pretty wild if you've never seen anything like that before. What I can tell you is usually you have to trick the victim into clicking on a link. Uh, Kevin is using a open source hacking tool called Responder. There's probably dozens of tools out there that do the same thing, but essentially sets up this web server sends this malicious link, the user has to click on the link usually, and then the email browser program will attempt to retrieve the object on that web server. It will try to log on in, and from that, they can get the password hash and try to crack it back to the plain text password. 
I've done this demo hundreds of times in real life on different companies. It always works. People always tell me, will it work? Will it work in my company? Will it work with my browser? Will it work with my operating systems? I always say, don't listen to me. Uh, just try it yourself. So on this screen here, if you download the slides, there are the steps that anyone, if you know a little bit of Linux, you can download Kali Linux and run this test on your own company and figure it out if it works in your environment. And these are real attacks. They're not super common, but they do happen in the real world. Here's an example of it happening in Ukraine and some Canadian organizations. And this next news story here, it actually happened in the San Francisco airport where the hacker hacked the uh, San Francisco free Wi-Fi, put in one of these malicious links, and everybody in San Francisco airport that week that was clicking on that link was actually transmitting their Windows password hash. So it does happen in the real world. Uh, if you want to know how to defend against this, know that Microsoft on Windows machines, they have an optional patch you can apply, and you can also block uh, the ports that might be used in this attack. I don't have time to uh, slow down and cover all of these, but just know that there are some defenses, including a patch that most people don't apply because it's optional, and you can also do some firewalling and filter out uh, for this particular attack, file colon, any emails with file colon forward slash forward slash forward slash in it. Uh, but now going on to a new type of attack called click jacking. It's really common that uh, back in the day when someone would go to click on uh, a web link, that if that web had been, if that website link had been compromised, that the user would go to click on a particular thing like they meant to click on, and at the last second something malicious could switch out what the user thought they were clicking on and replace it with something that they didn't mean to click on. It's called click jacking, hijacking someone's click. Well, all the browser manufacturers worked hard over decades, and today click jacking is really rare. You can't have these last second switcheroos because someone's compromised a website. But uh, we've learned that there is this probably like about two years ago, we started to see this trick where attackers will create what looks like hair or dust on somebody's screen. And so this works especially on touch screens. When the person goes to remove and get rid of what they think is hair or dust, it actually is a URL linked object. And when they click on it, maybe they just transmitted their password hash. <laughs> you know, so just be careful that there are these tricks. We see this used more by spammers to send people to, you know, websites that try to sell them drugs and things like that and Viagra and all that. Uh, but just be aware that touch screens may introduce some new types of attacks and realize that dust or hair may not be dust or hair and make sure to educate your end users. Now going into another type of attack called password spray attacks, or they call it credential stuffing. This is super, super popular, but this is where an attacker gets a whole bunch of uh, company login names and then tries to guess different passwords against all the accounts they collect. So a traditional password attack would get like one user's uh, login name and try to guess a million passwords against that one user's account. Password spray attack is kind of the opposite. They get the, all the login accounts of a particular company and they try like a thousand or 10,000 passwords, but they do it really, really slow to avoid kicking off what's called account lockout. So they need to find the user login names for that company and they need to find an online portal that password guessing would work against, and then they kick off their tool. Uh, this is very, very popular. Acme, which is one of the world's largest uh, hosting web hosting uh, load balancing companies, said they saw 61 billion of these attacks in a year and a half. 61 billion, one company saw 61 billion in a year and a half. Very, very popular. Lots of large companies get broken in this way, like Citrix got told by the FBI that they probably got compromised by a password spraying attack, and both Microsoft and Google consider Password spray attacks, credential stuffing attacks would be uh, to be among the most damaging and successful against any company. Uh, but again, the way that they work is that the uh, attacker has to collect the login names of the victim company they're trying to target. They could use FOCA, which is, a, a, really they don't use FOCA a whole lot, but it's kind of a cool tool. It's, a, it's the only Windows one that I know of that, that people can use, but it's got a GUI on it. Uh, but you run FOCA and it, you put in the company domain like knowbefore.com, and then you tell it to kick off and it uses three search engines, Google, Bing, and DuckDuckGo to try to find out as much information as it can about a company on the internet. Uh, what most hackers use, though, is this Recon NG. Recon, Recon NG is a free NG for next generation is a free hacker tool. 
that the hackers download and can then use to uh, look up information, including logon names and potential passwords about any company. Sometimes they use the Harvester. The Harvester helps them find places to log on to. Uh, if you're interested in these sort of tools, these open in source and open source intelligence tools, OSINT OS tools, you can go to this GitHub site called Awesome OSINT, and it has like over a hundred tools that hackers frequently use to find out information on your company, and you should. Uh, you run those tools to see what information is out there on your company. Uh, but overall, they've got to find some type of unprotected online portal at the victim company to find. They usually like to use email logon portals or VPN portals or something like that, anywhere where they are allowed to do a logon name and password. Uh, they can even do Google searches for it, like I did this one looking for Microsoft Active Directory Federated Services login portals because oftentimes they are not well protected. When I did this, I actually found one in real life on Tesla. So if you can see that on the bottom of the screen, it says sign in Tesla. So Tesla actually protects the regular employee logon portal with uh, multi-factor authentication, but on their Active Directory Federated Services portal, they did not. So I, as an attacker, could start guessing login names and passwords there if I like. Uh, attackers frequently uh, guess against application programming interfaces. So if you have one, an application programming interface that allows the public to connect to it, make sure you protect it and you have account lockout enabled and that you monitor it with security. Because Acme said 75% of that 61 billion uh, password attempts were done against APIs. So it's a big, big deal. The attackers then usually get and download a password dictionary list. You can download these off the internet uh, that have all kinds of passwords in them. And then they get a tool like Spray. Uh, Spray Shell Script is a downloadable tool that any attacker can use to then guess against people's portals. And you say, hey, this is the type of login I'm going to do. This is the target IP address of the server. Here's the username list, the password list, and here's how many attempts I can do for a period of time. Like I can only do three guesses for 15 minutes without locking it out. They download that tool, they run it, and there's kind of an example of them running this tool and finding valid credentials. Again, Acme said 61 billion of these were done in a year and a half, and they frequently find people that have common passwords. And there's all kinds of tools they can use. Shell Spray Script is really common, uh, but they can also use any of these tools, Brutus or you know, Canon, Able, or Woodward, or really the bottom right-hand one, that's Hydra THC. That's a really, really common tool that they use as well. And here's some example images I got off the internet showing people being successful against real companies by doing password spray attack. Uh, you know, they just, you can see that they're, they're, they're very successful in the first example. In the second example, they're not super successful, but they do find someone that has the password of Princess. Turns out Princess and baseball and things like that are very popularly used and they'll guess about. So what are your defenses against it? Well, use multi-factor authentication where you can. Make sure your passwords have to be long and complex and uh, enable account lockout and make sure to monitor for these password spray attacks and do it for your application programming interfaces overall. Last attack I'm going to show you in the next four minutes is bad mailbox rules and rogue forms. Just know in any, uh, most of the traditional email clients that most people use, so Microsoft Outlook, um, Thunderbird on Exchange, Apple Mail, uh, and things like that. They allow the users to create rules that will handle email a certain way, like put them in certain inboxes and do things with it and cause automation. But those rules can also be used to launch badness. Uh, for, like, here's an example in the Microsoft Outlook where I create a rule that says copy every incoming email to and send it to another external email user uh, and this is be uh, like a rule that a bad guy could create to get copies of your email, and then it sends it outbound to them so they get a copy and you can read everything that you do. Uh, rules are called filters in Gmail. They're called different things in different email clients, but essentially the concept is the same, that you can create these rules that do different things. And attackers have frequently broken into people's email on their computers and then modified these rules and forms so that uh, they could open up, let's say, back doors and get into the person's company. They can run any program they want. They can start a script and that sort of stuff. Uh, I'm kind of rushing and running out of time here, but just know that attackers can, let's say in this case in Microsoft Outlook, they can actually modify a form in email so that every time that they send you an email with that same form name, let's say that they named the form frog or something, they could act, an attacker remotely could create a form called frog, send an email that looks completely innocuous to you, like the email would just looks as normal as you didn't, but you didn't know that it was made with a form called frog, and when they send it to you, they've created a form called frog that kicks off a malicious script. So they can 
can actually, in Outlook, design a form. So they break into your system. They create this form. In this case, they're, you know, where they, oops, let me go back a little bit there. I went a little bit too fast. But they can create and modify a form in your email that then runs a script. Like this is a script where it's running Netcat. That's a really common hacker tool that connects back to their server called rogueserver.com over port 443 because that's allowed out by most firewalls and then executes what's called a command com shell. Uh, so they create this form on a person's computer in their email, and the person doesn't know it's there. They then create and send an email to that form. They literally just give it the same name as that form, and it kicks off that script. Well, that's the way they used to do it manually, but now there's a bunch of tools that they can do it remotely. Uh, the Empire PowerShell is the most common. Oh, I'm keep going backwards here. Uh, the most common tool uh, that did this was called Empire PowerShell. Uh, and there's an interesting tool if you want to experiment with creating these rogue forms on people's computers. All you need is a login name, an email login name, and password. And you can remotely modify somebody's email rules or forms using multiple different hacker tools. The one that I'm going to show you a demo of now is one called Sense Post Ruler. It's a good guide tool, but it you can download it and see how it works. But basically, you get this ruler tool that runs in Linux. You, you tell with ruler, create this form and then send it to this person and then trigger the form. I'm going to show you a demo. This is by the Sense Post Ruler people. It's a great demo. You can watch it later on. But again, all they do is they have the person's email address and password, however they've captured that, and they're able to modify their email client remotely to have this rogue form that they then kick off and get a remote back door. This is an interesting demo if you've never seen it before. It goes kind of quick at the top. They have an Empire, or they have a SensePost ruler tool. They're checking the version number. Uh, now this is the victim client in Outlook. They're showing you that they don't have any rules or forms right now. It's all blank. On the right side of the screen, they have Process Explorer by Microsoft showing you what's running. Uh, and at the first, the first ruler tool that they run at the top, they're showing you the email address of the person and the form is going to be called Display. They're just checking to see that using the password they put in, they could connect to that email client at the bottom. It's Empire PowerShell listening agent. They're showing you there's no agents yet. At the top, they're going to have Empire PowerShell reverse shell. They're going to obfuscate it so it can't be found by antivirus. And now they're going to kick off their attack. So they're connecting to the email victim, adding a form called demo, and they're including in that form the Empire PowerShell reverse shell. Here it is. The tool's now connecting to that Outlook client. It's creating that malicious form, and then it's going to kick off that form by sending an email that when the email is opened or looked at, kicks off the Empire reverse shell. So now they're going to the client. You'll see the email arrive. And again, on the right side of the screen, it's, uh, it's Process Explorer, SysInternals Process Explorer. You'll see a command shell. There's the fake email, and boom. Now see that conhost.exe? That's a PowerShell, Empire PowerShell reverse shell opening up a listening agent to the hacker's computer. So again, all they did was, and now they're on that victim's computer with complete control of that system. All they did was have the email address and password kick off the SensePost ruler tool to inject a malicious form and activate it so it opened up a reverse uh, um, Empire reverse command com shell back to the hacker's server. Pretty wild, huh? So pretty wild. How do you fight this? We'll use multi-factor authentication whenever you possibly can. But just know also that antivirus and endpoint detection response software typically doesn't detect this. And so you need to periodically, at least every half year, check for rogue rules and forms. Microsoft actually gives you a script for Office 365 called Get All Tenant Rules and Forms. And SensePost made one called Not Ruler for on-premises Microsoft Exchange servers. But uh, for the other clients, for Gmail and Apple and stuff like that, you'd have to create your own scripts. But just know you should look for these rogue rules and forms and make sure that they're not maliciously modifying stuff. I know that uh, this has been really fast, and we only have a minute or two left for questions, but just know email, you know, always used by attackers. Your biggest attacks are just regular phishing emails, but there are some other advanced attacks. I hope I showed you some, uh, and uh, if you have any questions, and if we don't get to your questions today, if you email me at rogerg at nobefore.com, I promise I will answer your questions. Uh, and also you can follow me on LinkedIn and Twitter. But with that said, do we got a minute or two left for questions. Can we take a question or two? Absolutely, yeah. Great presentation, Roger. Just mind-blowing stuff there. 
I uh, love the demos. We've got uh, 48 questions in the queue, so I don't think we're going to have time for all of them. Uh, but wow. while we take a couple, yeah, while we take a couple, I've just brought up a poll for everyone out there that says, what additional information would you like? And I could tell a lot of folks uh, would like additional information. So we appreciate your participation there in the poll. Um, let's see, one of the questions here I wanted to ask you first off is, uh, what ports do I need to block to prevent the responder attack you demoed? Yeah, so I, I put them in there. Uh, it, there's really a handful of them, and this particular demo would definitely be NetBIOS, so that'd be port 135, 137, 138, 139, and 443, or 445. Uh, but there's actually some other ones based upon different attacks. Essentially, you're trying to block, block these what's called client-side attacks coming from your end-user workstations to the Internet. Like NetBIOS shouldn't be allowed off a workstation to the Internet. It should all stay local. So if you download this slide deck and you take a look at that slide, I think I have about 20 ports there that everybody should block. They really should already be blocked, but if not, just make sure they're blocked between regular workstations and the Internet. Got it. Got it. Okay. And then another question they're asking here, the first demo you showed was an Outlook. Does the same attack work in other email clients like Gmail? Uh, does browser-based or native make a difference? Uh, so I've tried this demo a whole bunch in all kinds of different email clients. It's always worked. Sometimes it, it, it works a little bit differently uh, and sometimes uh, not quite as smoothly, but it has always worked in every email client and operating system I've ever tried it with. So what I recommend is, again, get my download my deck and run that demo yourself, get Kali Linux, run Responder. Do, you can, literally, if you know just a tiny bit of Linux, you can set it up in an hour or two. If you don't know Linux, get a friend that does know, and you can set up an hour or two and see if it would work in your environment. Wow, scary stuff. Uh, let's see, another question. Um, are exploits like this also possible on Mac OS? Yes, yes. So, but again, try it and see how it works. But yes, everything I showed today works on all operating systems. Wow, wow. Very, very impressive. Uh, excellent presentation. Um, I'm afraid we don't have time for the now 62 questions in the queue for you, Roger, but um, we'll be sending those over please, to you please electronically. Email me. Yeah. Okay, okay, do that or email me at rogerg at noble4.com and I promise I'll respond to your question within 24 hours. Awesome. Yeah, rogerg at noble4.com. Uh, Roger, it's always a pleasure having you on. Thank you so much for your expert advice. Thank you, and thank you, everybody, for attending. And as Roger said, uh, check out knowbefore.com. Also, uh, email him if you didn't get your question answered, rogerg at knowbefore.com. Uh, there's a link there in the Handouts tab to start your free phishing security test, so make sure that you check that out as well. If you haven't answered the poll, I will leave it up while I announce the winner of our first Amazon $300 gift card. This is going to AJ Vivano from Missouri. Congratulations, AJ Vivano or Viviano from Missouri. All right, and with that, it's now time for our next presentation on today's Enterprise IT Virtual Summit. I'm excited now to welcome Alex Ash, who is the Marketing Campaigns Manager at 1Password. Hi, Alex. It's great to have you on. Hi, thanks for having me. I'm super excited to be here. Absolutely. We're, we're excited to have 1Password presenting on the Virtual Summit here for the first time. I'm a longtime 1Password user, so it's great to have you on. Take it away. Hey, I love to hear that. Um, hello. Okay, so welcome to stepping, how to step up your security game in 2022 with 1Password. I am super excited to be here and hope you are as well. So a little bit about me, I am Alex Ash, as mentioned, and I'm a campaign marketing manager here at 1Password. Uh, we have a ton to cover in just a short amount of time, so let's dive right in. A quick agenda just so you know a little bit about what to expect. Today we're going to cover the current cybersecurity landscape, what you can do about it, how we approach security here at 1Password, and some final takeaways um, and then we'll have, hopefully have a short amount of time for Q&A and how you can learn more. So let's go. All right, cybersecurity state of affairs or current landscape. Um, I think it's important to understand where we're at so that we can understand how and why we need to be taking security seriously. So uh, let's, oh, I'm missing, no, I'm not. Okay, let's define. 
So this is per the 2021 Verizon Data Breach Incident Report. It's actually really interesting. Um, you know, as interesting as security reports can get. But they put this out um, every year, and they've been doing it for a long time. So I would definitely go check that out. But they define an incident as a security event that compromises the integrity, confidentiality, or availability of an information asset. Whereas a breach is an incident that results in the confirmed disclosure, not just potential exposure of data to an unauthorized party. So what does that mean numbers-wise? Um, per some research we've done here at One Password, the average cost of a data breach is around $3.9 million. However, some companies like IBM cite it even higher, between four and $6 million. Um, the Identity Theft Research Center has reported an increase of 17% in the number of recorded breaches during 2021. So for reference, an estimated 36 billion records were compromised in 2020. So apparently hackers were uninterested in sourdough starters and puzzles, unlike the rest of us. Um, again, per the 2021 Verizon Data Breach Incident Report, 85% of breaches involved a human element and 61% involved credentials. So uh, Shiz Creek here, uh, my favorite. Um, those are some pretty large numbers and kind of mind blowing. So, you know, why? What are the factors playing into an increased number of cybersecurity threats? First, reduced visibility. Despite being in calendar year three, which is just mind blowing and wild and crazy to say of, you know, COVID restrictions and lockdown and work from home, a lot of these work from home systems you know, they weren't planned. They were supposed to be temporary and therefore they were more reactionary than intentional and executed plans for how to successfully and securely work from home. So with this increased work from home workforce comes increased threats that we may not have had pre two years ago, or we may not have had been dealing with all of them all at once. This has led to uh, reduced visibility overall into systems, devices, even the networks where data is being accessed and traveling might be new, especially because a lot of people, such as those in healthcare or the finance industry, um, they might not be used to working from home or the library or even coffee shops. Next is higher demand for productivity and collaboration tools. Um, this all presents risk. Anytime we have change or change the way we do things, we introduce risk. Anytime we increase our number of tools, especially ones that integrate with other tools or other systems, we open up the number of channels that could be an access point for bad actors. Uh, finally, we are all just a little distracted. It's worth mentioning because it means that things are just a little more vulnerable, you know, personally and professionally. We're all humans and cyber attackers are always, always, always going to attack and target our humanness. You know, we're being tested on a lot of fronts right now. Suddenly, we are all simultaneously employees, coworkers, teachers, doctors, caregivers, et cetera. Like, you name it, we're doing all of it right now. So, yeah, we are all tired, distracted, definitely weary. Um, and this can lead to both inaction as well as just having our guards down. Um, you know, we think a lot about break-ins for home all the time. And if we came home, even if we had set an alarm um, and chairs were flipped, papers were everywhere, it would be obvious that someone we didn't want had been there and had invited, invaded our privacy and space. But, you know, what if you got an email that looks like it was from the CEO and was super heartfelt about how we've all had a rough two years, yet despite the changes and hardships, the company is doing really well. And because of that, you're all being rewarded with a bonus. Um, and here's where you need to go to make sure that your bank account info is up to date. And I don't know, for tech purposes, you need to confirm your latest address is, is on file because we're working from home. So you may have decided to, you know, move to Bali. Um, who knows? So it would be super natural in that instance to be like, oh, yes, finally, good news. Um, however, this is a very realistic example of an elaborate phishing attack. Uh, and that could open your employees to a ransomware attack. Um, so 
So it's not as obvious to determine, and our humanness gets in the way of making smart decisions sometimes. Also, burnout. This one is kind of interesting because it's not as obvious and or seems to only recently have become, you know, a thing that we're kind of all talking about. But in 2021, when Password did research and came out with a state of secure access report, and um, for this uh, report specifically, we focus on burnout. Um, you can go to our website, you can download it. And what we found was actually really interesting. 80% of professionals reported feelings of being burnt out. Um, the number was actually higher in security specific roles, and that number is 84%. Um, burnout employees are three times as likely as others to say security rules and policies aren't worth the hassle. Um, you know, most importantly, this report establishes a clear connection between employee burnout and cyber threat exposure. As ready to resign and otherwise disengaged employees let down their guards and skirt their company's rules and protocols. So that's a lot. Um, and you know, what can you do about it? First, evaluate and iterate. Continue to adapt to a hybrid workforce. If you haven't already, go back and reevaluate your security policies. Take out what no longer makes sense for work from home scenarios and what new threat scenarios you need to address. For example, your BYOD or bring your own device standards. Um, you know, with parents working from home, kids learning from home, it's understandable that work security versus home security lines are getting a little blurred. Uh, for example, I was on a call the other day and the CEO didn't have his camera on. Um, he was in Chicago and he was like, yeah, uh, my kid unexpectedly had to work from home today, so he has my camera. So, you know, things are getting a little blurry, um, you know, so additionally review things like your network security protocols and even your travel policy might need updated. Um, when, you know, and when establishing or iterating on new policies and procedures moving forward, make sure that you're going back to old systems or tools, code, basically any access point that could be liable and make sure that it's all updated as well. Next, make easy security the default. Uh, here at OnePassword, we talk a lot about making the easy thing to do the secure thing to do. You could have the best, most secure tools, but if your solution causes friction of any kind, people will bypass, ignore, or find alternate routes uh, to get their job done. Um, this is called shadow IT. These are unsanctioned accounts, plugins, tools, um, even devices that aren't approved by security. Research we've done here at 1Password found that 64% of respondents have created at least one account in the past 12 months that their IT department doesn't know about. Um, and Pastrols have definitely been guilty of this. And 33% of people who have created shadow IT accounts reuse memorable credentials which presents risk. Uh, there's usually a reason someone is using a shadow IT tool. So try to understand what those reasons are, even if it's not necessarily fitting within your perfect security ideals, and then work together within your, um, within your organization to find a solution that feels easier for the user and is also up to security standards. And make sure that you're clearly defining expectations for employees. If they aren't sure what's expected of them, this can for just general confusion, apathy, and failure to do the secure thing. Next, security shouldn't be the job of just one person or one IT team. A lot of times the culture perpetuates the idea that, yes, IT builds the structure, implements the security policies, and expects them to keep it safe, but that's not what a culture of security means. It means that, yes, the IT or security team builds the structure, but that everyone is responsible for keeping it safe. So let's dive into that a little bit more as far as building a culture of security and how to do it. First, let's, let's define. Awareness is the, uh, the basic knowledge of threats and risks, defenses, and protections 
and protections in place. Culture, culture goes beyond that. It goes beyond just the basics. It includes how individuals understand security and the role that they play in it, along with the associated attitude towards security and how that impacts their actions. A culture of security creates a shift in everyday habits and behaviors. So I'm gonna repeat that because I think it's super, super important. A culture of security creates shifts in everyday habits and behaviors. So how do we how do we do that here at One Password? Security isn't just a policy or procedure here at One Password. It's a core value and ethos and guides a lot of how we do things and make business decisions. Um, it's a core value. It's an ethos. It is a guiding light for everything we do here at One Password. So how do we do this? First, we take a human-centric approach to security. At One Password, we focus on this a lot, and here's what it means: taking the time to fully understand how humans behave, both their strengths and their weaknesses, and then closing the gap between how people think and behave and what the secure thing to do is. And then creating a security program and environment that enables employees to succeed. Providing resources, increasing confidence will only empower people to make better decisions because you understand where and why humans are vulnerable. Um, and then when we feel confident about understanding something, we're more likely to do the right thing and make decisions um, that are secure. And, you know, it's just, it feels easy and it feels good to do. Next, um, sorry to hear my dogs in the background. It is trash day. Um, and they would like me to know about it. So anyways, uh, be transparent and open. We work really hard to foster an open and transparent relationship between security and the rest of the organization. Um, lack of trust plus secrecy equals a surefire breeding ground for unsafe practices. If something seems off, they're more likely to not take it seriously or not report it. Or even if someone feels like they may have done something wrong, they're less likely to report it because they don't want to get in trouble. So a couple of questions to ask yourself uh, are, does the company know who is on a security team or who's responsible for helping with security issues if they have something to report or ask about? Um, you know, do they know how to get a hold of the security team? And is it easy? Do you have a form? Do you have a Slack channel or you know, whatever messaging system you use? Uh, if it's an email box, is it well known what the email address is, or is it is it easy to remember? Um, who's monitoring this, and what is the expected response time? Um, even just this morning, I had a friend say she submitted an email to phishing at her company name dot com or dot org uh, on January sixth and hadn't heard back. So, you know, just make sure that just like you have expectations of your employees, make sure that they know what to expect from you as well. Next, educate and empower. Uh, be consistent and often with training. We at One Password consider education a tool for success. Don't just be a one and done, meaning don't make security a once a year training to check on the, check that compliance box. Um, having a one-hour training once a year, it's not going to be memorable, and if you're only having a training when something bad happens, um, this makes it tend to feel like everyone is in trouble or kind of creates unnecessary chatter like, ooh, who did what? Um, so having consistent training shows you're invested in employee development and helping uh, employees understand security and trusting them to be stakeholders in the company's overall security health. A lot of times mistakes happen or people fall for phishing emails and such because they're, they're just ill-prepared to handle the solution um, or situation or recognize that it might not be legit. Um, you know, some emails are gonna be super obvious. Uh, most of us don't know a Nigerian prince just generously offering us a million dollars. If we just give us give them their bank account, um, and these scams have also gotten super sophisticated. Kind of the example going along with the example that I gave before, 
you know, we're taught to be skeptical from a young age. Don't take candy from strangers. Don't talk to strangers. Uh, but when, when it comes to the workplace, we're taught to be generally trusting of our coworkers. Um, so, you know, maybe just hold on to a little bit of that skepticism. Um, and if there's any red flags at all, like, listen to those. Um, because under the right circumstances, anyone can fall for anything. As employees, we are both the greatest line of defense and also the biggest risk. But consistent training means that people will be consistently on alert and more apt to do the right thing because it's top of mind. And definitely do not scare, shame, or bully. You know, no one likes to be bullied into anything, regardless of whether or not it's for our own good. If you can make your training relatable, you'll be more likely to get people to understand why you're doing it, why it's important, and it's not just another corporate initiative. Also, if people are too scared that they're going to make the wrong decision, they won't make any decision. Um, or they might make the right decision today, but that doesn't necessarily mean they will tomorrow or next week. So, excuse me, help empower people to feel confident that they're doing the right thing. Making the environment a safe space to recognize and understand the mistakes and that mistakes happen and why they happen versus being shamed or called out for it is also part of having compassionate, human-centric approach. Uh, here at One Password, we actually reward people with an eyes of the month award versus a slap on the wrist. Um, staying positive helps people stay motivated and keep them motivated to become long-term invested security advocates. Um, do, do not try to trick people this will absolutely break the trust between your security team and the rest of the org. And spoiler alert, I can assure you that sending out an email saying everyone's getting a big bonus or that you're reducing healthcare coverage and then being like, just kidding, uh, this is a phishing campaign to see how many people fell for it, um, it's not going to go over well. This just comes back to being human centric. You know, playing with people's emotions and having fear based approach and perpetuating fear mongering, it's not going to be effective. So, encourage people to ask questions. You know, we don't know uh, what we don't know, and that's okay. By being open about security and making conversations and security the norm, it gives people permission to feel comfortable asking, hey, does this seem weird? Or, you know, did you get this email? It also gives people the opportunity to tell you what they're still unsure of or want more information or training about. Um, in my last company, we had a forum on a website that was specifically dedicated to, um, you know, security where people could go to submit fishy emails or other kind of um, things they were unsure about. And sometimes the emails were legit, um, but it at least made me feel like, okay, it, it empowered me to feel like I had some control over the situation. And I was able to say, here's why I think this is shady. And, you know, I'd rather be too cautious than not cautious enough or to ignore it altogether just because I wasn't sure of what to do. So three things you can start doing today. If you, you know, zoned out and you take away nothing else from this presentation, um, here are three action items that you can start doing today to be more secure. So first, um, get a password manager. Um, I'm a little biased, obviously, but I would be remiss if I didn't say this. Um, you know, stop reusing passwords. Reusing passwords, I get it. It's easy, they're easy to remember, but it's definitely a bad habit to get into, and you're just setting yourself up for more risk. Uh, you know, I would also argue that when I was, before I used a password manager, um, passwords were just a hassle because I was asked to change them or I would, you know, try to differentiate between using one number from the one that I had used before it or a letter. Um, so I was constantly being asked to reset my password, um, which, you know, of course, got in the way of me doing actual work. Um, and it was just annoying. So, you know, if the securest thing to do is to tell people and expect them to use strong, unique passwords for every account, just make it easy for them. 
help people out by providing a password manager to create and store these passwords. Uh, Word docs, Google docs, and even Post-it notes. Yes, I have done this. I've worked at companies where this is normal, where I even have like a Post-it note on my desk um, of passwords for certain things. Um, it's just not the secure thing to do. And a password manager, such as one password, um, it helps automate and simplify one of the basic building blocks of online security. Um, adding multi-factor authentication here will also add an additional, an additional layer of protection as well. So make sure you're using that when it's available as well. You know, just use these tools. Give your employees the tools to succeed. Um, as a side note, I'm not going to go too much into detail on this because we do have a product demo that you can sign up for, but 1Password does have a feature called Watchtower, and it calls out any accounts that have the same or weak passwords, as well as it monitors any accounts that uh, may have been compromised and you might want to change your passwords for, or that you should absolutely change your passwords for. Next adopt and shift to a zero trust mindset. This is the idea to not trust a person or device until it's verified that they are who they say they are. You know, it's not personal, but not every person in your company needs all of the access to all of the things. Um, you know, if I hear one more password about, or <laughs> one, one password, you can see what's on my brain. If I hear one more story of an intern being blamed for a data breach, I'm just going to lose my mind because in all likelihood, they were either given access to data or accounts that they probably didn't need access to or that didn't ask them for verification or that they had reused an old password or something similar that they didn't set themselves. Um, it was just kind of inherited and so I was like, here you go. So, you know, it's not their fault. So the action item here is to review who has access to what and who needs the strongest methods of verification for their access level and what those verification methods, methods are. Um, I, I shouldn't have to say this, but I'm going to also make sure that everyone who has access is a current employee. I know this sounds intuitive um, and, you know, you might be saying like, well, duh. Uh, however, 77% of DevOps workers still have access to their former employees' infrastructure secrets. And this has definitely happened to me before where I've left the company and sometimes for weeks, months, uh, even years possibly, um, I have had access to accounts that I clearly should not have since I didn't work there anymore. And finally, stop thinking that it won't happen to you. You know, a lot of people are working from home now that normally wouldn't, and for industries that normally wouldn't either. A lot of these small to mid-sized companies have just as much valuable information without that large or sophisticated IT infrastructure IT department or security specific focused roles that are kind of like looking out for these things. So, um, you know, it just makes them easier to hack and get into. Just because you're a small business doesn't mean that you don't have valuable information that someone else might want or be able to use or be able to use to get what they want. So make sure you're using the tools that are out there and available and, um, you know, stop thinking that it won't happen to you because it definitely could. Um, and that is that's all I got. Uh, if we have any questions. Absolutely. Yeah, great presentation. Uh, really such excellent, timely advice for all of us. Uh, we appreciate that. We do have some questions for you, Alex. And while we do those, uh, take those questions, I'm just going to bring up a poll for everyone out there that says, what additional information would you like about the 1Password solution? And we want to hear your feedback there on the poll. Uh, obviously, there's a lot of interest. A lot of additional information uh, is needed because there's a lot of great questions out here about 1Password. So I'll just start with this one. Alex, they're asking, if you have any advice for getting executive buy-in for increased security awareness and training, especially at smaller companies uh, that might not have a dedicated CISO or security team? Yeah. Um, build a business case for why security matters to stakeholders 
and align security measures with what's important to them. Um, you know, how does it align with overall business metrics and goals? You know, again, I try to stay away from fear-based tactics, but get them to look at security a little bit more holistically and align it to the business. You know, what would happen cost-wise, reputation-wise, if something were to happen, or if there were a breach or data, you know, was leaked, like what would that mean? How would that impact their day-to-day -day or their, their overall bottom line? You know, remote work is here to stay in cybersecurity. It, you know, it's been around it's, and it's gonna stay around. It's not going away. So making sure that we're not just thinking about this as a, you know, temporary or for right now problem, or, you know, until things get back to normal, like this is the new normal. This is this is just how we, this hybrid um, model is just, it's how we live and work now. And security measures um, and precautions and tools, they need to be baked into long-term long uh, business operations. Absolutely, absolutely, great advice. Um, let's see, another question here. They say, we're a small team and most of us wouldn't be super comfortable being the face of security. Any advice or resources on how to make security more approachable at our company? Yeah, definitely. You know, I think this is really common in a lot of the places that I've worked. We didn't have a dedicated CISO or, you know, sometimes even a security team. It was more of an IT team or sometimes even, you know, an office admin taking care of the IT stuff and security stuff. So if you are the face of security, try to branch out to other people or departments within other teams that might be willing to be your security advocates um, that people could go to them with questions or concerns and then those people could come to you. Um, you know, and I think overall, as you start to shift the culture to one where security is just embedded, it won't feel so awkward to be the face of security because security will just be on everyone's radar and, you know, not just the responsibility of one person or one team, um, you know, and or you can start to build a case for why you need this type of role within your organization and get someone that is comfortable being the face of security. Absolutely. Yeah. Excellent advice. Um, Alex, I'm afraid we've run out of time here in our live Q&A session. That's all the time we have. But there are, I see, 50 plus questions there for you in the electronic queue. Uh, and so many folks out there who have said, you know, they use 1Password, really love it, has worked so great for them. So uh, timely advice. Uh, thank you so much for being on the virtual summit today. Yeah, absolutely. And if you want to learn more, feel free to go to our website. We constantly have webinars and we have resources that you can download. And um, we even actually have One Password University where um, there are training resources that you yourself can explore or you can share with your team to, um, you know, start to ramp up your security this year. Perfect. Sounds like some great resources. Thank you so much, Alex. Really appreciate it. Thanks so much for having me. And for more information on 1Password, uh, also check out the handouts tab. There is a guide there for creating a culture of security from 1Password. Uh, you can just download that PDF and check it out after the event. All right, it's now time for our next gift card announcement. This is going out to Raymond Santiago from Puerto Rico. Congratulations, Raymond Santiago. You won our next Amazon $300 gift card. And now let's announce our first, grand, first set of grand prizes. We have three Oculus Rift VR headsets. These are some totally awesome headsets here. I've got three of them to announce. These are going out to Jerry, Gary Childress from Arizona, Keith Lenz from Colorado, and Dustin Bernier from Massachusetts. Congratulations to all the prize winners. All right, let's keep the virtual summit moving here. It's now my pleasure to bring in our next presenter. Welcome, Ryan Terry, Senior Solutions Product Marketing Manager at Okta. Ryan, take it away. Ryan Terry, I'm a Solutions Product Marketing Manager here at Okta, specifically focused on our security solutions. And today I'll be providing a short overview of why you should consider an identity-first approach to your zero trust security strategy 
and what steps you can take immediately to help your organization protect itself against identity-driven threats that are so prevalent today. Plus, I'm gonna share a few of our results from our brand new State of Zero Trust report so you can see how your peers are progressing along their zero trust security journeys in the coming months. So it's no longer news that companies need to support an increasingly distributed workforce. This was really already the case before the global pandemic, but now 82% of company leaders plan to allow employees to work remotely at least part of the time after the pandemic, and 47% plan to allow them to permanently work from home. And at the same time, identity-based attacks skyrocketed last year. The combination of these two forces has created a challenge for organizations to protect their critical resources. More than 60% of all breaches involve stolen credentials. Phishing is increasingly present in the number of breaches tracked. And recent ransomware attacks have shut down schools and hospitals and affected the availability of fuel and food in the United States. Organizations with gaps in their identity security stacks are significantly more at risk in this climate and need to look to take immediate action to fight against today's identity-based threats. So in light of the current threat landscape, organizations around the world have moved past traditional security approaches and are widely adopting zero trust security strategies that are strongly recommended by industry analysts and in some cases, even mandated by the federal government. Okta recently surveyed more than 600 security decision makers at companies around the world. And we've just released the findings in our 2021 State of Zero Trust Security Report. 90% of respondents stated that they either have a zero trust initiative in place or will have one in the next 12 to 18 months. That's up from 41% in the 2020 report. And when asked whether the pandemic or today's working environment has changed the prioritization of zero trust for their organizations, more than three quarters or 78% of companies globally say zero trust has increased in priority and in some cases has become the organization's top priority, as is the case with 36% of the Forbes Global 2000 companies that were surveyed as part of this report. While security is a huge factor for organizations looking to support their evolving workforces, these teams must also work to strike the right balance between security and usability. Easy to use authentication options reduce the number of misconfigurations and removes the incentive for users to set up kludgy alternatives. It is important to provide frictionless controls that organizations can adopt faster and consistently prove to be more effective. Most of our survey respondents, as well as our customers here at Okta, are confident they can optimize the user experience while moving to higher assurance factors and context-based access policies. So identity is really at the center of zero trust, the concept of never trust, always verify. Identity ensures the right person has the right access in the right context, regardless of their location, their device, or their network. To that end, it's likely no surprise that organizations ranked people and devices as the top core zero trust requirement in terms of priority in this year's report. And Gartner listed identity first security on their list of top 10 security and risk management trends in 2021. An identity-first security strategy provides centralized visibility and control to ensure all accounts are accounted for across your entire ecosystem. There are three considerations when you're looking at an identity-first security strategy. First, the modern threat landscape and today's attacks mean all apps are critical. This has been compounded due to our remote work environment and eventually a hybrid work environment of remote and in-person. The way we are all working and accessing data, plus the fact that if attackers gain access to your environment through credential-based attacks like phishing and brute force attacks, they can find their way to all of your apps with critical data. 
This means hardening access to only what we used to consider critical apps is not sufficient any longer. Second, it's also critical to make sure there is protection from threats against all vectors from on-prem to cloud to mobile and for employees as well as customers, partners, contractors, and suppliers. We want to ensure all are protected because any of these can be a source of vulnerability in your enterprise. Identity can help prevent attackers from getting into the organization in the first place. And a zero trust architecture creates a hostile environment for threat actors should they get access in the first place. Third, and finally, identity first security can help you with your digital transformation because it enhances user experience and productivity. Identity ensures the right person has the right level of access on the right device to the right resource in the right context. You can increase security with context-based access management without adding friction to the user's experience. So here at Okta, we work with our customers and use this framework in our research report as well. We think about identity first approach along a maturity curve. We're finding our customers are thinking about their identity and access management maturity in this way. And this model they're using to start their zero trust security initiatives. So if you're starting on the left, going from left to right, stage zero is really fragmented identity where it's quite difficult to enforce contextual access policies. You have an active directory that's on-prem and really there are no integrations kind of anywhere across your IAM solution. There's no cloud integration, passwords are everywhere. It's quite fragmented. Moving from left to right, stage one is really where you start to unify identity and access management and set the groundwork for doing contextual access in a zero trust way. This is developing single sign-on across used employees, partners and the supply chain, modern multi-factor authentication and unifying policies across apps and servers. Then you start getting into the contextual access stage or stage two. This is where you start using context-based access policies like whether the device is trusted or not. You're using multiple factors across user groups like hard tokens or push verification or even SMS. And you're doing automated deprovisioning for people leaving the organization or contractors as they no longer with your work with your organization because you don't want them to have access to those resources once they're no longer working with you and then providing secure access to APIs, which are the modern build, building blocks of applications. Finally, stage three is the adaptive workforce stage. You're no longer just relying on context-based policies, but risk-based access policies as well doing continuous and adaptive authentication and authorization and frictionless access, often in the form of passwordless authentication, which we're seeing many organizations start to think about over the next 12 to 18 months, uh, as I'll show you here in a few slides. So this is the identity first maturity curve. We're seeing organizations use as a framework to start their zero trust security strategies. So our, resort, our research found organizations around the world plan to make significant strides towards maturing on this identity and access management maturity curve in the coming 12 to 18 months. Impressively, each of the 12 projects will have at least reached 25% adoption by the end of next year. The majority of the global 2000 are already well on their way, moving steadily from stage zero to stage three. The top priorities for organizations globally now and over the next 12 to 18 months are implementing single sign-on SSO and MFA for external users like contractors, suppliers, and business partners, and setting context-based access policies. Adopting passwordless authentication is also a big area of emphasis for all regions, as well as the global 2000 companies over the next 12 to 18 months. In order to assess progress within the unified IAM stage, 
We asked whether businesses requiring SSO for employees or external users, whether they're implementing MFA and or are managing privileged access to cloud infrastructure. By adding multiple layers of security to their authentic authentication, organizations focusing on stage one of this maturity model are finding effective ways to give the right per person access to the right resources with minimal free friction. Well, at least three of the five projects in stage one have been adopted by more than 40% of company respondents today. In the next 12 to 18 months, all projects will have been implemented by at least two thirds or 67% of companies. And the global 2000 companies trend even higher at 70% across all five of these projects. The key areas of focus in stage one for companies in the next 12 to 18 months are extending single sign-on and MFA for external users. In terms of creating unified access policies by extending SSO and MFA to apps, servers, and more, companies are continuously looking to secure access to various resource types, while adoption varies across the different resource types. 81% of companies around the world have extended SSO and MFA to their SaaS applications. Most are now focusing on other resources, namely internal applications, servers, databases, and APIs. While infrastructure as a service and platforms as a service aren't currently focuses for companies or respondents from this survey, more companies plan to prioritize both of these resource types over the next 12 to 18 months. More than half of all respondents stated they've already implemented multiple factors to better inform authentication decisions across user groups. Impressively, 45% of global companies say they use biometrics, a high assurance factor. That said, the majority of companies still rely on low assurance factors, such as passwords and security questions, that can be stolen through social engineering and other identity-based attacks. According to the National Institute of Standards and Technologies, uh, their guidelines indicate many of the common factors used by organizations today increase the probability of account takeovers. Among Okta's own customers, we've noticed the higher assurance factors like push notifications are on the rise compared to more brittle two-factor methods of authentication. Last year, our clients relied less on SMS and security questions and more on higher assurance factors. So in the six months prior to the global pandemic, use of our own Okta Verify grew by 28%, while from February to October, 2020, so right in the heart of the pandemic last year, usage jumped 184%. For stage two adoption, we asked respondents whether their organizations deploy safeguards such as multiple factors across user groups, whether they secure access to APIs, automate account provisioning and deprovisioning for employees and or external users, or whether they use context-based access policies. So globally, respondents plan to make strides across stage two, stage two projects with adoption levels over the next year or two, ranging from 26% to 75%. The three most adopted stage two projects around the world over the next 12 to 18 months will be securing access to APIs at 75% of respondents, deploying multiple factors across user groups at 67%, and automating the provisioning and deprovisioning of employees at 66% of respondents. Because ensuring that people have the right level of access in the right context is a key tenant of a zero trust strategy, we asked respondents how they are making their MFA policies context aware. This involves setting access policies that can better assess users' devices, networks, locations, or other applications they're attempting to access. It's clearly an area of, or of focus for organizations around the world. This year, more and more companies moved away from basing access grants on whether a user is accessing resources from a corporate network. 
from 21% in 2020 to 7% in 2021. Respondents also told us more important factors they use in access decisions are related to, dev to device posture, such as whether a user's device is managed, known and or verified as healthy. The most critical attribute being whether the user's device is managed. While this was likely the primary context organizations relied on prior to the pandemic, Many IT staff likely had to rush to enable the workforce with whatever devices were available at the onset of the lockdown in 2020. It's probable that many chose device is known as their next best attribute in this situation. Increasingly, organizations are now looking to whether these known devices are verified and healthy. Two key contexts for enabling zero trust. Finally, in stage three, adaptive workforce, we asked respondents about their plans to adopt passwordless authentication. One way organizations can increase flexibility is by embracing passwordless access while using high assurance factors. Given the insecurity of passwords, particularly since 73% of online accounts use duplicate passwords, credential harvesting tends to be the most fruitful tactic for today's threat actors. Relying on passwords alone leaves organizations vulnerable to password spray and credential stuffing attacks. Multiple high assurance factors such as factor sequencing and biometric based logins through web authn or U2F security keys. These factors can mitigate risks and provide flexibility of passwordless authentication. This year, more than a quarter of respondents said they either have or will soon implement passwordless access options for their users. For Global 2000 Company, that's even higher as 50% or half of all respondents will have adopted passwordless options in the next 12 to 18 months. Because there's not a silver bullet to zero trust, no single solution provides all of the zero trust recommendations promoted by organizations like Forrester, Google, NIST, and others. The critical best practice is to leverage identity as the foundational technology across the security stack and integrate it across your entire ecosystem. Integrating your identity and access management solution across tools, including your SIM, SOAR, CASB, and MDM solutions provide a holistic, in-depth approach to your zero trust security strategy. At least three quarters of companies around the world say that they'll have integrations between their IAM solutions and EMM, SOAR, SIM, MDM, and CASB solutions within the next 12 to 18 months. So zero trust is all about dynamic policy evaluation using all of the access context available and really only granting the right access to the right person on the right device in the right context for the right amount of time. Resources could be SaaS or on-prem apps, platform as a service, infrastructure as a service, servers, APIs, as well as the network. Think about the context resources such as CASB would give you about the application and it could provide deep visibility on whether it's a corporate resource or shadow IT. Other contexts could include device posture and state information from MDMs. In our survey, respondents ranked, like I said, whether the device was known and whether the device was in a healthy state as the top two factors providing access to resources. The heart of zero trust architecture is its centralized control pane where identity is the key component. Here you can evaluate which resource could be granted based on all of the context dynamically evaluated in an access policy framework. This identity-based zero trust control plane focuses not just the policy evaluation during the authentication and authorization process, but also enforces a policy-based identity administration and governance to drive access provisioning workflow. This control pane should also focus on essential security features, including threat protection, risk signal ingestion, and behavioral 
behavioral pattern monitoring to take adaptive access decisions. This framework would establish a flexible and dynamic zero trust architecture in your organization. At Okta, our North Star is to be the global identity standard for all use cases across your workforce and your customers. This isn't an item on our roadmap, but it's our long-term vision and mission to solve some of the most pressing problems in the connected world today. So we're born and built in the cloud. We're committed to connecting everything. We're independent and neutral, so we provide integrations and partnerships across your entire ecosystem. And our uptime and our auditing is second to none. Okta is purely focused on identity and access management. It's all we think about and it's all we talk about with the world's largest organizations. If you'd like to learn more about our 2020 Zero Trust Report that we just released, or if you'd like to identify where your organization sits on the zero trust identity and access management maturity curve, let me recommend these two things. So both of these, the report, as well as our zero trust assessment tool can be found on Okta.com. If you navigate to our solutions page and then onto our adopt a zero trust security model page. Thank you for your time and we'll open it up for any questions. All right, great presentation. Thank you so much, Ryan. I really appreciate that. I learned a lot. I learned a lot about Okta. I'm sure the audience did as well. I've just brought up our poll question that says, what additional information would you like about the Okta solution? And I'm afraid we are running out of time to do live Q&A with Ryan. So Ryan will be taking questions electronically. So of course, we encourage your questions electronically. We, we've already gotten uh, many questions for Rob or Ryan at Okta, and we appreciate that. Uh, so keep those questions coming, and I'll leave up the poll here for a few moments while I announce our next prize winner here today on the virtual summit. An Amazon $300 gift card. This one going to Lauren Berta from Virginia. Congratulations, Lauren Berta from Virginia. Uh, of course, a lot more gift cards to give out and grand prizes. Our next grand prize drawing is coming up after the next presentation. All right, thank you to everyone who responded there to the poll. We do appreciate your feedback. Also appreciate all the excellent uh, questions and comments uh, coming in. A number of you said, you know, you've been using Okta for a while and it's worked great for you. Uh, so great feedback. Thank you for sharing that. And the remainder of the questions will for, uh, forward over to Ryan electronically. So let's keep the virtual summit here rolling. It's now my pleasure to bring in our next presenter and introduce you to David Berliner, Director of Security Strategy at SimSpace. Hey, David, thanks for being on the summit. Hey. Thank you so much. Uh, excited to be here today. Great to have you on. Uh, excited to learn more about what you all are doing there at SimSpace. So take it away. All right. Thank you very much. Great. Uh, so as mentioned, I'm David Berliner, the Director of Security Strategy for SimSpace. I'm excited to share with you today uh, about how you can uh, improve your defense in depth, uh, leveraging cyber ranges to explore, test, and improve each layer of your security stack. So as I'm sure all of you are well aware, um, the core concept of defense in depth is that each individual layer uh, across people, processes, perimeter, network host application, and data, um, in and of itself is permeable. Um, it is not, does not offer perfect security. Um, but the uh, idea is that uh, collectively, uh, they will stop the threats that get through one or more of the earlier layers. However, in practice, uh, that doesn't always work out, um, whether that is uh, by virtue of you having malicious insiders that weaken the defenses on your people side, either deliberately or unknowingly. Um, most uh, threats start by compromising a user. Um, it could be that the fact that your processes are inconsistent between different departments, different uh, offices that you have around uh, the world. Um, 
the perimeter, especially with the advent uh, or the current situation of everyone working from home due to the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, has made it so that your perimeter defenses don't function the way that they used to. The um, concept that you can secure a inside network and outside um, does not hold up when, like I am right now, uh, working from home office on my personal networking equipment with personal computers uh, running on that same uh, network. Um, you have new hosts getting added uh, on a regular basis that need additional protection, um, and you may not even have full visibility into where all of your data lives. Um, and what that means uh, is that you're challenged uh, on um, seeing your uh, defense and adapt. Often, um, your security team will be encountering situations for the first time uh, when they face a real threat. Um, that means that they not only need to be responding to that threat, but learning about it at the same time, going down a learning curve um, that takes up valuable time and energy while the attacker is in the environment. Um, as mentioned above, you have all these changes to the landscape that you're constantly having to deal with. Um, and that leads to a, a challenge of not necessarily having enough time uh, to be able to respond to each new threat and, and puts uh, teams on the defensive. However, um, leveraging a cyber range, um, much of this can be significantly improved. Uh, for those of you not familiar with the concept of a cyber range, um, it is a simulation of your production environment created with very high fidelity, um, your technology, your tools, your user activity. Um, and together that creates a safe and isolated place within which you can test out uh, how your organization might fare um, across your people, technology, and processes. Uh, so one of the things that can help with exploring your defense in depth um, with a cyber range um, is proactively identifying the vulnerabilities in your environment and getting patches out faster. Um, not only can you better explore where you need to patch and understand where those vulnerabilities are in your environment, but you can test out the efficacy of new patches, both their security value and whether they cause any disruption to your production environment inside of the safe range, speeding up your ability to get patches out uh, and improve your uh, defensive state. Um, you can also uh, make sure that your security team is seeing threats for the first time in practice before they see it in the wild. Uh, one of the founding principles or ideas behind SimSpace came from our founders' experience in the U.S. Air Force. Um, one uh, common understanding from the Air Force, uh, from our military history, is that the survivability rate of pilots goes up very significantly after their 10th mission. Um, that experience that they have gained means that future sorties, they're much more likely to be able to succeed in their, uh, in their mission. And so the Air Force does as much as it can to get those first 10 missions done in a safe environment, in a training environment. And that same uh, approach can be taken in cybersecurity, leveraging a cyber range, where your team can practice responding to the latest and advanced persistent threats um, inside of the confines of this environment. Additionally, um, one of the growing uh, trends is the use of purple teaming, where your blue team and red team work together to help you understand the efficacy of different parts of your defense in depth, the impact of changes to your security settings or the use of new security tools. Um, and the cyber range can help uh, expedite that process, bringing it outside of the politics that often goes around uh, deploying to production um, and allowing you to test things in a safe place with real threats. But the real kicker here um, is that cyber ranges can help you truly evaluate across each layer of the defense in depth. Typically when you encounter a threat, either in practice or um, more commonly in the actual production uh, environment, you only see as far as it gets before it is stopped. Hopefully it is stopped. Um, but you never see what would happen if that control, uh, whether it's a human control or one of your security tools, hadn't stopped it from getting further. And the whole concept of defense in depth is making sure that each layer, even if it doesn't succeed, the next layer is there to uh, secure your environment. And leveraging cyber ranges, you can actually acknowledge that an attack was defended at a certain point in your defense in depth, but then let the attack keep going. 
um, and see what would happen if that security control failed, if that process didn't work, um, and thus really strengthen each layer collectively of your defense in depth. Now, typically, uh, cyber range uh, providers such as ourselves offer a set of different capabilities that support evaluating your defense in depth. The fundamental capability of a cyber range is at the core of this, a high fidelity environment that um, mimics your production systems, your production users, allows for your safely running of automated or human-based um, attacks, and leverages the full set of cybersecurity technology that you actually are deploying in your defense and depth strategy. It's typically complemented with a learning management system designed to give uh, your security team hands-on experience um, as well as to train executives and other stakeholders who would need to respond to a cyber incident on how they would handle um, the, such an event. At the same time, it has capabilities to uh, enable you to understand the efficacy and tune your cybersecurity stack, both individually and collectively, how, seeing how they work together to form that defense in depth. And then with that insight into your technology, your people, and your processes, give you an overall sense of the risk of your uh, environment um, and help you make decisions around investment, improvement, even cyber insurance uh, to enable you to provide the best protection to your environment. Um, and furthermore, it can connect in with your broader operational practices in IT to help you with deploying and validating patches, exploring um, the way that you might evolve your IT stack. Um, and this fits into a larger cybersecurity development life cycle uh, where the flywheel on the left uh, rep represents how you are investing in your cybersecurity team and technology, understanding their efficacy in different circumstances, and giving them the means to grow and improve on their career paths for your security operators and the tuning and efficacy of your cybersecurity stack. And that feeds into a similar virtuous cycle on your operations side, where you're evaluating the latest patches, you're evaluating the uh, new IT transformations that you might want to consider, whether that's uh, expanding your attack surface through an M&A activity or a cloud transformation. All of those can be explored in a cyber range more quickly, cost-effectively, and easily before making those changes to production. Uh, now, a question that is often asked of cyber ranges is how do they relate to other categories such as breach and attack simulation? Um, and our perspective is that um, breach and attack simulation vendors like Attack IQ, who I believe is up next, fully complement uh, the use of cyber ranges in providing an ability to evaluate defense in depth. Um, in a cyber range, uh, sorry, in, in a, a breach and attack simulation based in production, you're able to test out um, and identify readiness gaps, see what would happen in a breach with your production systems, um, and uh, further explore um, what would happen in a uh, real situation um, against zero-day attacks. Um, whereas in a cyber range, you're much better able to validate your uh, cyber readiness proactively in all these kinds of what-if situations, optimizing your security stack, um, pressure testing processes. Um, one of our uh, great examples uh, is we helped a customer who had multiple security operation centers run a multi-day event where they were actually able to explore the shift changes that uh, were occurring and how well those transfers of cyber incidents moved between shifts, between locations. Cyber engines can help you explore really deeply um, the processes part of your operation. Um, and therefore can give your uh, cyber operators greater mastery over their techniques and tools and the state of cyber knowledge and more confidence in their abilities. Um, and then as mentioned, help you test out changes to your environment. Um, together though, um, you can really great, get this great balance of theory and practice, testing out hypotheticals in your cyber range and then uh, to make sure that they're safe, effective, to accomplish the business and security goals that you have and then deploy them in, uh, into production and make sure that they deployed properly using a breach and simulation tool. Together creating this test deploy validate process that can really improve your defense in depth. A great example of how this all came together, um, particularly in the cyber range side, um, is in the recent Log4j vulnerability. 
using a cyber range, uh, customers could be able to identify that vulnerability exposure very quickly before they even start making any changes or investigation of production. Um, you can easily and uh, without any harm scan your cyber range that you've built to look like your production and see where those vulnerabilities might live. Furthermore, you can use the uh, technologies that you might be putting into place to help you identify those vulnerabilities and make sure that they're effective and safe for your production in the cyber range before you deploy them to production and thus not cause any additional disruption to your production environment while you're trying to address this new uh, significant threat. Um, as mentioned, you can help you patch more quickly by testing out uh, the patches. This was uh, critical when it came to Log4j as some of the early patches that addressed the initial vulnerabilities that Log4j um, or Log4Shell uh, recognized, um, but introduced new ones, uh, a DDoS vulnerability. That's something that you could investigate, test, and make sure that it is safe and effective in a range before you roll it out to production. One of the amazing things that a cyber range can do is actually give you a chance to look back at what could have happened had you not made changes that you already made to your environment. Um, before getting into cybersecurity, I got my start in the um, uh, more customer-oriented uh, segment of travel at TripAdvisor. I work on revenue optimization. And we kept a small portion of traffic without any of our improvements to see how much the changes we're making to the website improved our revenue. Now, it's very difficult to get that kind of validation in cybersecurity. But with a cyber range, after a major vulnerability disclosure, such as with Log4j, you could spin up an old version of your cyber range that otherwise is spun down, not consuming any resources, but then check if I hadn't made the improvements uh, to my environment, if I hadn't made the investments in new tools or policies, what would have happened? And really demonstrate to your leadership team or your board the value of these steps that you're already taking to improve your cybersecurity. At the same time, uh, with a, a cyber range, you're able to really train your cyber operators on the latest in changes to the cyber industry. Uh, within a very short time frame after the disclosure of Log4j, we introduced uh, training modules both oriented towards red teams and blue teams into our platform and produced a webinar on the subject in order to give hands-on experience to operators in understanding both how an exploit of the Log4j vulnerability would work as well as what are the tools um, to, uh, that are available in the market to help mitigate or address that. And then uh, very relevantly for thinking about defense in depth, um, you can use a cyber range to understand how the different layers of your security stack can mitigate or protect against these kinds of vulnerabilities. Just because you have a vulnerability like uh, with Log4j doesn't mean that your security controls won't stop it at other layers of your defense in depth, either detecting it or preventing uh, any exploitation of that. And that's something that you can really explore or even tune proactively um, in a cyber range. So if you're interested in learning more uh, specifically about how cyber ranges tie in to Log4j or just more curious about how Log4j works itself, uh, we have a um, webinar available uh, on our website on demand. Uh, you can just uh, watch it at your convenience. Um, or if you're curious about how cyber ranges work and how uh, SimSpace can help you uh, develop a broader cyber risk management practice, um, feel free to go to our website uh, and check out uh, a demo. Uh, and so with that, uh, I really appreciate your time today um, and uh, happy to answer any questions. Absolutely. Yeah, great presentation. This is really cool what you all are doing there at SimSpace, the, this idea of cyber ranges. We've got a lot of good questions coming in as well. Uh, while we take those questions, I'm just going to bring up this poll for everyone out there. We want to get your feedback. What additional information would you like about SimSpace? And so let's see, first question, uh, we'll just start with David is, um, this one here, they're asking, you know, they say, I have a small cybersecurity team. Cyber ranges seem like something maybe for Fortune 500s or, you know, the, the military. Is it possible for me to take advantage of cyber ranges with my team's scale and budget? It's a great question and, and one that we get often. Um, while our uh, initial customers were often Fortune uh, 10 banks and, and the U.S. government, um, 
cyber ranges are available to organizations of any size. Um, we support customers where we have small ranges that are tailored for their needs that are in the scale of uh, 10, 20 virtual machines uh, that really represent uh, the needs of their environment and can be up and running uh, for the specific duration that they need up through to over uh, 1,000 node uh, ranges. It really can be scaled to the needs of your organization. No longer is the exclusive provenance of very large uh, companies or, or government agencies. Um, so, uh, yes, this is absolutely something that uh, organizations of any size can take advantage of. Very nice. And here's a good question from Rob. He's asking, uh, what would it take to stand up a, a cyber range? What does it take to get started with this? Fantastic. Well, thanks, Rob, for the question. Uh, so to get started, um, well, obviously, you're signing up for uh, SimSpace, so we can get you uh, going really quickly with an account. Uh, we support both on-premise, um, we have our own appliances, but we also have our, our cloud setup, so you can be up and running incredibly quickly. Once you get access to an account, um, setting up a cyber range is really dependent on the needs of uh, your organization. We have pre-built cyber range templates that uh, are based on significant research into industry-specific common architectures in the financial sector, in manufacturing, and, and more. That mean that you can start exploring how your security would work in a cyber range, you're training your team, testing security tools in effectively minutes if you spin up one of those default ranges. Those ranges can be also uh, tuned based on the needs of your security stack, your IT stack, um, making sim simple changes that, again, make it easy to get those up and running in a short period of time. And then, of course, you can fully customize your, your range using our uh, range creation interface uh, to make it as high fidelity as you would like. Um, so we uh, have options that suit your need from I need to get up and running today uh, up through to I want this to be like almost machine for machine, a replica of my environment, um, and want it to be as high fidelity as possible. Excellent. And then there's a couple questions out here. Uh, let's see, Namal and James are asking, you know, what can be added to the cyber range? Uh, they're asking about, you know, could it be part of a deployment pipeline? Could we add uh, SCADA um, or virtual PLCs? What, what types of things could be added to the pipeline? Fantastic question. So um, our cyber range uh, setups support pretty much any kind of uh, endpoints and network uh, capabilities. We have a vast library of virtual machines that uh, represent the most commonly used technologies out in the market, from the underlying operating systems uh, to uh, the types of security tools you might have running on top of them. Um, furthermore, uh, we have representation of cloud attack surfaces, um, OT uh, or, or ICS attack surfaces, um, and you, if you don't find something that you uh, are looking for in it, well, both we can work with you to get that um, added. But our cyber ranges can even connect to physical equipment if there's a very unique piece of um, equipment for your industry um, that we don't have off the bat. So um, the way that we've designed our ranges, the possibilities are effectively limitless, and most common options are already built uh, into our um, a library uh, and our partner ecosystem uh, to get uh, customers up and running quickly. Nice, nice. I like that flexibility. Uh, Stanley's asking, how easy is this to scale up or down? Yeah, so the nice thing is that um, these ranges can be designed and then um, initiated or um, put on, on hold, spun down um, as needed, uh, depending on what your organization uh, has as their needs. Um, many of our customers have ranges that are running on an ongoing basis that they use not only for training their team, but also for exploring and offer, um, uh, optimizing their security stack. Um, but some we have spun up just for a short period of time for a large-scale uh, cyber event, like a Red Bead Blue exercise um, or a Capture the Flag exercise. Um, it really uh, can adjust um, depending on your, your needs. Um, the, the fundamental technology is set up so that uh, it does not take particularly long to spin up a, a range, um, and uh, we license based on the uh, number of virtual machines that you need, so you can tailor um, what you're paying for to uh, the different use cases that you're trying to address. 
Very nice. Very nice. All right. Well, David, I'm afraid we're running out of time here in our live Q&A session. There's a ton more excellent questions for you there in the electronic queue. If folks want to get started right. here with, with SimSpace, what should they do? So feel free to come to our website. You can sign up uh, for a demo or check out uh, more videos and information as well as that Log4j webinar. Um, and uh, we'll be happy to set you up to uh, learn more about our offering and, and get you started. Uh, thank you all for the great questions. I'll try to answer some more that were sent in the chat uh, offline. Have a great rest of your day. Thanks, David, and thank you to SimSpace for joining us on the event today. Uh, also, check out the Handouts tab. It's there that you'll find a link to simspace.com where you can find additional resources and, and sign up for a number of the things that David mentioned in his presentation there. So I'll leave up the poll question, poll question while I announce our next prize winner. We have another Amazon $500 or $300 gift card, sorry, going to Dan Kruger from Illinois. Congratulations to Dan Kruger from Illinois. And then our next set of three grand prizes for the Bose QC45 wireless headphones. These are going out to Braden Legg from Washington, Maxwell Struve from Wisconsin, and Josh Weathers from Michigan. Congratulations to all the prize winners. All right, so with that, it's now time for another chat here with our security expert, Mr. Ian Thornton Trump. Okay, we're back with Ian. Um, in this next segment, we're going to talk about the international environment. So in recent years, state actors responding to or creating geopolitical tensions have, have had a knock-on effect that's caused IT security problems for businesses worldwide. I'm thinking of things like Stuxnet, you know, going way back, or WannaCry, Blue Leaks, the Sony hack. As you look around, are there geopolitical tensions that could have implica implications for everybody else in 2022? Yeah, definitely. I mean, I think we can all say that um, Russia and the Ukraine, NATO, the G7, and the EU all have major geopolitical concerns. There's proxy states that are very much aligned to Russia, but there are also a lot of uncomfortable um, feelings towards Russia um, in the Baltics. Now, one of the problems that we have with cyber weapons is they can go global very, very quickly, as we saw with some of the examples that you talked about. Um, I think that um, nation states right now are really um, playing a very careful game, but mistakes can be made. You know, you can have, you know, your ships sailing around in the Black Sea, but, you know, as soon as somebody accidentally thinks somebody else made a threatening gesture, the next thing you know, there's, you know, a bunch of sinking ships. So, so I think we're on a bit of a hair's trigger with, with Russia and its relationship to the West. Um, some interesting progress, I think, has been made in law enforcement coordination across borders. Certainly, I've seen uh, America step up its, its game with the extradition of several Canadian bad actors, which I found quite, quite interesting. Uh, but also internationally, um, you're seeing Ukraine security forces step up um, and deal with the cyber criminal problems that, you know, that nation has been, uh, has been known for. So if you move across the globe, though, you see increased tensions, of course, with China over Taiwan and, and the, their human rights record and its relationship with Japan and other uh, South Asian and Asian countries. So I also see um, ch uh, China being um, aggressive in terms of cyber attacks there, but being careful uh, and limiting their, um, their role to cyber espionage against the military industrial complex and support companies uh, in the Western world. So, you know, espionage threat um, has been there for a long time, but I see renewed tensions, of course, always increasing um, that. And then finally, the other two global protagonists that we see in here a fair amount of, but have really faded in, in, I think, both their relevancy and their ability to flex their might. I'm talking about Iran. Uh, Iran has been significantly constrained uh, due to the, the sanctions, uh, COVID, and the fact that if they really um, become a regional protagonist 
both Saudi Arabia and Israel um, will have uh, a great um, a great opportunity to respond kinetically, and of course that would bring in uh, the United States along with other um, uh, state actors that would take the side of Saudi Arabia. So I think Iran also wants to get back to the negotiating table uh, to try and get the sanctions lifted. So I actually see them becoming a little less aggressive um, as time moves forward. And then North Korea is really interesting because North Korea has been really focused on amassing um, huge amounts of cryptocurrencies, mostly because they've been completely cut off from the global financial system. Uh, but also uh, their economy has been ravaged by COVID. But one of the interesting things that we saw very recently was an attempt at almost ending the, um, nor uh, the Korean War uh, on the peninsula uh, and reaching out uh, and subsequently being um, welcomed by South Korea to begin a dialogue about that. Um, you know, I think North Korea has endured a tremendous amount of uh, sanction pain, um, perhaps their, um, their attitudes are slowly uh, being changed as a result of the privation and, and uh, difficulties that regime is facing. Um, them launching a global cyber attack, I think would be a very unwise move, but they have been known to be rather bizarre um, in the past. So, you know, I think given the current climate though, um, North Korea needs uh, to sort of come out of the, the uh, freezer that they've been stuck into. But I think honestly, we're getting better at tracking down cyber criminals and holding them accountable. Um, and nation state actors are working, I think, and realize um, that there are certain buttons that if they did press, um, it could result in a real shooting war. Um, and I think that there is some uh, I would see some reluctance uh, for them to be uh, too provocative. Interesting. Yeah. So it, it sounds like there are, you know, definitely some things that, you know, that, that could have ramifications for businesses and organizations as, as these things spill over and, and other things that are a little bit hopeful. So thanks for that update, Ian. Appreciate it. You're welcome. All right. Excellent discussion there with Scott and Ian. We plan to have Ian back later here in the event. And with that, it's now my pleasure to introduce you to our next presenter on today's Enterprise Virtual Summit. Welcome, Ben Opal, Senior Director of Customer Solutions Engineering at Attack IQ. Hey, Ben, thanks for being, thanks for being on. Hey, good afternoon. Uh, thanks for the intro there. Um, very psyched to be back uh, speaking to the audience here. And just a, by way of a quick intro, yeah, my name is Ben. Uh, and you can see my title on the slide. It's long, I'm not gonna say it again. Uh, that's it. I, uh, my, my job, my team's job is to, over uh, Tech IQ, is to get folks uh, from implementation to value uh, as quickly as possible, uh, help people understand how to implement uh, what, what amounts to uh, your own internal red team uh, effectively. So that's what we do. That's what I do. Uh, at, you know, Tech IQ, we're a BAS platform, so let's just, you know, dispense with that and move on. Um, I come from a, you know, a pretty decent um, history of doing cyber ops uh, throughout DOD. I've uh, been doing it for about eight, nine years, <clears throat> touched just about anything you could touch in the field, intel, hunting, red teaming, blue teaming, uh, even a little bit of compliance, God help me. Uh, so that's, um, that's the perspective I'm coming from here. So just to lay that out. <clears throat> so without further ado, let me just get into the, the talk here. Birds aren't real. All right, you're and, and your defense in depth totally works as planned. Uh, reptilian overlords are uh, controlling us from the fifth dimension and other wild conspiracy theories. Um, I think you'll see the point of this here in a minute, but you know, we're talking about defense in depth um, and it is all about <clears throat> setting up your architecture so you can make good assumptions about what's going on and what's being, you know, what's actually protected, what you're detecting, what you're missing, things like that, you know, having those layers of defense in place so that they are actually working together, uh, you know, kind of this mutual defense setup. Um, the problem is that we don't make uh, good assumptions when we don't validate assumptions, if you catch my drift. So it's a, it is something of a, um, it's a bit out there to say that it's all, it's all going according to plan, uh, unless you're doing some, a couple of specific things. Now, those specific things 
are what you see here, all right? Sound design and sound testing. <clears throat> and I'll talk about why I want to believe uh, before we start off with that. But uh, what I really, the point I wanna make here is that unless you're starting from sound principles of design and defense in depth, um, and you're following through with a continuous testing plan, however you wanna implement that, um, you are, uh, by all accounts, wearing a um, aluminum foil hat. We don't use tin foil anymore, but uh, you, can, you can see where I'm going here. So let's move forward. I do want to believe that everything that I've done in my life, in my career, I should say, uh, to implement effective defenses and defenses in depth um, works. It works the way I planned it, uh, and all that work the team put in to make this thing happen was totally worth it. I do. I really do, but can we be honest with ourselves? This is exactly how we look, explaining how this breach shouldn't have happened because of all the work we put in, all right? Um, we, we tend to find ourselves in this situation where we're saying, well, we did this and we did this, and if, you know, and if this wasn't done, done correctly, then it must have been something we, we couldn't have possibly planned for that um, ended up making this happen, that let this breach occur. Yeah, yeah, I, I, <laughs> if I were to look at some of my whiteboards, um, over the past, you know, eight years, it probably would have looked like this, uh, trying to figure out where it went wrong and explain how it wasn't our fault. Uh, the truth is that it was our fault, right? When these things do happen, it's, it's on the security team. Um, and we, what we have to be able to demonstrate is that we did the diligence on not only designing it properly, but testing it to make sure that our assumptions we made during design uh, are valid. So let's move forward here and talk about those principles of sound design. So... I drew these from an old manual uh, from my time in the military uh, a long time ago. I've been basing my design of defenses on these for a long time now. Uh, now, the one that I pulled out is a bias for offensive action, which has its place here in cyber, but not necessarily those of us working in the civilian world. So we're going to work with these four. The first principle to have a, of a sound defense or defense in depth, because all uh, defense, by the way, is not sound unless it is in depth. Let's just get that off our chest right now and accept it as true. And if you want to come at me, by all means, do so. Um, preparation, concentration, and flexibility of that defense. Okay. Now, when I talk about preparation of the defense, I'm talking about planning properly. I'm talking about resourcing it with everything that the plan says it means and wargaming it on a tabletop to say, does it make sense? Okay, so we plan, we say, this is the defense we need, and it's based on these first principles of defending our mission. We resource it to say, we need at least this many people to do it, with the caveat that we might not know exactly what it needs until it's fully implemented. And we're getting made by saying, okay, let's throw some general cases at it to say, does this stand up to basic scrutiny? Okay, now, concentration. Now, this is the idea that the defense has to be designed such that we are concentrating our capabilities at the most critical places. Uh, you know, let's say places, you know, logical places in our case, working in cyber. But you'll see more about this in the next one, okay? Now, a, con a properly concentrated defense is purpose-built to protect the mission. Right? That, that, that is the first step in allowing us to place capabilities and focus analysis where it needs to be to protect those assets and those, cap those capabilities and those mission elements that are most important to us. Now, a properly concentrated defense is implemented systematically. This is something that we, you know, this, fall this follows from being purpose built. Okay, I say systematically because we are first spending effort and time to do the good work and get things properly configured where it counts the most. Now, we are configuring these things with the terrain in mind. I'll talk more about the terrain here on the next slide. But terrain is the actual network architecture. It is the, all those means up and down whatever model of the stack you want to use that an adversary can use to move about the network and get at our goodies. We have to be designing these things with that in mind, more to follow. And, you know, specifically on that, we're talking about critical paths and assets, always having those in mind, the assets that matter and the paths to and from them. The flexibility, well, what we're talking about here are making ourselves able to respond to whatever happens within this wonderful plan of ours. And I mean, we need to have multi-capable teams. We shouldn't be locking people into excessively specific work roles unless you have the actual manpower to do that. Now, I mean, what I, what I mean is I say that everybody should be able to speak and speak on and understand 
what their role is within the security architecture capabilities processes and teams okay that's the cross-functional communications piece <clears throat> you cannot react with any kind of speed unless everybody has an understanding of what a something happening means to them we need to be using open platforms so that we can actually change the functionality or tweak the functionality of what we are, of what we buy and implement and spend all these resources on at a, at a moment's notice we need we need to have the ability to use these you know quote unquote weapon systems to take on any kind of adversary that comes at us and we may not have it set up to deal with the latest one when it shows up so we need to be using open platforms and i'm going to go ahead and say that we shouldn't be vendor locking because that is a way to change your perspective on what a capability can do and not in a good way Right, you're making every assumption about your capability, your defensive architecture, and your defense in depth based off of the competencies and capabilities of one organization. Uh, you have to, you know, competition for your, for your headspace is actually a good thing so long as you keep it under control. And with that, let's go and talk about <clears throat> that terrain thing that I keep talking about. All right, the proper use of terrain, second principle of the sound defense. We need to be placing sensors with intent. Now, this falls out of a few things and connects to a few other things, and they're all here on the slide handily. When I say placing sensors with intent, it's to say that I am putting this here, and I am configuring it as such so that I can see these kinds of things. We're not simply putting them out to say, okay, well, we have a NIDS now, um, and the NIDS should go here. Well, yeah, obviously, the NIDS needs to go in certain places, but we're placing it and configuring it such that we can see the things that matter. Now, we should be correlating all of our all events in a graph mindset. And when I say that, I mean events do not occur in a vacuum. Um, alerts are not singular things. We don't simply see the EDR uh, quarantine and clean a file and say, oh, I guess we're done. No, not at all, not even close. There's actually a pretty good discussion going on at InfoSec Twitter right now about this very, this very topic, okay? Everything, is connect, everything you see is connected to something else. I want to talk about that, I mean alerts, uh, events, all right? We have to think about how an attack flow works, so that, that, that chain of behaviors or tactics that the adversary uses. And we have to understand where it touches our terrain and where it's likely directed. And everything connects to something else in that chain of the adversary's intent of taking our things, breaking our stuff, you know, you name it. Now, what we also have to do here is when we're looking, thinking in this graph mindset, we are assuming that there are restrictions in the terrain that we present to the adversary. And when I say this, I mean, we can design our networks in such a way that it is more difficult for an adversary to get around and do his thing or her thing. So we have to say that when we make our plans for defense and defense in depth and detections, that the restrictions we put in place are real, that the adversary is going to have to navigate around and through what we build. However, we also have to validate those assumptions uh, because there's the old saying about you know, what assuming does, it makes a you-know-what of you and me, right? So if you validate the assumption and actually test it, kind of poke around, see how, see how an, a simulated or emulated adversary can move around in there, you are validating the assumption. Down on the bottom, <clears throat> as we talk about and as we test and poke around in these terrain, this terrain we design, these restrictions we want to put in place, we want to think about how to make it hard, right? So we shouldn't simply be looking at hardening as a systems level thing, okay? We have to be looking at the actual avenues of approach, the vectors, the way that the adversary would have to move through the, the network to get to where he wants to go. So we harden that. We make it more difficult for them to actually laterally move to exfiltrate, you name it. Look at, look at this from, again, like I said, that graphical mindset and say, okay, how can I make it as difficult as possible for the adversary to take the one, two, three, or five routes he could take to get to my key data, my key assets? We have to take advantage of the strategic position we have in the network as a network owner and as, you know, the effectively the, um, the, the minor deity uh, that, you know, decides what this, this terrain looks like. Okay, and we have to, by the way, be very tied in with our infrastructure types to make sure that happens. But again, we have, this, we have the ability, the strategic positioning to decide where the mountains are, where the rivers are, where the valleys are, um, so that we can make good assumptions about where the adversary is going to try to do bad stuff. <clears throat> and by that, I mean we're suggesting paths to the adversary. It gives, gives us the ability to watch where they're likely to be. So this is proper use of terrain. Third principle of the sound defense, mutual support and defense in depth. So we're talking about correlating all events 
in time and logical space here with mutual mutual support because if you have if you have tools that are forwarding you information and logs and alerts from all across the various levels and areas and your defense in depth they're not doing you any good unless you're looking at how everything relates to each other right they are they are inherently mutually supporting if you're pulling all that data together and trying to make sense of it in that graph mindset that i talked about Going back to saying that nothing is happening in a vacuum, that's the assumption, that's the first assumption you make that allows you to say, okay, what does this, what does this network alert mean as it, you know, relates to this host alert at a very basic level? And so to do that, we are overlapping monitoring capabilities and data sources. When I say that you have, this is a conceptual overlap, I'm not saying you're drawing the same data from multiple data sources, but that can, that often ends up happening and we have to make a, we have to make a, make sure that we're considering that. However, it is all about understanding what's happening at different places at both the same time and at different times, because everything is look, all of your tools are looking all across, hopefully all across the architecture at any given time. So the, each one has a different perspective and we have to understand what that perspective means. So defense in depth, this whole thing we're talking about today, I'm not going to you know, get redundant with you here, but we're talking about redundant detection and response. We're talking about avoiding building a layer and your defense in depth to a single purpose. Um, because again, if that's the one thing that, if that's the one layer of your defense that does that thing, it's a bad deal, especially if you don't know the failure conditions of that layer and what it would mean, to, what it would mean if, you know, or what it looks like if that layer fails. So we can't have single points of failure. Finally, kind of my favorite surprise and knowledge of the enemy is absolutely key to designing a good defense. All right, surprise. We have to be doing things and changing what we do such that the adversary doesn't just, doesn't have, you know, just, he can't just face roll uh, his, key, his keyboard and, uh, and just kind of step through our architecture, right? Because a lot of, you know, for good reason, standards exist. And good, you know, organization builds a good baseline off of a standard. We have to not only go beyond the standard, but we have to stay very agile within that. So when I say that, there's a lot of, you know, talk about deceit, you know, deception and deceiving the adversary. It's actually a good idea because we're trying to slow them down and decide where they move. This is a way to do that. This is a way to use your strategic positioning as a network owner and design the terrain to your advantage. So we want to deceive him as to where his goals are. We want to, in the, by the, in the same vein, confuse rec reconnaissance attempts. We, there are ways, there are many ways to lock down and decide what can be seen from outside and inside your network. We have to consider how we reduce the amount of information that is available to the adversary when he's looking around to see what to do next. And my favorite piece here is to impart risk and not simply assume it. All right, now active defense is, a, is a, um, an issue of some contention uh, because you know legal and ethical and all those kind of things. Obviously do these things carefully and consider what it means for your business and get the right approvals. But you know, if, if you, if you an adversary gets burned because you have good defenses in place and you have some specific tools waiting to catch them and maybe call them out and do whatever it is, you're imparting risk and you're making them think twice about what they're doing. You're making them slow down and giving you, perhaps giving you the chance to find to, you know, a better chance to find them, right? Because we want to do one of two things here and that's either make them go so low and so slow that they have, that you have more time to look through logs and find anomalies or they have to go so fast and so dirty that it's easier for you to hear them. That's what we're talking about here. Now, and by the same token, we have to turn that around for surprise and practice good OPSEC. Uh, as much as I do love the open source community, I love all of the great stuff that people put out there in the InfoSec field for people to use and get better with. There are some things that don't need to get out there. Not everybody needs to know exactly how you're doing this, this job. Now, putting out tools, putting out suggestions, signatures, rules, stuff like that, these are great things and we should not stop doing them, but think about what you're releasing. Think about what you're making public. Now we look at knowledge of the enemy. This is Intel. This is just straight up Intel, doing good intelligence work. I'm talking about collecting, analyzing, and quickly acting on information, which means you have to have good processes and good people in place to do this. All right, now the only way this actually works, Intel, by the way, I'm talking about, is if you are continuously evolving what's called your threat profile. All right, and these are, the, these are the threats of relevance to you and your mission, everyone who's interested in you or your mission, and all of their behaviors and TTPs 
uh, that they would or could employ against you, right? That is a threat profile and it has to be continually evolving. Otherwise you are, we are already, you know, five steps behind the adversary. We're trying to get one step ahead. Now, what falls right out of that you see there is that when you build the defense, this seems obvious, but I'm going to say it anyways, it's based off of the adversary capabilities and habits, right? The things that are relevant to your mission, the things that are most, uh, most critical to you, the most dangerous to you, you have to look at those first. That is what your defenses are based on, knowledge of the enemy. So we've talked through what we've got to do to actually have a good design on paper for your defenses. Now let's see what you do about it, right? Because simply because we've installed it and it looks great, well, it doesn't mean it works. That's the whole point of the talk. You know, we don't want to fall victim to this, uh, this wild conspiracy theory that, oh, we totally did it right. And if something goes wrong, it was definitely out of our control. And that's the necessity of sound testing here. You might think you're invisible and you might have the sweet black trench coat, um, but <laughs> he saw you. I mean it, they really did. Um, now you saw from above, um, there is a lot going on here. All right. It's a complex thing to do is, you know, that that proper defense in depth. It takes a lot of time and expertise to do it right. Um, and we all have to work with the assumption that it, we may have built a house of cards um, and it could fall at any time. But would we rather simply turn on the fan in our room and see if that breeze blows it over or let someone else come and burn down our house? I mean, but I think that's a pretty easy question. So why don't we like what, let's talk about turning on this fan, see if it blows over this, you know, maybe house of cards. And there's a lot going on here. The, complex, the complexity involved in security operations is, is the stuff of legends compared, you know, if you would have thrown this at somebody at an infosec professional 10 years ago, they, they would look at you like you're an idiot because they have no idea what you're talking about. So all of these capabilities are going to have to work together. EDR, NDR, SIM, DLP, EAMSG, you name it. Okay, and each one has individual considerations for using it properly and not giving you false positives or false negatives. There is a SDLC associated with a lot of these things. If you're a build shop, or even if you're not a build shop and you wanna make sure that things are working according to your specific needs, there is a ton that has to be considered here. I, and I, have, I didn't even say change management, all right? So it's not an easy thing to do. If I implied that, then I'd misspoke. That said, there, is, there, there are ways to abstract complexity out of this process. What I like to do, the, do here is consider this to be a systems engineering problem. Now, what you're looking at is just a, it, it is a concept for the design, implementation, and validation of a system, just any system. All right, and I this picture of an airplane cockpit there because it is a vastly complex system. Um, I mean, I don't sleep on aeronautical engineers uh, who have to figure out how to make all this stuff work together. But this is one of the processes that engineers use to make sure that a complex system is properly designed and validated. Now, what you're seeing at every level of this thing is this idea that you, there is a level of abstraction at each line in that V. All right, the, the, the engineering management plan is not itself concerned specifically with implementation there at the bottom. It's more concerned with delineating a concept of operations for how the system's going to work and what it must do. Now, we're not talking about how it's going to work at a, at a super technical level. We're saying like, this, these are the things that it must do. We step down another level to say, the individual systems that will define, the subsystems that will define this system must do these things in order to fulfill the purpose of the system. And we go down further to say, all right, these are the actual components, physical or logical, that are going to make up the subsystems, and this is what they must do. When we step into implementation, we go over into this cycle of verification, of making sure each piece of this plan works. Now, we step up into component verification, be like, okay, did this tool I built or bought work? Okay, well, it works based off of what criteria? Okay, good. And we step up and say, when I connect this component into the subsystems that it works for, do the subsystems do what they are expected and planned to do? Same deal going all the way up to the system verification and validation and the maintenance. All right, so we have to do something very similar in InfoSec to, to properly install, you know, implement and manage a good defense in depth. And so what I suggest to, when, when I work with folks with these kinds of problems, what I suggest is to first abstract away complexity through what's called mission or mission and path analysis. And this is the idea of breaking down the mission or the requirements of your organization, the mission of the organization, like what it does, how it's profitable, profitable, what its legal requirements for existence are, whatever it may be, 
and how it fulfills them and breaking that down into the actual organizations, capabilities, people, and processes that enable that mission to happen. Because all of those things eventually rely on a piece of tech that we, the security people, are responsible for securing. Now, at the end of the day, we're responsible for securing the mission. But if you saw what I just did, I followed that flow in the systems engineering diagram from, the, you know, from that strategic requirement into the technical implementation. And we broke it down so that you can define paths from the technical implementation into the actual strategic requirement that it supports. That's how we prioritize and define the actual needs of our plan, of our defense in depth, all right? And once we've done that, we can, look at, we can look at the threats with good intel to define the attack flows that are of most relevance to us. When I say attack flows, you know, it's the chain of events of, a, of an adversary's actions on target. And we, we know what they look like, we can define their techniques, and we can look at our defensive architecture and start saying, because we understand the defensive architecture, and say, this should do this, this should stop this, this is where this should be seen. These are the correlation rules that will allow me to catch these kinds of things and actually have something, a concept to work with. Something, you know, this, this is our, our statement of what we can do, what we should do. This is what we're going to prove in the next phase. And that's where we test it as realistically as possible. Now, testing is a big deal here uh, because, again, whole point of the talk, um, if you're not proving to both, proving first to yourself that this thing works, how are you going to make claims that it should have worked to anybody else? Or we have to know what's going on because we have to know where to focus our efforts and what to fix after we test. So we find those known bads and we fix them. And then we go back and we test again to make sure, number one, that our fixes were good and that no other problems have arisen in the meantime. And that validation phase is continuous. Everyone knows configurations are tappings. And like I said earlier, the threats continue to evolve. We have to continue looking at our, going back to that abstraction and understanding how what we do supports the mission in the context of the adversaries that matter. How do you do this? A lot of ways to do it. My recommendation is that you learn the concepts. All right, there's a lot of information here, and I'm just going to suggest a 100% free, built by experts resource, Tech IQ Academy. You can all log on. You can do free training. This is not vendor training. This is concept training for the InfoSec community on things like the mission analysis that I talked about, on things like sound test design, like I just talked about. It's out there for free for you to use and understand these concepts so that you can employ proper testing and design. Highly recommend looking at this. Um, I wrote some of the courses. I think they're pretty good. Um, that, that's up to you to decide. Just some of the courseware we have. I'm not going to belabor it. Academy.attackiq.com, 100% free. And with that, I'm going to stop talking and let someone else say something. <laughs> great presentation. Really enjoyed that, Ben. Thank you so much. Uh, we do have some great questions rolling in from the audience. And while we take those, I'm just going to bring up this poll for everyone out there that says, what additional information would you like about the Attack IQ solution? So let's see. First question, I'll just start with this one. And uh, let's see, Ben, they're asking, what does this really look like in practice, what you've laid out for us here? So in practice, it looks like, you know, at the end of the day, if you've done all this stuff, this looks like a, an evolving set of what we're call, we call emulation plans. It is a line-by-line -line description of everything an adversary would do, you know, in rough order, because we know adversaries like to jump back and forth between minor tactics, um, that is listed by technique, by defensive capability that should catch that technique, uh, with you, know, you talking through what the expected result of that execution would be. If the adversary were to do this, do you think your tool would catch it? So line by line, it's an emulation plan so that you can look at what an entire attack flow and decide whether or not you're properly prepared for it. Now, that plan falls out of all of the analysis that I, taught, that I mentioned throughout the, uh, throughout the talk. All right? it ta it, it's the fallout of mission analysis, threat profiling, and you know, converting actual adversary courses of action into testable TTP chains. So, and obviously in practice, you're, you're, you're running these tests, right? You are emulating adversary activity against, your, against yourself using a red team, using something like Attack IQ. This is, this is the idea here. Got it, okay. 
Nice. And then here's another question they want to know. Um, how often do you test a defense in depth? What's your advice there? Um, always. Yes. I mean, um, <laughs> testing is, that's the thing. I mean, technology has advanced to the point where we don't have to wait for annual red teams to do this thing. Um, we should be testing these things daily. Um, you may not test the whole thing daily. You might run through components and test them, uh, you know, when everything gets, everything gets touched once a month or maybe everything gets touched once a week. However, um, every piece of the architecture has to be subject to testing at least, uh, I mean, I, I'm making de declarative statements here, but, you know, at least once a month. All right? we, are not, we are not doing this, this yearly compliance-based, um, we, we know, gotcha red teaming anymore. Um, so you've got to be running at this at a on a daily basis whenever you have the capacity to do so. Got it. Okay. And then another question here, they're asking, um, any advice, you know, when you, when you take this to the business leaders, the executives, uh, and talk about another uh, security solution, what can, I, what can they use for justification for that? And, and what makes Attack IQ really stand out? If you want to understand not only whether or not you are reasonably protected against something, but also building you know, if, 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 so hold on, let me take this back. If you're taking this to a business leader, it's a matter of defining return on their investment. Um, have they actually, pro have they properly not only purchased, um, have they properly trained and hired, I'm sorry, pro properly hired and trained for the information security team to do their jobs? This is, this is checking our own homework before we turn it in. Um, that's really the value here is understanding like, from an operational perspective that we understand our threats and we are protected against them and being able to make definitive statements about, yes, we are protected against this specific threat, this set of threats, because we, because we, we know we tested it. And so it's also about saying that, Hey, we've made the right investments or we've made the wrong investments and we need to pivot specifically, you know, around our NIDs because it doesn't seem to be doing what it should be doing. Um, and we haven't trained people properly to use it, you know, and there, we just don't have enough people who do snort and or things like that. These, it elucidates a ton of detailed information about how your program is performing, and business leaders want to know that. Absolutely, yeah, they're they're all about metrics, and I like that analogy there of, of checking your own homework before you turn it in. I keep telling my son to do that as well. So. Huh. Um, I'm afraid we're running out of time here in our live Q&A session, Ben, but there's still a lot more uh, excellent questions for you in the electronic queue. Maybe you can get back to some of those folks uh, as well Certainly. electronically. But uh, we really appreciate you being on the virtual summit today. Great presentation. Thank you so much for your time. And thank you to Attack IQ for joining us on the event today. Right there in the handouts tab, you'll find a link to attackiq.com, real-time cybersecurity readiness, and you can sign up for the Attack IQ University as well, as Ben uh, pointed out. So make sure that you check out that resource, uh, Attack IQ Academy, uh, free cybersecurity training, academy.attackiq.com, the worldwide online community of informed defenders. So make sure that you check that one, that one out. All right. If you haven't answered the poll, now is the time to do it because I'm handing it over to Mr. Scott Becker of Actual Tech Media to announce our prize winner. Thanks, David. Yep, lots of great information so far today, and we've got lots more coming up. Um, and uh, as, as you said, it's time for our next prize drawing. So the winner of our $300 Amazon gift card, the next one, is Ray Chopra from California. So congratulations to Ray. We'll be in touch about claiming your prize. And uh, I'm just going to leave that poll up there for another couple of seconds. Uh, we do really appreciate all your answers on these poll questions. Let's move on to our next presentation in the Defense in Depth Virtual Summit. Our next session comes from Duo Security. And presenting for Duo is Wolfgang Gorlick. Wolfgang, welcome. Thanks for being here. Hey, thanks for having me. It's great to be on. Yeah, so, take yeah, it away. Today, what we're looking at is, um, you know, within the realm of defense and death, right? Let's look at defense and death for for new work. Uh, as we all undoubtedly know, having spent most of our times behind screens as of late, a lot of things have, have shifted. And I've been having a lot of conversations with uh, CISOs and directors about how to 
really preserve defense in depth, how to build layers of defenses when so much of our fundamental assumptions have changed. And so that's what we're going to look at today. What, uh, what are some of the strategic objectives around moving forward? Um, how can we assess our technology? Uh, and I also want to pull some insights from the, the recent security outcomes report on strategy planning and, and uh, resilience. And so with that, let's, uh, let's dig right into it. I mean, obviously, we've just completed, arguably, the largest migration within our lifetimes, and uh, in the first migration to go from physical to virtual. And whenever there's changes, whenever we're doing these changes, there's a pretty predictable model, right? I mean, at first we want to resist the change. Well, I'm sure it's only going to be a couple of weeks. I'm sure we only need to do something temporary. Uh, I'm not ready to change. And then once we shift in, it's all right, how do I recreate all the services I'm used to? How do I recreate the same experience? How do I recreate, um, you know, as much as possible feature parity, uh, the tech stack, the work environment, the, uh, the sense of community that was in the office? And then we really start to move into what I think is the exciting things, which is, wait a minute, do we really need to recreate exactly what we are doing? How can we refactor this? How can we reconsider the ways that we're delivering services? How can we reimagine um, what's possible? And when we get to those next st stages, which is really where we are uh, today, we begin to deliver services and deliver things in a way that was completely uh, unthinkable <laughs> at the beginning of the change. And of course, at the end of all that, then we want to resist anything from changing at all because now we just spent so much time building it. So along that path, there's of course a lot of tech debt. Uh, I would uh, add one note uh, to this model that was pointed out to me recently, which is we also have some times of regressing, right? Oh, well, now that we've done all this, maybe we'll just send everyone back to the building. Well, we've done all this. Maybe we'll just go back to the way it was uh, before the change. And, of course, that can create some problems as well. You know, recent studies show that 80% of the workers don't want to go back to the office full time. So it's, it's unlikely we want to pay too much time and attention to that regression. I think it's really imperative that we keep the gains that we've made with refactoring and imagining work and, and look towards going forward, not going back. Of course, easier said than done, especially with tech debt. So let's tackle tech debt first, uh, especially when we think about that recreating. Uh, I hail from uh, Michigan. I hail from Detroit, the Motor City. And one of the things I oftentimes think about in the beginning of these types of changes is what happened when the factory system went from being, uh, you know, steam-driven, right? Belt-driven. There's belts everywhere to being electric. Well, what happened was they basically moved out the big steam motors. You can kind of see the cracks in the concrete here. This is uh, one photo of what that looked like. They moved out those big steam motors, and they put in place electric motors to change things, uh, and then kept all the belts and kept everything else, right? They didn't do anything else. They just upgraded that motor. It's a really classic step in recreating. But when we think about reframing and we think about uh, refactoring, we really need to think about what it means to have people from all over the world. What does that allow us to do that we couldn't do before? And at the same time, how are we going to move some of that legacy tech forward? There's several properties of tech debt, right? We know it slows or stops uh, innovation. Uh, we know for a fact that adversaries monetize tech debt. I think ransomware is probably the most clearest example of that. And then, you know, the faster we move, the faster we change things, the more we drive up technical debt. Now, I bring this up for a couple reasons. One, obviously because we still need to provide access and resources to things that are on net, to things that require traditional uh, connections, VPNs, or what have you. We still need to figure out ways to, to segment those environments, maintain those environments over a longer period of time, uh, provide consistent access to our users to those environments. But we also, of course, need to start thinking about what happened with the tech debt that we accrued with this change. There's a couple different strategies for that. Some folks have been really good at updating the risk register and tracking tech debt as they, you know, put in place things to, to move us forward. But there are a lot of things, a lot of heroics that have been performed uh, in the past, you know, 12 to 18 months that do need to be on the radar 
for, for resolving. It also is interesting in that it allows us to have a little bit of a fresh perspective, right? We, we can see tech debt with some fresh eyes. Uh, one of the design ways of thinking about this is those stickers on apples. This actually comes from a TED Talk. It is stickers on apples, right? You never think about them. But the first time you had to peel that off, it was really annoying. <laughs> the second and third time where you're washing the apple and scrubbing it off, really frustrating. By the thousandth time, you just do it and you're used to it. And it's that beginner's mind, that new mind, that really allows us to see some of the problems in the way technology has been designed. So it's beginner mind and new mind that we really are fortunate to have right now uh, as we can look with fresh eyes as to how technology is being developed. So some of the use cases that we start seeing evolve and, and work in this environment, of course, is how we're going to handle managed devices, on-prem or off-prem. Are we allowing them to connect directly to SaaS, or are we having them, you know, uh, boomerang back in and off our network? What about guests? Do we even have guests anymore? Is this even thing we need to consider? And one of the emerging ways of doing this, of course, is to really consider the, the office as a coffee shop. If I can deliver Wi-Fi in my office space, if I can deliver coffee, uh, and I can make it available for the, the infrequent times when people want to, to get in. And if those services are the same, whether the person is in my office uh, drinking coffee or in a coffee shop or at home with, uh, with their own uh, French press coming straight off, uh, off the kitchen counter, if they have the same experience, we can really simplify how folks are, are getting their jobs done. All right, now from a, from a people perspective, it really is important that we think about the affordances that these new environments offer our people. How are they getting to their apps? What are they clicking on? Do we provide things through single sign-on? Do we have a common way of getting to the apps where they have to go to the VPN for this and over to that for that? And we've got three different single sign-on portals. And I've got a bookmark somewhere, and I think I've got a password manager that looks like right? <laughs> the simple we can make it, the better. Now, historically, um, Computing environments, of course, look like this. And when that first happened, when we first started standing up these computing environments, there was a thing called you know, computer sickness, right? And it was studied. It was studied uh, in the late 70s and early 80s. And the findings aren't going to surprise anyone on this call. There were things like eye strain. There were things like uh, wrist strain. It was back problems from having to sit uncomfortably and stare at things that weren't right. And over the years, of course, we've gotten much better, right? We've had a good revolution since the 1980s on human factors and economics. We don't blame a person for getting eye strain or back pain. We hopefully get them a better chair and a better monitor. <laughs> so similarly, with the shift to new work and with the shift to providing flexible options, we need to think through the human factors and the mental economics. Uh, how are they getting to these things? Are we making sure that we're attending to the mental health concerns, uh, dealing with any anxiety or grief that may still be going on, and really providing a good environment for them? Now, in part, this has to be driven by supporting our managers and, and training. So a lot of this isn't only um, provide better technology. I wish it was. <laughs> it's also provide better support to the people, uh, provide better uh, understanding of the corporate culture and, and access to those resources. But we also need to think about return to work and as people get back in, as effectively a moment to do onboarding, effectively a moment to reconnect to the corporate culture, um, to reconnect the people, to address these strains, also to, of course, refresh the technology and, uh, and address any risks that people may have picked up by working remote and working in this new environment. So we've got to look at addressing the human needs and doing so um, in a reliable way through management, through leadership, with ritual, and also doing so in a way that is backed by the technology and addresses and acknowledges the very real risk of people having laptops at home and people using whatever devices that nearest to them to get to things, right? To make sure that we are providing consistent controls, uh, but not frustrating the people as they're trying to do their jobs, especially at this point in time when things are already so frustrating. 
when we get to some of the reframing sides and some of the ways to think about it, you know, lots of benefits to consider. I'm sorry I keep trying to expand these and I click forward. <laughs> lots of benefits to consider, of course. There's uh, anecdotal information about increased productivity. Um, there's been a, a real boon for hiring. Um, also, you know, there's, there is less chance meetings, but a lot of organizations have done a really good job of keeping up those chance meetings internally. So, for example, at Duo, we've got, um, we've got coffee meetings, which people from all across the company are randomly paired with others and uh, for a half hour just to, to chat. No, no obligations, no like requirements like, hey, you must do this. <laughs> it's just an opportunity to get to know folks, and that's created and sparked a lot of the, the chance innovation that before was reliant on people walking the hallways. So think about ways that you can recreate some of those good benefits, but also leverage a lot of the strengths that are coming on uh, from doing work in the way we're doing it. All right, next thing I want to talk about is resiliency. So when we think about resiliency, there's a million and one definitions. This is one of those words that's becoming really overloaded. <laughs> so I'm going to be uh, very clear in a moment as how I'm defining it. But effectively, a, a lot of innovation is driven by the ability to trust the technology. Uh, if you're on an elevator, the next time you're on an elevator, uh, look down, see if it's an Otis elevator. If it is an Otis elevator, the thing you should know about Otis elevators is the namesake. Uh, of Otis Elevators, Elijah Otis, came to prominence, built the company, not because he has the fastest elevators, not because he had the strongest elevators, not because he had the greatest ways of closing the doors when that one person you don't really want to talk to is trying to run into the elevator. <laughs> no, it was, it was the break, the elevator break. He would put a structure, hoist himself up a couple of stories into the air, cut the rope, cut the elevator rope, fall, and the brake would save him. It was the brake that enabled the elevator, and it was the elevator that enabled the buildings, which, of course, were the last great migration before today with what we're going through post-pandemic. So when I think about resiliency in this space, I'm thinking about disaster recovery. I'm thinking about business continuity. I'm thinking about incident response. I'm thinking about good ITSM. I'm thinking about all those things in this space. And of course, resiliency is, makes a great deal of impact when there are huge shifts in how things need to get done, how technology is delivered, um, how our folks are, are cared for. And yet, a lot of people were caught a little bit flat-footed when all this happened with their BCDR plan. So I think it is important that in addition to refactoring and framing how work is being done, that we also spend some time to revisit our resiliency plans, both on a technical level and on the human level. Now, there's some side benefits that you can get out of this. You can find this information in the Securities Outcome Study, uh, which was put out by uh, Scientia and Cisco, um, that looked at multiple different outcomes uh, for security, enabling business, managing risk, all the things we want to do and looked at all the practices that people were doing and figure out, hey, what practices correlate with that what outcomes, right? If you're going to do something, what, what should you expect to get out of it? And if you want to get an outcome, what are some of the underlying practices? And one of the things that surprised us all, surprised us all when we looked at this data, was that resiliency, incident response, disaster recovery, was one of the top equated correlated practices within security. So. As we adapt and adopt technology to this new way of working, as we make it easier for people to, to come back to work and address their human needs, as well as make the security and technical environment um, human friendly and as least frustrating as possible, we also want to consider making sure that we're refreshing those BCDR plans and thinking about what else we can do with that resilience. And there's a number of different things that can be driven out of that. Again, this information is in the Security Outcomes Report. All right, defenses, defenses in depth, right? 
Uh, that is the topic du jour. And when we're layering on these defenses, one of the things that I think is, is interesting about defense and depth is if you're just layering on defenses without knowing how people are moving through the environment. And that is, of course, our, our employees, our partners, our customers, it's also our adversaries, how they're moving through the environment. It can be very difficult to know where to put the defenses and how to layer them in. So the first thing is, as we're moving through this change, I'd encourage us all to look at the paths that the workforce is now following through our organization. It's not the path that we had laid down concrete for. It's not where we put all our defenses. It's probably a, a different path. It's a different way of thinking about things. So look for that, as well as some of the new paths that adversaries are taking now that we've shifted the playing field and, and moved to this hybrid model. Take a look at mapping out those paths and use that as your measuring stick to lay down the defenses. From there, start to consider some of the new ways of doing things. You know, many, many years ago, I was a security officer responsible for a BlackBerry fleet. And I think BlackBerry is getting out of phones altogether. So that gives you an idea of how long this was. But we want to patch our BlackBerry fleet. We had to go to the help desk. We had to write our comms plan. We had to people bring in their Blackberries. We had to hope our asset inventory was up to date. Spoiler alert, it was never up to date. <laughs> we had to we had to make sure they brought them in. We had to send them around to do the update. And we knew that people weren't going to bring them in or were going to forget. So we had to have a multiple different stages. And any update would take, you know, three to six or not three to six months, but one to three months, right? Up, maybe up to 90 days. And of course, by then, new patches that were out, new holes were found. In today's environment, at Duo, when a, when a vulnerability was found on my iPhone, uh, I get an alert, hey, your iPhone is out of date. You can log in for a couple more times. If it's a critical vulnerability, I, I get told, hey, you, now's the time to update that phone. And there's no need to maintain that static inventory. There's no need to be concerned that we may miss someone because anyone who's accessing a resource from anywhere, from a coffee shop, coffee in our office, working from home, anyone who's accessing it is automatically prevented by policy from authenticating until they patch that vulnerability, which is really a radical shift in how we do things, right? It's, it's shifting that vulnerability window to practically zero. And it's shifting the work to being a partnership model with our, our users. Um, and again, it's a much more friendly user model than uh, what we used to do. So think about new ways to achieve some of these old goals. And also some of the new ways to uh, apply controls, especially if people don't come on board. How do you how do, you do identity proofing when you're onboarding them? How is your identity access governance program uh, provisioning that account? How are they getting set up with multi-factor? Is that a manual process? How are you shipping out devices, right? And when they leave the company, um, you know, the old model is, well, we'll escort them out. You're not sending a card to escort someone out of their house. I hope not. If you are, that's probably not a good work environment. But you see my point. We need to rethink the entire employee journey and partner with technology vendors that allow us to do all these steps from anywhere as easy as possible and take advantage of some of the new technologies and new ways of doing things as we reframe and refactor work. Obviously, it probably goes without saying that uh, <clears throat> I believe that the principle of least trust or you know, zero trust architecture is, is going to be a fundamental way of achieving this so that every connection on every authentication, on every request from everybody in the workforce that we're evaluating by policy whether or not we trust them. And if we don't, that we're giving them guidance on how to bring their devices back into policy, that we're giving them support uh, on how to connect up, and we're making it as human friendly as possible. All right, in conclusion, so as we, as we revisit some of the successes and failures from 2020 and 21, as we think about 2022, I really view this year as an optimization year, right? Finish cleaning up uh, any, any inadvertent messes that we may have made along the ways. Think about how we can work with uh, our partners, partners like Duo, to use modern technologies, 
human-friendly technologies, technologies that frustrate the attacker, not the user, and support this brand new future, um, which hopefully will come with a jet. I would like a jet. <laughs> I don't know if I've got my flying cars, but at least I, uh, at least we got what we got in terms of uh, moving forward. So I love this quote, the future of work arrives ahead of schedule. And that is exactly where it feels like we are today. We have went through many of the predictable stages of innovation. We had some resistance. We recreated things. We refactored things. We're moving into a period where we need to reimagine work, and we need to, I feel, double down and be leery about not regressing into old ways of working, which, frankly, if you think back to uh, the breaches, uh, you think back to a lot of the problems we had in the 2010s, this is really not, not where we want to go. It wasn't a golden time. We've got this great opportunity to really rethink how we apply technology, driving down technical debt, improving the workforce uh, culture, and really moving towards resiliency. With that, um, I will open it to any questions. All right, Wolfgang, great. Uh, really good presentation. Um, I do want to put up the the poll question to, to see if, uh, you know, what additional information people would like. Um, from uh, from Duo, but you know, and I, I just have to say, uh, you know, I don't think people talk about resist and regress and, and tech debt enough. So I appreciate that. Um, so when you say refactor and reimagine, um, what types of things are, are CISOs finding possible now that wasn't before? I think the the control over devices has gotten much better. Uh, in the past, MDM or in the past, BYOD meant, oh, I've got an MDM agent, which is very expensive and cumbersome, but that means I need to identify, I need to unroll it, I need to do a number of things. So I think the ability to have visibility into all applications that are authentic, or I'm sorry, all devices that are authenticating, uh, and then wrap controls around that provides as much more of a spectrum of devices and a greater degree of control across that full spectrum. So that would be one. Uh, another one I think is we've gotten much better at uh, user self-service. So enrolling in multi-factor, um, getting a new device, uh, you know, reclaiming a device, uh, patching your things. Those types of things that you know in the past would be very manual and require a lot of technical support. Well, we've gotten much better at creating self-service and, and encouraging uh, a tech-savvy workforce. To, uh, to address a lot of these problems for us. Okay, great. Uh, Danielle says, great presentation. Uh, Greg says, Duo is awesome. Oh, it's always nice feedback. Rob is wondering <laughs> if, uh, if Cisco Secure integrates with uh, third-party security products and can it coordinate against traditional east-west attacks, or is it simply an aggregate reporting tool? Yeah, so uh, so Cisco Secure is the overall portfolio product. So each product, of course, is, is going to be a varying degree of answer about traditional east-west attacks. You know, today we're talking mostly about Duo, uh, which is is centered on trusted access for the workforce, so multi-factor, single sign-on, uh, direct access, um, those types of technologies. Uh, and certainly, Duo has a long history of integrating with a, a wide variety of, of third parties. I will say broadly, I think the reality is today that every organization, this was, this was me when I was a CISO, uh, every organization has a, a variety of vendors in our tech stack. And the good vendors, and this is certainly a design principle at Cisco, the good vendors recognize that, reach across the lines, and make sure that you can be sharing policy data and, and acting in aggregate. Uh, as opposed to, um, you know, trying to silo or force everyone onto one product or platform. Okay. Tremendous. Um, and, uh, you know, it, it looks like we're running out of time, but, but Wolfgang, if somebody wants to get started with, with Duo or, or find out more, uh, what do you recommend? Yeah, uh, at uh, Duo.com you can sign up for, for a trial or see some of our demos. And, uh, you know, some of the traditional things we've covered today, some of the other things that you'd see if you go on our website is 
uh, some of the emerging technologies like passwordless authentication, which we're pretty excited about. So certainly go to the website and uh, look for the signups and the, the trials and demos. Tremendous. Will do. Okay. Well, thanks for joining us, Wolfgang. Really appreciate it, and really appreciate the update on, on Duo. My pleasure. All right, and I will leave the poll question up there for uh, for just a minute while we go into our next prize drawing. And this is for another one of the $300 Amazon gift cards. The next gift card winner is Adesu Turi of Washington, D.C. And we have three winners of our next grand prize, which is the 34-inch LG monitors. And the winners there are Rob Retchel from Minnesota, Anthony Mingus from Oregon, and Sean Reeser of West Virginia. So congratulations uh, to Rob and Anthony and Sean and also to Adisu. And uh, we will uh, be moving on to our next presentation. Um, for those of you who, who answered the question, uh, the poll question here, thank you. Uh, we appreciate it. it. It's really helpful. And now it's time for that next presentation. And in, in this session comes from Rubric. And presenting for Rubric is Tracy Attor, uh, Inside Sales Engineer. So let's turn things over to Tracy. My name is Tracy Attor, and I am an Inside Sales Engineer for a mid-market segment here at Rubric. Thanks for having me again. Um, so today we will be discussing how your organization can use Rubric to develop and strengthen your 2022 security plan. First, let's lay down the problem that Rubrik is trying to solve. You know, we often see it in news headlines. Maybe it, it has impacted you directly, but, you know, ransomware is a real problem in this day and age. Um, no business, small or large, is immune to it. Cyber criminals don't care who they target. They only care about getting paid. Um, so how does ransomware go down exactly? You know, a number of ways. It could be through an exposed uh, security vulnerability and unpatched systems, or the end user takes the bait whether through a, an infected email attachment being opened up by an unsuspecting employee who missed the last security seminar and hasn't had their morning coffee yet. Uh, maybe you missed Microsoft Patch Tuesday the last two months, you know, clicking on a link where they think they want a free Xbox, um, things like that. But in any case, the way it works once the malware gets downloaded, which is usually a worm, it then runs a payload which locks the user system. It can then scan and traverse the network, spread copies of itself into any machine, including servers inside the data center, and lock down and encrypt all files, folders, mission critical applications, and databases, and even your backups that you thought were once immutable, which at that point would be really bad. You'll have no option but to pay that ransom, unfortunately. So where does Rubrik come in? So, you know, I like to say Rubrik is the med medicine for this ransomware problem. We are your go-to last line of defense for when your walls are not thick enough to keep this problem out. Um, as you can see to the left, a key challenge with ransomware attacks is that they target your backups, which you thought were safeguarded. Uh, if your backups get compromised, perhaps because they are using the same open protocols as your production storage systems, they may not be your last line of defense anymore. Um, another challenge is assessing the blast radius of an attack. What VMs and file sets were attacked? How would you know? Um, organizations are tempted to pay the bad guys because they just don't know what has been compromised. Um, yet another complication is protective set sensitive data. Um, too often IT teams don't know whether a ransomware attack compromised sensitive data like PII or data regulated by HIPAA. Um, and then lastly, even if you conclude that you are able to recover applications, how long will it take to restore? If the recovery process is slow, some may be inclined to uh, pay the bad guys. This could be touchy when IT teams can't you know, immediately pinpoint the last known clear copies of data from which applications can be uh, quickly recovered. The more downtime an organization has to incur means more lost revenue, time is money. So as you can see to the right, um, we do provide a logically air gap solution that contains an immutable file system built from scratch that cannot be infected by any type of ransomware through any discoverable file sharing protocols like NFS or SMB. And I'll get more into that in a second because I think it's really important to kind of explain really what um, all that means. But um, 
you know, all data backed up by rubric is encrypted in flight using TLS 1.2 encryption and encrypted at rest using AES 256 bit encryption. So criminals can lock down your production servers, your endpoints, your storage arrays. However, they will not be able to discover your backup sitting on our append only Atlas file system and encrypt your backups. We're just that secure. So speaking of distributed file system, Atlas, uh, which sits at the core of who we are and why we're genuinely immutable, our engineer seven years ago built this distributed file system entirely from scratch to ensure data is immune from any type of ransomware activity. And so there wouldn't be any single point of failure or, or, choke, or choke point. Um, the file system knows what application we're backing up and it's smart enough to identify where ransomware took place to allow you to roll back to the most recent snapshot within a chain. Um, all backup is stored in an append only state and it's logically air gap. So what that means is that while it is co a connected digital asset by means of logical processes, the Atlas file system where backups are written sits offline and remains not accessible through any standard network protocols like NFS or SMB. Um, only the network ports that are required for user interaction with the product and communication between different uh, internal processes are allowed. Meanwhile, all unused ports are otherwise disabled. And because data managed by rubric is never available in a read write state to the client, even if you know, infected data later did get ingested by rubric, it cannot infect other existing files or folders. It's just that secure. Um, we also complement that file system even further with additional security layers as well to you know, really drive home our zero trust story built on the principles of never trust, always verify. So whether it's def you know, to defend against an unauthorized bad actor or rogue admin, you will get the option from Rubrik to further enhance security by applying extra layers like multi-factor authentication, role-based access controls. So you could designate, you know, customizable permissions on the principle of least privilege access. Uh, there's also built-in time-based one-time passwords when logging in. Uh, so you could set that up and retention locked SLAs that prevents admins from expiring backups prematurely, requiring human intervention and rubric support verification to remove that feature in the first place. So no backup, even at the policy level, can be deleted or modified by any admin should that feature actually be turned on. Um, and then, of course, other layers also include you know, web session limits and timeouts where sessions will time out after 50 to 15 to 30 minutes of inactivity to align with corporate security requirements. And of course, uh, like I mentioned before, we provide end-to-end -end encryption, whether data is in flight or at rest. Um, so without further ado, I do want to jump in our UI real quick uh, to walk you through how we take backups. Um, I'll also touch on radar for a quick ransomware remediation. And then if there's enough time left, I will uh, talk a little bit about sonar as well. So um, I'm going to go ahead and switch screens real quick. So just bear with me. Here we go. So let's say I'm a backup admin. I log in. This is the first thing you're going to see, right? So I could see all my uh, objects that are under protection. They're protected by, you know, different SLA domains that I set. Um, you could see natively, we do support vSphere VMs, Hyper V VMs, Linux, Unix, Windows, physical host, NAS shares, uh, SQL uh, server databases, Oracle databases, and more. Um, but everything we do is really based on an SLA policy approach. Uh, we don't want you managing any backup jobs ever again. So this is how we uh, protect your backups moving forward should you uh, come over to Rubrik. So what that means really is, so if I go to SLA domains, I'll click on local domains. You could see here that I do have, you know, my SLA policies that were uh, previously set up. This is a demo lab, so we do have quite a few. Um, I don't expect any customer really to create any more than three to five. And to really dive into what an SLA policy is, this is where you define how often you want to take backups and how often you want to keep them. So here's what that looks like. I could say I want to take a snapshot every six hours. I need to keep that for seven days. I also need to get more granular. So I also need a snapshot every day. Maybe I need to keep that for 30 days. And then for those needing, you know, long-term retention, we allow you to set it up to where, you know, you need to take a yearly and you need to keep that for, say, seven years, for example. Um, so that's how you would create an SLA domain. Um, on the second side of this policy, it 
it will give you the option to choose where you want to archive data to. So if you don't want to land data, you know, on the brick longer than 30 days, we allow you to take advantage of the cost economics that come with the cloud. So we support Azure, AWS, GCP, Wasabi, um, anything S3 compliant. If you still have an on-prem requirement, we could, uh, you could, you know, archive to an NFS target. Um, maybe you guys still have a requirement to use tape. Uh, we support QLogic um, as our tape vendor. Um, so yeah, you have a number of options um, in terms of how you want to move that data and uh, take backups. Um, as well. So what we do really well, um, before I get into what radar is, I do want to show you kind of, you know, what we can do with those SLA policies from a workload standpoint. Um, so you could see going back to my catalog of uh, pre-made SLAs, you could see this one policy right here that, you know, is taking a snapshot every 12 hours, keeping local for 30 days. After 30 days, um, it says it's going to be archived to AWS. That's what they named it. Um, so if I hover over object count, that one SLA policy is protecting nine vSphere VMs, 17 Windows hosts, 83 SQL databases, one man in volume. I think you get the picture. Four NAS shares, 10 Linux physical hosts, and an Oracle database. That's a lot of workloads uh, that are very different from each other being protected by one SLA policy. And again, this is why I say, you will never be managing backups ever again. You create as few policies as possible. You apply them to your workloads, depending if they're mission critical. Maybe you want a separate policy for your NAS shares, who knows? We give you that flexibility, but the point is, we want you to protect them with as few poss possible uh, SLAs. So with that being said, when you're ready to restore you know, a virtual machine, maybe you need to look for a file. Um, I'll just use VMware as an example. That seems to be the, uh, the most popular uh, hypervisor that we back up. Um, so I'll go into my VM and I'll show you, you know, just this calendar view that's about to pop up. Every green dot that you see in the calendar view is a successful backup. In other words, a snapshot. Uh, so if I need to go back to, let's say the 26, here are my recovery options just for that VM. I could mount the virtual machine. we will create a second copy of that virtual machine. So I could do test dev on it. Um, it gets hosted directly on Rubrik's data store. It doesn't have any impact to your production environment or using production disk. Um, so you can use that um, and get really you know, creative with that use case because it literally is just a second copy of a VM that, uh, that has no networking attached to it. Um, but should you need to you know, push it into production, you could absolutely storage vMotion it over if needed once you're done doing what you need to do to it. Uh, but beyond that, we do support instant recover. Maybe you got a VM dead in the water. You need to instantly recover it from a clean point in time snapshot from your immutable backups, may I add. Uh, we allow you to do that. In-place recovery is supposed to uh, be the same thing. It's a new feature that came with our 6.0 release, um, except it uses less data transfer, I'm told, and more performance, and you don't have to storage vMotion it back into production. Um, and then, of course, we allow you to recover files. Uh, this is one of my favorite features um, because we have predictive search functionality so we could find files really quickly and we only ingest metadata which you know also gives way into why it's so quick so if i type in cool cat i could see i have you know this cool cat file here sitting in my c drive i could go ahead and select that it creates kind of like this shopping cart uh, if you will um, so if I also need to recover additional files with it, I can. It'll just add it to uh, what I like to call a shopping cart. Um, so you can recover files there. You could also um, come up here and type in that file name. And it will also uh, give you a list of options here. So cool cat, I have 46 versions here. I'll click on that. And here are all my options in terms of recovering files from all these different snapshots that I have available. Um, obviously I'll probably pick the latest version. I'll go ahead and show you what those options are. Download, restore, export, or select additional files. Again, shopping cart. Uh, if you need more than one file, you could absolutely uh, go ahead and look for that. Although we want to take the guesswork out of that. If you know the name of the file, we'll just allow you to search for it instead. So that is file level recovery. Um, if you ever need to do like a bulk recovery, we absolutely support that. 
Uh, mileage will vary, of course, depending on your bandwidth requirements, uh, things like that. But if you ever need to do a bulk recovery, whether that's a, a live mount where you're live mounting, you know, maybe 10 VMs, we allow you to do that. But instant recover, if I click next, I can now select, you know, all the VMs that I need to instantly recover um, back to my production environment from a clean point in time snapshot. So if I click next, I could do the latest snapshot, which is probably the, the one you're going to select, right? Or you could, you know, choose the uh, snapshot on a particular day and time. So I think that's pretty cool. Uh, but yeah, beyond that, I know we have a few minutes left. I do want to get into radar. Let me just hit the back button here because um, I was demoing it earlier. I'll just start at the dashboard. So radar, this is where really all our uh, ransomware remediation um, really lives, if you will. So all of the data that's being backed up here by the brick and rubric, um, all of that data, we collect it over into Polaris as well, which is delivered as software as a service. Um, and then we really, you know, we take those backups and then we really want to make them useful, right? So hence radar. Um, so right off the bat, say I'm a backup admin, I'm coming off a long weekend, I'm tired, it's Monday. But then I notice, you know, all right, I see all my SLAs are in compliance, okay, yada, yada. But what is going on with radar? This is, this is where we find all those anomalous events. I see three anomalous events. I probably wanna investigate that, right? So this is a demo lab, so I only have four VMs loaded. But I could see right off the bat that my environment is getting beaten up by ransomware. And so with Rubrik Radar, what we allow you to do is really drill down and investigate the blast radius so, and then also give you the option to recover from a clean point in time snapshot here. So if I want to start with the first one, uh, what it'll do is it'll give me an event timeline. But I'm freaking out as a backup admin. <laughs> um, I don't have you know, the time to really review that right now, but I want to investigate this snapshot and just kind of click through and see what happened, right? So what it's doing really is that, uh, so radar uses machine learning algorithms to understand normal baseline, you know, behavior between your backups, uh, specifically snapshots. So it took a snapshot at 8.11 a.m. this morning. Something happened between 8.11 and 2.11 p.m. snapshot it detected a high rate of change. And this is what radar is alerting me to. So now what I'm seeing is that, okay, something is definitely really wrong in my C drive in this particular VM. I have a flag that's calling it suspicious. I also see some activity here. There's been 3,500 deleted files, but 47 have been added. That is really weird. So let me go ahead and start drilling down and investigating this a little bit further. So right off the bat, I could see, okay, something weird is happening in my file shares, right? So I'm gonna go ahead and click in that. And this is where it really starts to get interesting. I have all my department folders here. I could see the engineering department's been hit all the way down to the sales department. Out of selfish reasons, you know, I'm in engineering, so I'm just gonna poke around in here. <laughs> um, and then really see what happened, right? So I could see that, you know, this file's been deleted, a PowerPoint, but look what's been added after it, a dot encrypted extension. So what I'm gonna do now is I, I need to pick and choose what you know perhaps is mission critical, what do I need now in order to continue business continuity. I need to get these files back, right? To, uh, to keep my job essentially. So everything that I'm selecting, oops, not that, everything that I'm selecting here, this one file, when I click next, these are my recovery options. I could download it in place, I could overwrite the original, or I could recover to a separate folder. And that's why we say at Rubrik, don't pay the ransom because not only are your backups are immutable, but Radar really provides you with you know, a great tool that helps you or guides you through the recovery process in itself. Um, if I wanna bypass this investigative part, because you know, obviously it took some you know, drilling down and whatnot, I could totally go all the way back to the beginning and say, screw it. Instead of investigating, I don't have any time to investigate. I obviously know something's really wrong here. I need to mass recover this entire drive. We allow you to do that too. So I'm gonna click next, same options, download in place, overwrite the original files with that clean point in time snapshot, continue you know, on with your day, or I can recover to a separate folder 
in which case, you know, a customer who's obviously still cleaning up machines, um, you know, scrubbing them with, or need to do any sort of forensics, they would normally uh, select that option. But that would be, you know, our idea of like a mass recovery at this point. And again, you're not going to be paying the ransom, right? So, so this feature right here is very intuitive. Um, it's smart. Um, and I think, you know, it's really a game changer in this industry that we allow you to make use of your, uh, your backups here in Polaris in order to detect where, uh, where ransomware lives. And that's, uh, and that's that. That's all I, I have today. Um, I want to say thank you for the opportunity. I'll definitely stick around for questions. And uh, no, thank you guys so much for the time. I, uh, I really appreciate it. Okay, so we do have a poll question for you. We appreciate your feedback on additional resources you'd like to see from Rubric. Um, and, uh, you know, Tracy, great presentation and demos today. And, and thanks so much for educating us on, on Rubric. And it, it looks like we do have uh, quite a few questions, but we can't get them get to them right here, unfortunately. Uh, we'll get them to Tracy and the Rubric team so they can uh, address them. I'd also like to remind you about the handouts. We've got a, a link from Rubric up here uh, in your handout section, so please be sure to check that out uh, if you'd like some more detail. Also, thanks to everybody who responded to the poll. We do appreciate your feedback. And I will just leave that up here for a moment while we take a look at our next prize drawing. So our next drawing is for another of the $300 Amazon gift cards. And the winner of this next gift card is Jocelyn Blakely Hill from Maryland. So congratulations to Jocelyn. We'll be in touch about um, how to claim your prize. Okay, so next up, we have the final segment in my conversation with, uh, with Ian Thornton Trump, uh, CISO from SciJax, and uh, delightful security expert. So let me, uh, uh, let's, let's go back to that with Ian. Okay, and I'm back with Ian. Uh, and, and we're going to talk briefly about Log4j. Um, boogie man. <laughs> <laughs> so th this is obviously one of the biggest points of concerns around security right now. And you've been outspoken, quoted in Wired Magazine last week, that the government response maybe hasn't been that helpful in this case. What's, what's your take on how big a concern Log4j really is? You know, is this as serious as it's being portrayed? And is there really that much that organizations can do? Yeah, the, the problem with um, Log4j is um, it, it came upon us um, rather suddenly. Um, and as a result of that, uh, a, a lot of people started engaging, trying to understand what was going on. And there was a lot of fear and uncertainty and doubt uh, strewn about as a result of this. Um, the, the reality of Log4j is it is devastating and consequential if you have exposure. The big question though, which became the sort of um, mantra of many um, uh, security vendors was um, if you don't know the components that go into your solutions or your uh, actual own development process, uh, finding and mitigating log4j will be very tough on you. And I agree, but I'm also concerned that, you know, organizations that can quickly determine that they aren't exposed or they don't have that technology um, in place in, within their organizations. I tend to now say, okay, the dialogue of you know, responsible disclosure obviously didn't happen in this case, but um, the dialogue of knowing your infrastructure and asset management and something that we're, all the cool kids are calling SBOM or software bill of materials, has now become this major hype machine. And, you know, where I would say like, in most cases, taking this standard pragmatic approach to this thing has happened, do your risk assessment, use your vulnerability scanner to find out externally if you may have this uh, attack surface and then start remediating. And I think the thing that upset me the most was as all of this was going on, 
I was seeing vendors announcing that they're blocking the attacks. So, you know, um, and then when you do some analysis and Microsoft published some great analysis, there was certainly a discussion around if you're preventing egressing or using reverse proxies, there's a good chance that yes, you could be vulnerable, but the actual attack could not happen against you. Right. Hmm. So, so it certainly became one of these things in my mind where everyone has sort of a different circumstance um, and different implementations of their infrastructure. So it's really hard to come out with, you know, a blanket statement like the FTC did saying that this is the thing you need to pay attention to. Um, I don't think they were wrong in, in, in kind of getting that message out there that it's important your business may be affected by it. But threatening people with legal, um, or w- with legal action was, I think, way over the top. Mm. Because in order to prove that, you would need to understand that, that attack utilize that vulnerability and that the attack was consequential for an organization. And those organizations, unless it's federally re- regulated data, are under no obligation to report that to, a st- to the um, federal authorities. So I, I sort of felt like that was almost voicing the frustration of the fact that vulnerability management, again, seems to be a major challenge for organizations. And I guess maybe the a bit of um, exasperation seeped out in, in their recent guidance, which was, you have to fix this in 14 days. And if you don't, well, we're going to get, uh, you know, you, we may be subject to legal action under SOX or HIPAA. I thought that was, wow, that seems a little bit angry, angryville. Okay. And thanks again to Ian for all of his insights there. We really appreciate those, and uh, any conversation that ends with uh, Angryville is, is always an interesting conversation. Um, now it's time for our next presentation in the, the Layered Security event. And our next session comes from Rapid7. And presenting for Rapid7 is Lonnie Best, Manager of Detection and Response Services. Ronnie, I'm sorry, Lonnie. Uh, welcome to, uh, to the session. Are you ready? I am. Thank you very much. And uh, yeah, that's that, that's a common mistake, so I don't fault you for it. <laughs> um, it. You never you never know what Starbucks is going to put on my cup. I'll tell you that. Um, so yeah, um, my name is Lonnie Best. I'm a manager of detection response services here at Rapid Seven in our uh, managed detection and response service. Um, and and my presentation today is uh, is a bit about um, the, the need for telemetry and partnerships in the age of Sunburst and beyond. Um, so big breaches call for big data, um, and, and we'll go ahead and discuss, you know, what, what does that mean? Um, so quick, quick background on myself. Um, uh, I already gave you my title there. Um, I've been with Rapid7 for about four and a half years. Um, I started off uh, my career here at this company um, as an analyst here in our managed detection response service uh, in our SOC in Arlington, Virginia. Um, and then I've been in my current role for the last uh, you know, two and a half years or so. Um, in the last 10 years and counting, I've been uh, an officer um, in the United States Army National Guard as a uh, signal officer doing tactical communications and, and currently in information operations. Um, got a uh, degree in organizational security management, a um, bunch of certifications, who cares. Uh, and uh, and also have a background, um, interestingly, in, in nuclear security. I uh, worked for a couple of years as a uh, security officer at a nuclear power facility. Um, I also have a, an extensive background in information technology, uh, information security, and incident response. Um, and there's a link there if you want to connect with me on LinkedIn, please do. I always encourage that and welcome it. Um, so yeah, so what are we here today to talk about? Um, basically, uh, I want to frame this starting with you know something that's not fresh or, or new, but something that was that was pretty big uh, incident you know back in late 2020. So. Um, you know, we're, we're a little over a year removed from uh, the Sunburst, SolarGate, Nobelium, whatever you want to call it. Um, the uh, SolarWinds hack is what, you know, most folks will refer to it as today. Um, you know, so what was that? Um, it was a uh, backdoor uh, 
version of a component of the SolarWinds Orion platform uh, specifically. It was a DLL, SolarWinds.Orion.Core.BusinessLayer.DLL. Uh, um, and uh, what was that used for? Um, you know, basically uh, some Russian, or at least likely Russian, that's who we've uh, attributed it to, um, they compromised that component. So um, uh, approximately 18,000 organizations uh, that were using SolarWinds Orion were, were potentially impacted. Um, and, and this was used to deploy, uh, you know, various types of malware over time, including um, one of them, the initial implant called Teardrop. Uh, there were some others that followed Gold Max, Sun Shuttle, Gold Find, a whole bunch of uh, different various types of, uh, of malware families that were utilized in, in this incident. Um, and uh, a lot of you know folks out there who were using this, as you can see, 18,000 organizations. Um, that's that's a lot, right? And the the, the news folks, you know, the, the media kind of like took this and ran with it. Um, you can see a little snippet there of. Um, you know, a, a Newsweek story about, you know, 425 firms in Fortune 500 utilize it, um, you know, U.S. military, NSA, all of these big uh, government and, and, and big uh, firms, you know, utilize this SolarWinds Orion platform. And so the, the, the big thing was that all these organizations were uh, compromised, right? Uh, you know, oh, my God, Russia, Russia's hacked me. Um, and, and the thing about it was, was that wasn't necessarily the case. Um, you know, they blew up in the media, and a lot of organizations, you know, were calling up here. Rapid7, our, our incident response hotline was, you know, kind of ringing off the hook. Our managed detection response customers who we are responsible for monitoring were, uh, you know, obviously freaking out like a lot of organizations were because um, they, they didn't really, you know, know exactly whether they were impacted. Uh, a lot of organizations kind of took some of the um, – the uh, indicators of compromise. So there was one of the main ones that came out in the initial reports from, from Mandiant FireEye um, was uh, a connection to a uh, command and control domain, avsdmcloud.com. Um, so if organizations were, you know, utilizing and, and uh, you know, a SIM solution or something like that, gathering, um, you know, all of their data as they, in telemetry as they should be, um, they might have seen you know, this indicator in their DNS or web proxy logs or something like that, and then naturally came to the conclusion that, um, you know, they were, they were compromised. They were part of one of these 18,000 organizations that were impacted. Um, and so it, it really, you know, kind of blew things out of the water. Um, but one of the things that, that, that we had to, you know, kind of get, get a, ahead of and, and a lot of organizations, you know, who were in the same space as Rapid7 um, needed to get ahead of was what, what really happened? How can you tell if you were actually compromised? Um, because what we come to find out was, you know, if you, if you actually read the, the reports, what actually happened was avsdmcloud.com was just the initial communication. That, that was basically where uh, this, this malware, once it was, uh, this DLL was implanted onto a system uh, via, you know, a normal update process. If you're updating, you know, SolarWinds Orion as you should be, um, this would have been put onto your, your system and it would have basically phoned home to this domain. What that didn't mean was that you were actually targeted by, uh, you know, these Russian threat actors or, or likely Russian, I should throw that out there. Um, because what we found out, you know, through our, um, you know, partner organizations in the industry was there's a lot of behavioral indicators that if you were gathering the right telemetry, um, you know, process start data from all of your endpoints, um, you know, uh, web proxy logs, firewall logs, things like that, um, there, there were a lot of activity that, that would have taken place after the fact that would have actually indicated that you were, you were compromised. Um, or targeted, I should say, because obviously organizations that had this DLL implant were compromised, so to speak, but they were not actually, um, you know, the, the threat actors did not follow through on that. Um, so that's, that sort of goes to highlight the, that um, the first thing that you need to be able to do to, to tell if you were compromised at all from this was you need to have data. You need to have the telemetry in place um, for, at this point in time, uh, this was nine months old uh, at the point of uh, the time of disclosure. So if you weren't ingesting uh, all of the requisite logs for at least those nine months and had an easy way to go through and uh, sort of 
you know, rip through them and, and find indicators of compromise, then you wouldn't really know. And and also, if you, you know, maybe weren't the most technically um, adept, you know, person, maybe you you have your small company and you have uh, IT users who are kind of responsible for your information security uh, program, um, they may not exactly know, you know, what to look for. Um, so you kind of there's a there's a need there for for data, um, but also for someone to you know kind of give you that helping hand to, to make to help you make use of it. Um, so you know the, in light of that, you know what what do organizations really need for um, you know to be successful when you have something like uh, you know solar winds, which is something that's nine months aging at the time that you're di starting to dig through your data and try to determine if you're compromised. If you, you just look at the fact that you're running solar winds Orion in your environment, do you really know? Um, and so what, what kinds of things do you need to, to be successful? Um, you need telemetry. So what does that mean? Um, data from your, your endpoints, your servers, your workstations, ideally as much data as you can get. Um, if your EDR solution is capable of logging to your, your SIM, um, you know, all of your process start events, network connections, things of that nature, um, that's going to be super helpful here. Um, you need telemetry from your network devices, so your switches, your switches, routers, firewalls, web proxy devices, um, web application um, firewalls, uh, wireless access points, whatever you can get data from is going to serve when you're trying to put it all together and paint a picture of uh, whether or not you may have been compromised or in order for you to develop detections uh, to hopefully catch uh, indications of compromise before, you know, things actually hit the fan. Um, network services, so things like DHCP, DNS, um, logs, those are all going to, to help paint that picture. Um, telemetry from your applications, you know, so whether you've got web applications that you either utilize from third-party services or maybe build in-house, other custom applications, um, those types of things. And then a uh, big one today, uh, your cloud services, you know, everything's moving to the cloud, so you want to be logging uh, and gathering telemetry from your cloud services, such as your hosted email applications, uh, other business applications like SharePoint, things of that nature. Um, if you're, you know, in, utilizing AWS, you want to be gathering cloud trail and guard duty logs. Um, all of that stuff needs to be gathered and aggregated and stored um, in order to be able to go back and, and query against. Um, and then the other kind of component to this, it's not just having the data, but it's the thing that I alluded to before, um, whereas organizations, you know, we're seeing these media reports of this big hack, you know, against something that's, you know, so widespread as, as Solar Winds Orion was, was that, that piece of um, information to be able to contextualize it, right? So you're gathering all of this data. You can see that you had this call out to absvmcloud.com, um, but, but what did that really mean uh, and the understanding of what comes next um, to indicate if you were actually, you know, if a, if a threat actor takes advantage of such a backdoor, what does it look like? Um, and so that's where your, your partnerships in the industry kind of come into play. Um, and so you want to have various partnerships. This, what I have listed here is not all of them, but, but you know, your software, product vendors, things like your, your AV or uh, endpoint detection response solutions providers, um, just your regular, you know, business software, uh, your regular hardware, you know, those going back to those network devices, you know, like how can your firewall solution or firewall vendor help you out in understanding, you know, contextualizing the, the logs that you're ingesting. Um, the consultants, so um, that might be something like, you know, having a, part, a good partnership with an incident response consultancy if you can't provide that maybe in-house or even just having that if you need to invoke something like cyber insurance, which we'll, we'll kind of get to in a minute. Um, you know, your information technology consultants, those folks who can come in and actually um, help you utilize the technology that, that, that you're taking advantage of. Um, threat intelligence, this is something where, you know, a lot of organizations, they, they can't really um, bring it in-house. Threat intelligence is something that's usually highly specialized, takes a lot of information from a lot of places. Um, so you, usually having a partnership with someone who can provide that threat intelligence is, is going to be something that's going to be important and helpful. Um, education and training, so, you know, ensuring that your, your personnel uh, and your you know, information security uh, personnel are, are up to speed, um, you know, meeting their ongoing goals and things of that nature. 
Um, and then again, I mentioned insurance, and it probably seems like a weird one to bring up here for you know having a partnership because most people just think you know I'm paying for this so such that you know it's there if I need it. Um, but really engaging with your your insurance, whether that's physical or, or cyber insurance providers, to to be sure that that agency is you know working best to meet your organizational goals and needs in whatever plan or policy that you're putting together, um, so that if you end up in that situation where you know these threat actors did take advantage of that back door, um, you're in a good spot uh, to, to be covered by that insurance policy. Um, one of the the areas where you know Rapid Seven is is trying to help. Um, and has been for many years is in our, our threat intelligence and our community resource. Um, uh, Rapid7 is kind of a, a research uh, focused organization. So yes, while we provide products and services, um, you know, some of the big things that we contribute to is just the community in general. Um, so we have our own threat intelligence team in-house um, who are uh, working to put together reports and, and blog posts and things like that that we, we give out to the community as well as our customers. Uh, we have the, the Metasploit community, which has been you know, going strong for, for many, many years, decades at this point. Um, so you have you know, hundreds of thousands of contributors uh, who are working to develop new exploits, um, you know, proofs of concept, and that stuff gets you know, put back into the, the Metasploit framework for penetration testers and, and folks who are assessing their security uh, posture you know, can utilize for free. Um, we do have a number of projects, um, such as Project Heisenberg and Sonar. These are our uh, global network of, of honeypots and, uh, and, and internet-wide scanning that we use to provide insights for, uh, you know, whether we are seeing upticks and things that are going, out, you know, going on on the internet that we can provide, uh, you know, sort of real-time. This is what's happening in the wild. Um, information to to the world, um, and also, you know, what what are we if we if we observe an incident, you know what what kind of stuff do we see? How, what what does the exposure look like? You know across the globe, um, you know vulnerability disclosure, threat hunting. Um, these are all things that we contribute to. And in addition to that, we're we're part of the Cyber Threat Alliance. Um, so we we hold board and committee seats on the Cyber Threat Alliance, and um, that's one of the ways that we try to give back to the global community um, for our threat threat intelligence initiatives. <clears throat> Um, on top of that, we, we do, again, provide services at Rapid7, right? So I'm, I'm part of our managed detection and response uh, organization. And what we utilize for uh, providing that is um, our platform inside IDR. Um, so that's going to be our SIM XDR solution. Um, we were kind of doing XDR before that term you know, became in vogue. Um, so gathering in um, both endpoint telemetry via our inside agent, um, so that's gathering things like process start events and providing all of that up to the platform, um, but also focusing on you know your traditional SIM um, technologies. So just ingesting as much data as you can throw into the thing um, and and utilizing that to go back and do you know these big sweeps um, and and threat hunts, you know retroactive or proactive threat hunts across our customer base to look for things like the solar winds event. Um, you know we. We store our customers' data for you know, 13 months um, in AWS, and so whenever one of these big events comes across, or we discover something um, via you know a new tactic or technique, we can actually go back and do retroactive um, sweeps across our customer base um, to look for you know uh, ongoing uh, compromises that may have existed that, that weren't known about before. Um, and, and our platform doesn't you know integrate some things like deception technology. So we have things like honey pots and honey files, honey user accounts and credentials that, that you can deploy um, in order to try to detect, um, you know, sort of those unknown threats or if someone comes in and into your environment and is, you know, try, kind of going under the wire a bit, um, we can, you know, utilize that deception technology to pick up on, on those, uh, those, you know, low uh, sweeping threat actors. Um, and so just to, I just want to highlight a couple of ways that, you know, we utilize all of this, um, you know, these, these partnerships and telemetry. I've, I've talked a good bit about Sunburst because that was big uh, for quite a while uh, last year. Um, but over the course of the last year, we've had several other big incidents, um, you know, pop up that made headlines. Um, so in this case, the one we're going to talk about here, um, on, on February 27th, uh, 2021, so just under a year ago, um, it, it was about, 
I think 10 p.m. Um, Eastern Standard Time in the United States, um, our uh, Asia Pacific SOC, the analysts there began uh, detecting um, the uh, exploits um, against um, Microsoft Exchange servers. Um, and what they were seeing was a detection that we had in place for a number of years related to the China Chopper web shell. I think the China Chopper web shell has been in, around since 2013, so, so something very old, but it has a, um, a, a very typical um, you know, sort of set of uh, command line parameters that will execute on, on an impacted host. And um, once we started like seeing these across you know, numerous um, customer endpoints, we started digging in and saying, you know, there's something, something big going on here. This isn't, this isn't something that's you know, uh, targeting a specific organization. Um, and, and we found that all of the customers that were being impacted um, were being impacted by uh, on-premise Microsoft Exchange servers. So this wasn't something that was targeting Office 365 or anything like that. They, these were uh, organizations that were hosting Microsoft Exchange in-house um, and, of course, exposed to the public Internet. Um, when we started looking at the you know, available exploits, um, you know, recent CVEs, we found uh, one particular CVE, 2021-24085, um, this was a, not something that would have, you know, initially led us to believe, hey, there's the, there's the possibility for remote code execution because it wasn't a, an RCE um, vulnerability, um, but the, the if there was a certain exploit chain that could have been associated with that, you, you could uh, reasonably uh, see um, uh, remote code execution on a host. So <clears throat> what we did was, we went to our uh, Rapid7 Labs, um, our research team, folks who um, operate Project Sonar, um, and, and we attributed initially that this was, you know, this is probably um, this particular CVE that's being impacted uh, because it was just released uh, or just um, made public just a couple weeks prior. Um, so we pulled uh, data from Project Sonar, um, which you can see on this uh, little map here. Um, this was a, a sort of um, overview of the exposed um, vulnerable Microsoft Exchange servers uh, around the world. Um, we put together a blog post related to this and, uh, and let everyone, you know, anyone who wanted to read our blog know uh, exactly what we are observing in sort of this like mass exploitation, um, including, you know, where the, the geographic distribution was. Uh, and, it, and then it wasn't until four days after we began detecting attacks utilizing, um, you know, these uh, our, our threat intelligence, um, which we had built out these, these detections several years prior to, to pick up on something that had been around for many years, um, that Microsoft came out and, and let, a, let the world know that, you know, there's uh, four new zero days um, that they had been kind of sitting on for a while um, that when chained together um, could result, result in remote code execution, and that's exactly what we were seeing. Um, we, we basically looked uh, across our customer base, um, both inside IDR customers, um, so those are just the product only customers, but also our managed detection response customer base and our threat intelligence team put together a lot of really useful information, which you'll find in the blog post that's linked here in the slide um, to, to sort of put out to everyone the types of um, follow-on activity that we were seeing for, from various threat actors. So the primary threat actor in this instance that Microsoft um, associated to these exploits was uh, one that they deemed um, hafnium. So a lot of folks on the line have probably heard of that at this point. Um, but uh, there were a lot of other threat actors who were uh, making use of this, you know, recently disclosed zero day. Um, and so we were able to provide uh, the community with a lot of really useful uh, information, you know, not, not only indicators of compromise, but sort of um, what we deem attacker behaviors uh, at Rapid7, so what exactly were they doing once they compromised the host and, uh, and provided that back, back to the community. Um, and then again, utilizing some of this information now that we knew about these zero days, uh, Bob Rudis um, was able to, you know, at, at this point in the screenshot here, able to go and look at um, a certain number of endpoints that based on our honeypot data, we were able to determine that they were um, compromised and being used in a botnet. Um, so, again, just a lot of the, uh, what we try to get back to the community at Rapid7 um, via our uh, threat intelligence and research initiatives. Uh, now, one that we're, you know, sort of uh, 
everyone's probably got top of mind since um, you know early December at this point was uh, the recent log for shell compromise um, or log for shell uh, exploit. Um, so on December 10th, um, 2021, just uh, a little over a month ago, was when uh, Apache you know dropped this guy on the world. Um, basically, the log4j vulnerability, which resides in the way specially crafted log messages are handled by the log4j processor, which is meant for um, you know logging. So that's why you get the, uh, the the meme there on the right. You know, you're, it's meant to log things, but the logger uh, was um, developed in such a way that if you sent it specially crafted um, messages, it will execute code on the endpoint. Um, so uh, the, the big thing about Log4j is that it's pretty much in use all over the place. Uh, most organizations, you know, began having to, to scramble to determine, you know, where exactly it was in use in the environment. Um, but this was also, you know, security providers, Rapid7 not excluded from this. You know, we had to, to go out and look at where it was being used, and, and not just security providers, but also, you know, your, your, every vendor under the sun basically had to uh, do an analysis in their environment and, and let their uh, customers know exactly um, where they might be impacted, um, you know, develop fixes, uh, patches. Um, and, and, and going back to, you know, the need for having good partnerships, you know, with your, your vendors and consultants and providers, like this is, this is a really big uh, indicator of, of how important that is um, because if your vendor was not being diligent uh, about something like this, then, you know, you may be left dead in the water not knowing, you know, what components that your vendors provide you are actually uh, impacted in the environment, which could then leave you open to uh, exposure and, uh, exploitation by uh, malicious actors. Um, the fun thing about this was, uh, you know, it kind of dropped on the world on a Friday and, you know, left uh, security uh, firms all over the world kind of um, struggling to, to figure all of this out over the weekend so that they wouldn't be exploited. Um, Apache released uh, a fix and then, you know, there was a new CVE, 2021-45046. Uh, uh, so then they released a fix for that, and then they dropped another CVE. Um, so you know, in the in the mad scramble to try to fix this problem, um, there were ultimately numerous additional vulnerabilities that were uh, exposed um, via the log for day um, capability. Um, so for Rapid Seven, uh, our customers, you know, we did a we did a um, a look back at, at you know what kind of activity can uh, are, are the threat actors doing uh, once they compromise. Uh, an endpoint you know, that's vulnerable to the log4j. Uh, we determined that in our platform, our uh, threat intelligence team had developed um, an earlier attacker behavior analytics detection, um, which would have covered some of the early activity um, being uh, performed by threat actors, and that was generally uh, installing cryptocurrency miners. Um, the threat intelligence team ultimately uh, created three new detections by the end of that day on December 10th. Uh, to cover some of the other activity that they were seeing. Um, and then they ultimately released two additional detections since then, one of which was specifically for uh, VMware Horizon uh, activity. Um, and to my last bullet point here, um, the VMware Horizon um, has been being actively mass exploited uh, since this past Friday. Um, we, we were observing that uh, Friday afternoon, and then that continued on into uh, yesterday. Um, I, I wasn't sure if we were going to see continued exploitation of that today, but at least in our MDR customers, we haven't seen any, um, you know, big uptick in exploitation today, uh, thankfully. Um, but, you know, this is just a reminder, please, please patch if you're running um, anything that is exposed to the internet utilizing Log4j, um, because threat actors are not really giving up on this one. So, um, and with that, um, do we have uh, any questions? Yeah, Lonnie, we do. And uh, by the way, really appreciate the play-by-play -play on both the the exchange attacks from last year on, on the Log4j incident. Those are nice examples of the values, the value that uh, that Rapid7 brings to the table. Um, so yeah, we do have some questions here. And before we get to those, I do want to put up the, the poll question. Um, if you'd like any additional information about Rapid7, just uh, please enter in what uh, what kind of information you'd like to see. But uh, yeah, let's get into some of those questions. Um, 
Well, so this question, my team doesn't have the bandwidth to stay on top of threat intelligence and threat hunting on our own. Is, is leveraging Insight IDR as a managed service the best option? Yeah, that's a really great question. So, I mean, that's exactly what managed detection response exists for. Um, you know, we, we partner with companies to kind of be the, the folks who are, you know, not, we're, we're, of course, the customers gain access to the product, so anything that they want to do within Insight IDR, they can. Um, but what managed detection response is responsible for is actually triaging all of those alerts, doing the threat hunting, all the things that most, um, you know, smaller security teams tend to be strapped for time for, uh, because, of course, security teams tend to have to be the ones to also go out there and do all of the patching and, uh, you know, and handle resetting, you know, user accounts who, who become compromised during re-imaging of, of you know, compromised assets. Um, so the additional overhead of having to maintain the platform, having to maintain detections, um, and actually do the, the response itself um, is, is something that a lot of organizations are strapped for, and that's what uh, Rapid7 you know, MDR exists to do. Uh, we have the expertise uh, to know exactly you know, kind of what we're looking for, um, and we treat all of our analysts, whether they're the most junior or senior analysts, kind of the same way, and that means that you know, if we're performing an incident response for a customer, the, uh, the junior analyst, you know, whether it's a, you know, a commodity type, type situation where there's, you know, maybe they weren't specifically targeted or you know, instances of um, you know, APT groups um, or advanced uh, cybercrime you know, actors, they get thrown into the mix. And so we get you know, a very well-rounded group of analysts who have a lot of expertise. Super. Um, another question here from, from Sanjeev uh, I've seen before. Uh, how can you differentiate between MDR and XDR? Ah, that's a good question, and that's probably a better question for a, a more marketing savvy person uh, than myself. <laughs> but, uh, you know, in general, um, XDR, so uh, we, we have this sort of two sides of the coin. So you've got um, EDR um, and then, um, you know, just traditional type SIM. Um, and then so what uh, kind of is in vogue these days with, with XDR is, is kind of really a convergence of the two, um, you know, your your endpoint detection and response and your SIM solution um, to really give you the ability to paint that full picture of everything that went on, you know, from, from point A to point B. So a lot of the time when you've had, uh, if you just have EDR in, in place, you lose the context of, well, if you see an alert on that endpoint, where's the context from there, right? So how do you analyze, you know, the additional connections through your firewall or your web proxy, looking at DNS uh, activity, um, all of the associated things are kind of disparate, and if you have them in one solution, um, then it makes it a lot easier to be able to scope and, and you know, do proper detection and response. Um, and then, so for, for Rapid7, that's kind of been our solution for many years now. Um, and then we've been doing managed detection response on top of that. So, and the, the differentiator between that is you, you basically you've got XDR, which would be the inside IDR platform for Rapid7, and then you have MDR, or you could call it MXDR because we work off of that same platform, but it's just you're, you're taking the effort off of, of you as the customer to do all of that overhead work, and, and we take responsibility for it, utilizing the same platform that you have access to. Okay. Lonnie, I don't know how much better a marketing person could have done. That was, that was. <laughs> um, and it looks like we're running out of time. Unfortunately, there are a ton of questions here. We'll, we'll get all those to you so you can get back to people. But uh, if somebody wants to get started with, with Rapid7 um, or find out more, what, what, what do you recommend? What's a good way to get started? Um, yeah, absolutely. Check out our website, rapid7.com. Um, we've got all of our uh, resources for our products. Um, and uh, our managed services as well. So we not only have managed detection response, but we also have uh, managed vulnerability management, managed application security, um, and then we have you know a slew of products, um, you know from um, intelligence services to um, you know obviously inside IDR um, vulnerability management, the Metasploit framework, and the professional version of that. Um, so a whole bunch of stuff that you can find there. Just uh, head over there, and then I highly recommend. Uh, checking out our blog as well. We put a lot of really good technical content from not only MDR, but, but other areas of the company in there. Tremendous. Okay. Well, Lottie, thanks a lot. Really appreciate you being here and bringing us up to speed on, on what Rapid7 is up to. Absolutely. Thank you very much. And with that, let's do our next uh, prize drawing.
the uh, the winner of the gift card, this next uh, Amazon three hundred dollar gift card is Chris Jewell from Massachusetts. So congratulations to Chris. We'll be in touch about claiming your prizes. And now it's time for our next presentation in the Security Summit. Our next session comes from Zerto. Presenting for Zerto is Andy Fernandez, Senior Product Marketing Manager. So I'm going to turn things over to Andy. And welcome you to today's session, which is really focused on backup, disaster recovery, data protection, and disaster recovery as a service. We're going to talk about it in Zerto's approach uh, regarding these use cases via continuous data protection. So if you have any questions, please add them to the chat. If not, we'll try to answer all of your questions towards the end. Also take a look at any of the resources that we provide during the session within the link in the chat. With that, let's take a look at our agenda. So in regards to today's agenda, we're gonna do a quick introduction. We're gonna take a look at some of the challenges that we're seeing within data protection and disaster recovery. Whether you are doing it yourself or you're looking to use a service provider, uh, these challenges are still the same. From there, we're going to take a look at how Zerto does things differently, how Zerto's continuous data protection is able to provide a simple, uh, a simple experience with the best performance and also available for whatever cloud destination or on-premises strategy that you're looking for. After that, we're going to take a look at a couple of customer examples to validate this as well. But before, before we do any of that, let's really take an understanding of what an IT organization has to do today. So if you're an IT or infrastructure and operations organization today, regardless of whether you have uh, disparate uh, disaster recovery and backup teams, you still have common uh, requirements as an organization that you have to perform. And this comes from a reactive perspective, right? You have to be able to restore a file locally, meaning if somebody deletes a file, it's corrupted, or even a minor ransomware attack specific to a folder, you have to be able to restore this effectively uh, without an impact to production and get this as quick as possible uh, to whoever is requiring this information. But you also are required to retain data for certain periods, especially if you're within healthcare, financial uh, services organizations, or even other types of governmental agencies as well. You need to be able to host, uh, retain data for a long period of time, but also be able to recover said data as well. And that's more of the, the, the backup experience, right? Both uh, restoring locally and being able to host to retain data long-term. But also there's a DR component. That same organization, you're responsible for uh, performing a failover if there's a natural disaster. And not just your traditional natural disasters that you see with hurricanes, tornadoes, fires, but also planned disasters uh, as well. Being able to preemptively move data somewhere else, or even worst case scenario, have to deal with large scale ransomware attack. We're seeing ransomware kind of um, toe the line between a backup and a disaster recovery scenario, depending on what happens. So these are common things that, that, are, that have to be done, and we've already talked about ransomware, but there's another one too from a plant perspective. This same organization, uh, usually your same department, is also tasked uh, to migrate to the cloud, whether it's actually moving your, your protected DR or backup workloads to the cloud or something entirely different. Whether you're facing a merger or an acquisition or just a cloud initiative, you have to have the capabilities to do so. So IT organizations are aware of this and, and they have to find the right tool set to be able to unlock these capabilities. But with that comes a lot of complexity. If you think about many organizations, most of them start on premises. You have a primary data center and you realize that you need to be able to fail over to another warm site. Uh, so you build a secondary data center. This is the site where you're able to fail over all your applications if something happens to fulfill a DR scenario. Usually you're using a tool like Recover Point and you require homogeneous storage to be able to do so. So you have kind of fulfilled uh, at a very basic level what you need for DR. But then you also realize you need a little bit more sophisticated orchestration and automation. So you have to bring in another tool. Let's use SRM or Site Recovery Manager as an example as well. Now you're kind of dealing with two tools kind of perform the same activity within the same business unit. After that, you're also expected to still perform your local restores of files, folders, and VMs, but also from a compliance perspective. So you need backup as well. And then, you know, you've had all this built on premises and you've now received the cloud mandate to be able to move to the cloud. Whether you have to move your DR to the cloud or you, you have to move your backup to the cloud, you then have to now acquire another tool in order to do so. 
So within this sim space, to accomplish uh, you know, the core capabilities of what we've talked about, you need a DR tool, the you know, orchestration tool, backup tool, and something to be able to migrate because you want the best performance for each one. So now you're managing multiple UIs, completely different training and professional services requirements. You're spending a lot of time and resources on not just the initial installation and configuration, but just managing it, uh, managing the upgrade process. This takes a lot of time, a lot of people, and, and a lot of uh, effort uh, for something that's more focused on a reactive approach than anything really uh, focused on building your business. And that's on the technical side. Let's not even get into what are the ramifications from a licensing and pricing perspective, just on managing disparate backup and DR tools, let alone another tool for orchestration, let alone another tool for data migrations as well. This presents a lot of complexities, a lot of wasted time, uh, and also a lot of uh, lack of uh, structure and continuity with it from a performance perspective as well. So how does Zerto do it differently? Well, we focus on all of these use cases being able to be performed from one user interface and one specific action. Let's take a look at that. So what I've done here is kind of gift the Zerto UI, specifically a failover, uh, to show the simplicity of what you can accomplish within a few clicks. And if you think about what you thought about Zerto 10 years ago to what it is today, there's a lot that you can perform. Uh, within the same Zerto user interface, a specific just software only approach, you're able to perform what you would re require from a backup perspective. You can restore files and folders instantly without an impact to production. You can recover a VM or an application from long-term storage as well, uh, whether it's a secondary site on-premises or in the public cloud. Uh, you can perform a complete failover as you're seeing here on the screen, and you're able to also migrate on-premises or uh, to the cloud. So within one interface, one experience, uh, one licensing structure, you're able to perform all these things that required uh, a full, what I would call a data protection stack. And that's what's different about Zerto, that you're getting the best performance and you're not making any sacrifices on specific use cases. And what I mean by that is we see a lot of organizations using their backup software to perform DR, but we know that's just not feasible to be able to use backup because backup is only effective in the scenarios where you're experiencing data loss. You can't have planned operations when you're doing backup. You can't effectively move your data. And we're seeing our customers experience that and start to consolidate Zerto and use Zerto explicitly for both backup and DR. And the reason that is, is I'll show you on the following slide. Zerto, it, it gives you the ability to do things for both the unplanned aspect of your business, but also for the planned side. For the unplanned, both DR and backup, you're able to recover from ransomware. You're able to do it in performance that is unmatched and simplicity that is unmatched as well. You're able to restore files, folders, and VMs. You can recover from long-term retention, right? That cost-effective storage. You can fail over to another site in the, in the case of a outage or some type of uh, malfunctioning with your hardware. Or you could even do it in the, in the usual case of natural disasters. That's just the unplanned side. But what about the plant side of the business, specifically the one that usually is tied to actual revenue? Well, with Zerto, you're able to simply, uh, in a simple manner, migrate to the public cloud, or you can do it to another data center. You can do it to a service provider. Let's say that you realize that maybe from a DRAS perspective, uh, you, you need the, the capabilities and the expertise of the service provider. With Zerto, you can simply move to them and, and experience the values or Zerto's technology coupled with the efficiency, the service catalog that a service provider can provide you as well. But also preemptive failovers, right? Let's say that you know a hurricane is coming within one or two days. Why not fail over quickly uh, before any type of risk um, happens and you're able to do so? You can't do that with backup. So that's what we pride ourselves at Zerto with being able to deliver one experience for all unplanned and planned activities, regardless of the use case, right? Data protection and disaster recovery. But how does it actually work? What gives us the best performance? What gives us the best simplicity uh, when it comes to executing on these specific uh, capabilities? Well, at the core of continuous data protection is our near synchronous replication. What defers Zerto from the rest is the fact that we're not tied to array-based storage replication. This is replication that sits at the hypervisor level. 
what you're doing is essentially using change block tracking to observe and write every single change that happens within your app, within your app virtualized applications. So you're able to essentially create recovery checkpoints every five seconds. So instead of waiting, you know, a couple of hours in between uh, copy checkpoints, you're able to just use Zerto's replication to do so. More importantly, the reason you're able to do this with such granularity is that there is no impact on your production environment. So whether you're looking at a specific uh, secondary site that you're replicating to or something like Azure, just because you re recognize the value of using the cloud as a warm site, you're able to do it. So what this means at the end of the day, Zerto's replication gives you RPOs of seconds for DR and for backup as well. And that's a crucial aspect to, to consider as well. But it's not just about the replication. You need a mechanism to be able to recover this data as well. And with that, you, this is what, where the Zerto journal comes in. The Zerto journal is the mechanism that observes these changes, manages the replication, and then it gives you the user interface to be able to select those checkpoints pretty easily. Think about it. You're, you're creating thousands and thousands of checkpoints a day instead of, you know, two to three points where you can restore uh, and perform a backup restore. So the Zerto journal simplifies this where you can select even just an application and all of the VMs that belong to that application and consistently re uh, recover them. This is just a quick UI of what that looks like. You're simply able to select the date, select the timestamp with five seconds apart, and then be able to recover or restore without any impact to production environments. And this is an extremely crucial aspect to understand because coupled with both the replication and the journaling technology, there is no backup provider or no backup service that can deliver this for both DR and backup. And what I, might, what I mean by that is if you just take a look at, you know, your traditional day, because of what snapshots do to your environment and the impact they put on production and how much storage they consume, you're really usually performing a nightly or daily backup just to make sure that you have something to recover from. But let's say you're hit with ransomware and everything else, your, your threat detection works out perfectly and you understand the exact point in time in which you can recover uh, an application. Well, even if everything's inherently working, assuming your, your backup restore even works, you're still facing a couple of hours of data loss at minimum. With Zerto, it's just a couple of seconds. We have multiple customer success stories where they were uh, attacked with ransomware, the data was encrypted, and they were able to simply recover. So this shows you the, the RPO superiority of what Zerto can deliver for both backup and DR compared to the rest of the industry. But what about RTOs? That's a critical component as well. If you think about the nature of your enterprise applications, right, there's a lot of t dependencies there from a multi VM perspective. You have uh, sometimes almost a dozen or more VMs that belong to a specific application. When you are copying this or performing a traditional backup job, uh, you use incremental snapshots. And that's fine when you're just trying to back it up, right? That's traditional backup technology. But what happens when you actually have to recover and recover quickly? You then have to do the math and find the common denominator and understand exactly at which checkpoint are all of these VMs at a consistent, specific checkpoint. That's incredibly difficult to do, uh, especially scaling it across multiple applications. But with Zerto, it's completely different. What we do is we treat your applications as one consistent entity, one cohesive unit where you configure what we call a virtual protection group. You designate all of the VMs that belong to that application put them in the virtual protection group, and then with any incident or move operation, you simply select that application and can recover all the checkpoints at the same exact time. This saves a lot of time on RTO. Sometimes we, we, uh, we only focus on RPO, but RTO is extremely important at the enterprise level as well. And then you have another important aspect too is, well, where am I replicating? What, what, what is the difference between what I wanna do on premise or in the public cloud or with a disaster recovery uh, service provider? Well, let's take a look. Because of our software only nature and the, f the fact that we're agnostic, we allow you to utilize the infrastructure that's best for you. Whether you want to use a traditional uh, public cloud like Microsoft Azure, or you actually wanna be able to use VMware on a public cloud like the Azure VMware solution, you can do so. 
You can do that without any impact on production, without any significant, without any difference in performance, uh, and, and utilizing a scale out architecture as well. But we also know that this this uh, session also top, talks about disaster recovery as a service. We have over 450 service providers that you're able to utilize uh, in order to be able to replicate to them and have them manage your, your disaster recovery capabilities. And really, Zerto is about flexibility, and it's about giving you consistent performance wherever your infrastructure is, whether you're focused on cost optimization or you're focused on making sure that you can uh, – have the SLAs that are right for your business, and that's why you're using a service provider. Certo's architecture, its software-only approach, the way that we are scaled out, it is completely effective for that. That's why we consider ourselves a true cloud data management and protection platform. And with that, I want to kind of show you kind of exactly all of the use cases that you're able to unlock with the Zerto platform. As we covered in the beginning, we saw all of the planned and unplanned operations you can do with Zerto. Our goal is that it doesn't matter what workload you have, whether you are using virtualization, whether you have SaaS, whether you have uh, containerized applications like Kubernetes, or even all three of them, that you're able to use one platform and experience to deliver a disaster recovery, to be able to deliver continuous backup long-term retention for compliance, the fact that, you're able to, that you are able to move this data wherever you want, but also a lot of additional use cases like tests and development or even security and compliance. We have strong alliances and we're able to deliver that experience consistently across all of them. But with that in mind, let's take a look at uh, some customer examples that we've seen that are very successful within this. One of my favorite examples here is Pruitt Health. Pruitt Health had an on-premise site, and they realized they wanted to use Microsoft Azure uh, for their DR operations. So what they did is they switched from on-premises DR with SRM, and they started protecting VMs in Microsoft Azure with Zerto. Of course, they were able to unlock the performance that Zerto promises around RPOs of seconds, RTOs of minutes. But what's very interesting as well is our approach to DR testing helped them reduce the time from days to hours. They were able to improve the efficiency and the reduced man hours spent on near daily maintenance and operations. So it's very clear how easy it is for Zerto to be used, not just to unlock the best performance, but also the simplest experience as well. And this is a, a DR specific approach, but what about backup? Another excellent uh, success story that we have is Gray County. Gray County has a great quote that I think really exemplifies the value of Zerto and Azure. It says, government organizations like ours are often stretched thin, and each agency consists of a lot of small businesses, in a sense. Zerto and Azure met all of our very demanding requirements. They just work together seamlessly. And when we talk about those requirements, it's not just about one specific operation, whether planned or unplanned. It's about being able to deliver DR, being able to deliver backup, and being able to do so in a way that reduces TCO, increases performance, and lets your IT organization focus on proactive activities like building the business. I, I ask and urge that you take a look at these case studies later on because there's a lot of value to understand from a user's perspective what you can do with Zerto and Azure. Now, with that in mind, I want to leave some links with you and a few other resources as well. And with that, I invite you to experience Zerto really firsthand. There's one thing me sitting here talking about it to you, but the other one is being able to see a real demo, being able to get your hands on the labs or even perform a TCO calculation to know what would Zerto's impact be to your organization. I'm gonna provide all of these links as well within the chat, but uh, take a look at this and there's one more uh, resource that I'm leaving with you. What I'm doing here are giving you three core assets that are really important and they're all, and two of them are adding a list back. The first one is the Gorilla Guide to Continuous Backup and Recovery Express Edition. This is an excellent read, especially if you're coming more from a backup perspective and wanna know what is the difference between my legacy backup approach using snapshots and what I'm using with Zerto. And the other two are more analyst back papers that are very interesting using objective survey data to really understand what are the challenges that organizations are facing today? Why can't traditional backup solve for them? And how Zerto is able to deliver significant value there. I'm gonna leave all these resource links within the chat as well. And with that, let's move over to some of the questions. 
So we have some questions here that let's let's get to answering them. The first one is, do you have a solution for Kubernetes or containerized applications? The answer is yes. We've actually just released at ZerdoCon Zerdo for Kubernetes, which means disaster recovery and data protection as code. I definitely urge you to take a look at our ZerdoCon site, watch our sessions, and even read some of our assets and interesting articles around why we're delivering a very unique approach and how we're bringing continuous data protection to the table for containerized applications. And that also applies to SaaS, meaning uh, Microsoft Office 365, Salesforce, Google Workspace, and a few others as well. Another question that we're getting here is on the analytics side. Uh, does Zerto have analytics? Yes, we have Zerto Analytics, which is actually browser-based, meaning that regardless of where your site is, you have the ability to monitor uh, your data center and your protected VMs from anywhere, whether it's on your phone or on your desktop or laptop, you're able to do so. And what's interesting about Zerto as well is that these analytics are completely built in. We're not charging you anything else. This comes with the Zerto platform along with everything else. The other questions we usually get as well is, well, what about hypervisors? Well, we work with Hyper-V and vSphere. Uh, and we're also, from a virtualization perspective, licensed per VMs as well. That's another question that we seem to be getting a lot. So with that in mind, I'm going to keep answering some of the chat questions, but I want to thank you all for your time uh, and your attention today. Thank you so much. Uh, we appreciate your feedback on uh, any additional resources that you'd like to see from Zerto. Andy, great presentation today, and thanks so much for educating us on Zerto. And looks like we, we had a, a few more questions. As, as Andy mentioned, he'll, he'll get to as many as he can in the chat, and we'll get them over to the Zerto team so they can address them offline as well. Um, I'd also like to remind all of you about the handouts. Um, we've got a PDF from Zerto there. That PDF is about ransomware. Uh, mitigating the threat of cybersecurity attacks. So be sure to check that out if you'd like more detail. And I do want to thank everybody who responded to the poll. Uh, we do appreciate your feedback, and I'll just leave it up there while we do our next prize drawing. So our next prize is the another $300 Amazon gift card. And the winner of this one is Emily Ware of North Carolina. So congratulations to Emily. We'll be in touch about claiming that prize. And now it's time for our next presentation in the Defense in Depth Summit. Our next session comes from Cohesity, and presenting for Cohesity is Raj Dut. Raj, welcome. Thank you, Scott. I'm happy to be here. And uh, thank you, everyone, who's, who's dialing in, joining in. Congratulations to Emily for winning the last, uh, last raffle there. Um, great, great topic, top of mind for everyone, Defense in Depth something that even uh, NIST cybersecurity framework talks about. Um, but how do you defend against a threat that has been evolving? And that actually brings us to the, the topic that I'll be covering from Cohesity is how do you address the modern day data breach? Because the, the threat that we have been experiencing in last few years has continued to evolve and not just the threat that is evolved, but even the tools and solutions that you've been using, the roles of those solutions have been evolving. So before we dive into the, uh, the presentation here, uh, let me just get a quick uh, forward-looking statement here that over the course of this presentation, I'll be making a few forward-looking statements, uh, talking about a few new offerings and product capabilities, which currently are on our roadmap. And while these statements about the roadmap are reasonable and, and accurate based on the current expectations, please be aware that uh, these might change uh, in future as, uh, as we move forward. Um, so with that, the, the landscape that I was talking about is obviously not just uh, ugly, but is evolving. Uh, what we have been experiencing uh, is we are witnessing more and more organizations falling to victims of cyber threats, ransomware attacks specifically. And these attacks are not just increasing in frequency and velocity, but the cyber criminals are actually getting more and more aggressive. They're changing their tactics. And what we want to get a sense from this audience is, um, in this poll question, is of these options, which of these cybersecurity threats you are most concerned about? 
Is it the data breach like we all experienced a few years back with an online bank, uh, a multinational bank, uh, done by a lady sitting in, in a basement in Pacific Northwest? Or data encryption that we are experiencing on daily basis, organizations are facing that? Or data exfiltration, that is the, the newer threat that, that we are now seeing. Um, for example, Acer, faced, uh, a Taiwanese computer manufacturer faced um, not too long back. So, data breach. Yeah, Raj, it looks like on. we're getting some pretty, yeah, it looks like we're getting some pretty clear results. So, I'll just go ahead and, and push out the results percentages so okay. everybody can see them. Uh, thanks, thanks, Scott. So, uh, more than half are, are saying data breaches, uh, followed by encryption and exfiltration. So exfiltration and encryption fairly neck, neck to neck um, makes sense, and data breach as well. So we are, that, that takes me to my next slide. Well, we all have been hearing ransomware, ransomware. The evolution of this threat has, has changed. It, it started off by encrypting our production data, but then as as the technology evolved, as as organizations uh, deployed modern solutions, the cyber criminals started coming after the backup data, and now they are actually stealing our data, commonly known as data exfiltration, um, or the the uh, the double like, double extortion, as some some people call it as well. So we look at how we got here, what what happened, what changed, and how impactful this is to business. And looking at some numbers here, some, some of these, most of these numbers are from 2021. A large majority, 81% of ransomware attacks that happened in, in 2021 included the, uh, the threat of or claim by cyber, cyber criminals that they have data and they, will, they have exploited the data and they will expose that on the dark web. In fact, what's also scary is two-thirds of those organizations actually ended up paying the ransom to make sure that their data was not published online. And interestingly, with the poll question, people said data breaches is top concern for them. Uh, the, the element of ransomware that is now being part of data breach has doubled in the same, in the same time frame. So I'm talking about 2021, last year. So yes, your, your concerns are spot on. And while you're thinking about data breaches, think about the exfiltration that when the data leaves your organization, what happens then? And the cost of data breach is exponential. Um, as for IBM security, the cost of each data breach is four and a quarter million dollars. And this is not just the, the initial impact. This is, this is also including the the cost that comes along with it when you are going into uh, the the uh, regulatory penalties, you've got uh, victims uh, that are impacted. Uh, so all of those, the compound losses, including loss of customer trust, partner trust, employee trust, compounding to four and a quarter million dollars. And while this is the macro view, we actually went and polled our customers at Cohesity as well. I was like, how, how is ransomware and the 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 macro cyber security issues environment impacting your business. And the pretty telling uh, data that we got, one is a large majority, almost everyone, 95% are saying they want to detect these threats early on. And I'll cover, cover this more in the session, why, why that's happening. Um, and 80% of the respondents, one, eight in 10 actually saying, ransomware is changing how the teams operate, how the infrastructure and operations team interact with the InfoSec counterparts. That has also changed in, in, in the last few quarters and years. And the good news is a large majority of these customers, 82% actually have either changed or are in the process of changing um, their data management strategy to address the cyber threats. And the, the further good news is, well, the threat for ransomware has evolved and will continue to evolve the role of data management has also evolved within the organizations. So 72% of our customers actually now see data management as an integral part of their overall data security strategy, which is, which is great news. So how do we, we get here? 
Uh, if you if you all remember, roughly four years back or so is when cybersecurity or ransom started popping on our radars. But remember, there was something else that was also happening around the same time. It was the rise of cryptocurrency, like bitcoins. Bitcoins becoming more mainstream, more widely adopted. In some ways, blockchain-based cryptocurrencies actually enable cyber criminals to anonymously demand and actually get the ransom paid. Now think of this as ransomware 1.0, the wanna cry era, when cyber criminals were encrypting the production data. And I won't get into the mechanics of how this happened. We all are fairly familiar with it. But between the backup runs, production systems were getting impacted. Most organizations have tools to do early detection. And once they or detect based based on some anomalies, and they would leverage their backup tools to to recover their systems. And and most of the objectives or the goal of the solution would basically how quickly can you recover, how much can you recover. And while no one should take an attack on one's production data lightly, the fact is the ransomware 1.0, WannaCry era, for the most part was not an existential threat for most organizations. Um, in fact, most organizations relied on their, their backup tools. In fact, we have a poll question here. So, um, Scott, I'm assuming everyone can see it. The question is, yep. Whether it was a ransomware attack or something else, with your current solution, uh, your current backup solution, how much time it took you to recover 200 virtual machines? We got some responses coming in. Yeah, coming in. Let's give them a let's give them a, a few more seconds here. Yeah. Okay, I think it's it's stabilizing in the percentages. So yeah, let's let's go ahead with the you can the response. You can publish here. that. Yep. Thank you so much, Scott. So <laughs> I am surprised with this with this response. Actually, forty eight percent. I don't know, and and that is a problem because most of the SLAs are predefined by the business owners, and and well, we were talking about how businesses relied on. Um, backup solutions to recover from ransomware 1.0 going to a solution like cohesity what we have seen is with our with our um with our backup technology the the way we manage and, and uh, store all the data the backup data in a fully hydrated snapshots uh, our distributed architecture we actually see customers able to recover a large amount of vms or unstructured data within a matter of minutes, which is highly critical if you are in that ransomware 1.0. So with that in mind, how we have seen customers address or combat ransomware 1.0 with the goal to protect their core data, protect their, their data, all built around data resiliency, making sure that the data that lands in, on Cohesity is encrypted, is, is protected. Uh, no one single point would take out the entire cluster or, or the environment have access control in place, build on zero trust principles. You you cannot negotiate between MFA or RBAC. You need both. And then also having the ability to detect quickly, irrespective uh, what data source it is, whether it's the on-prem data source or a SaaS data source or you're actually running a BAS service. doesn't matter. So while this made a lot of customers, whether they were Cohesity or other customers, if they were using a backup solution, come at peace with ransomware 1.0, like, hey, I don't have to pay the ransom because I have a backup solution. Well, following the, the Darwin's evolution theory, where it's the, the survival of the fittest, you need to continue to evolve to survive and thrive. Well, cyber criminals want to thrive too, and they evolved. Instead of just targeting the production data, they started coming after the, the backup data. Uh, you got good examples like DarkSide, it, it was a common variant of ransomware 2.0 that actually impacted the the backup data. When security researchers analyzed the, the source code of it, they actually found out there were specific functions within the code that were designed to disable and or delete leading backup services that is very commonly deployed, multiple of them commonly deployed within large organizations. In fact, one of 
Cohesity's customer, Skylake's Miracle, was also impacted by a variant called Raikou. Again, that impacts the ransomware, uh, that impacts the, the backup environment. And Skylake's environment that was running on the legacy backup solution, Windows-based, was impacted. Luckily, they had transitioned majority of the data onto Cohesity, which was not impacted. And I encourage you to go take a look at that case, that case study and the uh, and we have good videos with the customer on educating others how they were able to come out of that attack without paying a dime. So ransomware two auto basically started impacting the backup data. And in order to to mitigate against that or to combat that, well you needed the basic tools that we talked about for ransomware 1.0. You needed more things. You wanted to make sure, or you want to make sure that your backup data itself cannot be compromised. Hence, Cohesity was the first one to introduce the concept of immutability. The ability that your backup data just cannot be modified. It cannot be altered. With. It is not exposed to any application or to an, on a user. Uh, it it is always create it always it always creates a zero cost clone before exposing the data. So the core copy of the data is always secure. And building on the zero trust principles, getting more control access control to the user. For example, any time a critical element of the system needs to be changed, you need more than one person to authorize it. Think of like the nuclear codes, where you need two keys to launch any missile from a silo. Similarly, you need multiple author authorizations. And why it's important is because more and more compromised credentials are being used to access the systems. So if you have a compromised credential, it gives you more safe, uh, safer way because you need multiple credentials to be compromised in order to make any critical change to the system. And then, well, all this is good. The evolution continues to happen. In fact, now we now we're in the phase of data breach, data exfiltration. And while your recovery is great, and, and don't get me wrong, your backup and your ransom recovery is super critical. When it comes to exfiltration, it doesn't do much. You need to look at solutions differently. You need to look at what can help me detect the exfiltration or anomalies early on. A good example of ransomware 3.0 is what Bangkok Airways went through or the uh, uh, Acer, uh, the Taiwanese computer manufacturer I was talking about early on. In Bangkok Airways case, they had an attack on August 23rd of last year. They reported the attack the same day when they found it out. And while they were ne negotiating or they were trying to figure out what's the best course of action to recover from this attack, on three days later, they realized that they actually had a data breach as well. It was not just encryption, but there was exfiltration that also happened. And it only took two days for the cyber criminals to expose that data on the dark web. And by the end of the month, this information was out in the public. So imagine you being a passenger trying to get to some vacation destination or wherever you were going, using Bangkok Airways, and instead of enjoying your vacation, now you have to worry about what all personal data has been exposed. How do I hedge against that? And information that was exposed was PII information, actually. Your name, your phone numbers, your email, um, your frequent fire, to the extent that your meal preferences were also exposed. So it's a, it's a real threat. And as organizations think about how do we evolve or how do we combat this, this attack, the Again, without getting into the, the mechanics of the attack, while the backup and recovery solution will, will help detect and, and recover from encryption, the exfiltration begins much sooner. And the lag between when the exfiltration happens and when you detect it, especially if you're only relying on backup-based detection, could be anywhere from a few hours to a day or longer. And that's a very long time for breach to happen. So like I said, you're, while it's important to have backup recovery in place that can help you recover from encryption, in terms of exfiltration, it's all about detecting earlier. It's actually about, in the interest of time, just, I'll just keep on going here. Um, it's about 
how do you think of data security and data governance? They cannot be two separate silos how they historically have been. When you talk to a data security professional, he or she will think about, okay, how do I keep my data secure? Who has access to it for how long? I uh, want to make sure there is, there is no leak going on. If you talk to a data governed professional or someone who's on the compliance side of the house, they'll say, hey, you know, where is my sensitive data? Am I meeting my compliance requirements? Well, these are important questions to ask, but now you need to ask these questions together with exfiltration in mind. And what, what we are seeing is when you're thinking about the ransomware 3.0 or the threat of data exfiltration or the data breach that most of you think is, is a big threat, you need to look at where is my sensitive data? Who has access to it for how long? What compliance requirements, or how well am I meeting those compliance requirements which are changing or evolving on, on month by month, quarter by quarter basis? And if there are issues, how do I resolve those issues? But all these are good things to do, but how do you do that manually when your data is growing every day, every minute of the day actually? So with, with that in mind, Cohesity threat defense architecture starts in the core by making sure your data is resilient that we talked about, ensuring that you have access control so that you can meet your business objectives on the right side from rapid ransomware recovery in terms of encryption uh, or any other disaster to making sure that you have a vaulted solution someplace where you can have at least one copy, clean copy of data to recover from, having automated failover failback, in case of natural disasters, you have all those things in place. But when it comes to exfiltration, you need near real-time detection. You need to have clear understanding of where my sensitive data is, who has access to it, and if someone is accessing that data out of turn or who is not authorized to access that data. So, and obviously, Security, there is, there is no lone wolf. There is no one-man army here. The solution that Cohesity obviously is focusing on is extendability. The platform will not just help you back up, protect, and rapidly recover data if it was ransomware 1.0 or 2.0, but also how can you work or how can we work with your existing tools that you have in place? For example, our integration with Cisco InfoSight, uh, uh, the InfoSight, the, 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 uh, uh, their security portfolio solutions, where the data that Cohesity is bringing in is available to multiple functions. It is not just being leveraged by the infrastructure and operations team. It is also being leveraged by the compliance team or the data security team. So we are not just breaking the data silos, they're also helping break functional silos by bringing an extendable platform. So how do these capabilities convert into or align with our products? With ransomware 1.0, the key capabilities that you need to think about are immutable backups, have CDP in place, have the ability to restore, recover at scale, something we call instant mass restore, have anomaly detection, with ransomware 2.0, want to make sure that your backup data itself is not compromised. So while immutable backups are great, that's, that's a start. You also want to have things like Worm, what we call as data lock, which is a time-bound lock on your snapshot. Your security officer cannot modify the data. So if you have a rogue element, even he or she cannot modify anything. Think about having a remote vault to keep your data secure, at least one copy of data that is in a different operational environment. And then when it comes to ransomware 3.0, have data governance. And how we address that is by multiple services that are running on Cohesity's platform, whether in SaaS, which is Cohesity Managed Environment, or in your on-prem, on so Data Protect, is a flagship backup and rapid recovery solution um, that is on-prem or SaaS. And then we are also introducing two new services, uh, starting with 
uh, Cloud Bunker, which is our data vaulting solution. Again, it's a pure SaaS. Uh, so you have you basically are putting in cohesive environment. You don't need a second site, and then data govern, which is around only detection, data classification, looking not just data that land in Cohesity, but also helping look at data that's in production environment. So with that, I'm going to come up to my last slide. Just key takeaways is if you were to take anything from this session, I would say protect the data that you have, have MFA, have uh, data lock, have worm on it, make sure you at least have one copy of data protected offsite. Secure an environment, Again, compromised credentials are one of the leading factors or causes of getting compromised, having ransomware attacks or cyber threats. So make sure you have MFA on. Make sure you are you're using the the zero trust principles. But then you need to go beyond beyond that to address the the evolving threat. Look at your sensitive data. Look at what all do you have? Where all is it? Who has access to it? see for any behavioral issues within the organization, have tools to detect that. And then finally, don't just rely on technology. Think about the processes that you have. Think about training, ongoing training of the people, of the, of the, of the, of the teams that you have. So with, with that, actually, um, I'm gonna leave this here. Uh, we have a data isolation offer where Cohesity will bring in or will offer a, a free software subscription and professional services to help you build that isolation environment I was talking about. Um, there is a link here for more information, but I want to invite Scott back in to see if you got any questions here. Sorry, Scott, I totally lost time of track here. Yep, no, sounds good. Raj, we do have a lot of questions uh, that have come in. Um, one from uh, Bradford is asking, is the Cohesity backup air-gapped? So I think we are mixing terms here. Here, um, air gap is um, is a defense in depth, so one of the things that you do to achieve defense in depth. Um, but backup itself is immutable, uh, which means it cannot be modified once it lands on Cohesity. Air gap or data vaulting is a separate solution. Or, or, or a separate so solution, whether you get from Cohesity or, or uh, you do a tape out, they're two separate things. And what I have seen is people call immutability as air gap, which is inaccurate. Air gap, if you look at NIST definition, is physically disconnecting from the core environment. And your backup is not physically disconnected from the core environment. What you can do is have data isolation, you put it in a separate environment, whether your environment, Cohesity, or someone else's, but have a separate copy of data, which is either physically or logically disconnected from your production environment and your backup environment. So they're two separate things. Okay, all right, great. Yeah, thanks for that clarification. Um, we have a couple uh, questions, sort of at a, like a, an arch architectural level. Is Cohesity Solution an on-prem appliance, um, and, and is there a Cohesity Cloud offering? Y yes and yes. So Cohesity is a cloud-first okay. architecture. Um, you can we, we we try to put it in two different buckets. We got the customer managed, which is you own the cluster environment, whether it's on-prem or running in a cloud service like AWS or GCP or Azure. But these are your appliances, for lack of a better term, uh, that you manage. But then we also have as a service offering, just like your Salesforce or Okta or whatnot, where Cohesity actually runs the environment. It is The environment is owned by us. It runs in AWS, and we have a Software, I mean, we have a uh, BAS, Backup as a Service Offering, or other as a service offerings, DR as a service offering for our customers. Okay. And then a related question, I guess, you know, on the on the on-premises side, is Cohesity <laughs> capable of backup of my NAS units? Absolutely. You know, it's, a, it's a great question. NAS is, is one of the biggest workloads that customers today protect. Obviously, no surprises because... 
that is the the uh, amount of data that is growing is basically the unstructured data um, but interestingly um, we cannot just i mean we can protect all the leading nas solutions that you have in the market or even generic nas both in customer managed or cohesity baz offering but what's even more interesting and unique about cohesity's nas protection offering is you can stand up the nas on cohesity's in, within the cohesity runtime environment what i mean by that is think of an attack that happens within your environment and before you recover in the response stage of your of your process you have to make sure you have a sanitized environment and it takes time to do sanitization in fact in a lot of the cases due to forensics you cannot touch the production environment that is in, that is compromised so you have to stand up with a separate environment what customers have done in you know, skylake is a good example where they got impacted they had gazillions of packed files images patient images their their scans what not they were able to recover that data directly on cohesity so cohesity actually was serving like a nas for that duration so sorry it's got a long answer but i thought it was worthwhile given the topic <laughs> long answers are great um <laughs> Next question, Rob is asking if you can talk about how Cohesity uh, protects remote clients and their, and their data from exploits and, and exfiltration. Yeah, so um, going going back to the architecture, so whether you are running a Cohesity virtual appliance or a physical appliance, doesn't matter where it's running, it has immutability built into it. So any snapshot that lands on Cohesity is immutable, can be modified. we have data lock or worm on top of it we have mfa so every capability i was talking about in the threat defense architecture is is present irrespective whether it's a it's a, a small um, or a remote office location now we don't protect end clients like the laptop but if you have say hundreds of retail locations you have customers like that you have remote offices you can use cohesity there and then you can uh, back it up or you can archive to a separate location alternatively you can also use our baz service backup as backup uh, the software as a service offering where you can move all the data to cohesity management one so you have couple of options there okay super um you know and, and we probably got time for one more you, you, Do you have any data on Cohesity customers getting attacked by ransomware in the in the time that it took them to recover? Yeah, you know, I'll, I'll go back to the the NAS uh, thing you're talking about. So, answer is yes. We um it it is a sensitive topic. Not a lot of people would want to come out and talk about their experiences of uh, dealing with ransomware. Mm -hmm. But we yeah. have had a few brave souls who just didn't want to share their story but also wanted to share their learnings and while we think of recovering from ransomware there is there is a little misconception that i see it is not just a straight up recovery there is a whole hygiene process that needs to happen there is a whole response process that needs to happen including making sure your active directory is not compromised so for example scott in your organization how do we know that your credentials were not compromised and you were not made from a user to a super admin in the active directory so those things take time and people don't think about that when they're thinking about recovering from ransomware or or you know their the businesses would or vendors would would uh, misrepresent facts but if you look at case studies that we have with say then skylix as an example the the uh, response obviously had to go through its process but the recovery of data happened near instantly and they were able to experience this even before the ransomware attack happened the uh, their, their cancer department actually had an accidental deletion of data and it, it, they said it publicly and we all know for a fact think like cancer don't wait for for time it, it the impact keeps on happening and this hospital actually wanted to make sure that the patient care was not impacted so 
So the ability to recover directly on cohesity was huge for them. Well, they were able to clean their environment, do all the sanitization, do the forensics. There was downtime was very limited because they stood up on cohesity. Okay. So ho hopefully that answers well, the, the question for, for the team there. Yeah, yeah. And uh, it looks like we're running out of time, Raj, but uh, thank you so much for coming on and uh, thanks for all the insights and the information about Cohesity and, and all your insights in the Q&A. Really appreciate it. Thank you so much. Okay, and I'm going to leave that poll question up there for a minute, and this is just one last reminder as well about all the handouts uh, in the handouts section. You know, there's a there's a PDF from Cohesity there, and uh, and you know all the other companies that presented today. Um, this is one of your last chances to uh, to grab all those uh, before the the event winds down. And uh, I am going to leave the poll up there for a second while we do uh, our next prize drawing, and that's for the the winner of the $300 Amazon gift card. This is the the last $300 Amazon gift card of the day. And that goes to Juliana Hughes of Arizona. Um, and now we're going to go to our final grand prize. And for this round, it's the Microsoft Surface Pro 8. And we're giving away three of those. And the winners are Jonah Gertson of Indiana, Alan Bench of California, and Kyle Miller of Indiana. So congratulations to Jonah, Allen, and Kyle. Uh, congratulations to all of our winners today. We'll be in touch about claiming your prizes. And just a quick reminder as we close out today to uh, check out our Gorilla Guides. It's a great book series, um, easy to read, you know, targeted enterprise, uh, you know, technology descriptions and how-tos, and uh, you know, just great resources. I couldn't recommend them more. Um, if you're on this event and you would like to sponsor a similar event, uh, present your own solutions on there, uh, please do get in touch. We have megacasts and ecocasts coming up. Um, we've got a calendar for the full year. We'd be happy to talk to you about um, opportunities for, for you to get involved. And our next EcoCast is coming up on January 25th about supporting and enabling modern applications. Don't miss it. Uh, a lot of great sponsors on that one. And uh, just remember to, re if you could refer an IT friend or coworker to one of these events, you could both win a $300 Amazon gift card. So, you know, please do take advantage of that opportunity. And with that, on behalf of the Actual Tech Media team, I do want to thank all of our presenters today for putting together such great presentations and demos and Q&A insights today. You know, I learned a lot. I, I'm sure all of you did. Uh, I want to thank all of our participants for making this event possible. Know Before, One Password, Okta, SimSpace, Attack IQ, Duo Security, Rubrik, Rapid7, Zerto, and Cohesity. And finally, we'd like to thank all of you for attending today's virtual summit from Actual Tech Media and for all of your great questions that, that make this event so valuable and so targeted. So that concludes today's event. Have a great rest of your day.